Chapter 76. Those who covered the blood of a royal. Part 2. Siger spoke after he read the report. We don't have much experience in fighting on mountainous terrain. This is going to be troublesome. It will be. It seems we will be relying on the prince more so than usual. Him. I'll catch the orcs and the monsters. How come these orcs are so strong? Count Balden invited Knight Gilberet. He is a swordsman that is quite well known in the West. If this report is true, he was defeated without give the orcs much of a fight. These orcs are much stronger than the usual ones. It isn't as if this is unprecedented. Are you talking about Dakin? About 30 years ago, there was an orc hero named Dakin, who raised a great army of monsters called the Great Dark Alliance. This occurred at the Balan Forest where the, the western border guards were stationed. This particular orc was much stronger than the regular orcs, and it was as smart as a human. It had charisma, and it was able to organize the monsters. At various times in the past, powerful mutated orcs had appeared, but Dakin had been at a different level. Moreover, its power was so strong that many knights of that time had died by its hands. Pullman spoke. Yes. Him. Have you perhaps seen Dakin yourself? When the western border guards had been wiped out in the past, the throne had dispatched a punitive force, and I had been a part of that force. What kind of orc was it? It was incredibly large. It was two heads taller than other orcs, and it wore a mishmash of thick armors. It swung an enormous sword, which was large as the one prince uses. Most people died before they could get close to the orc. The bastard was like a walking tornado. Interesting. I never knew such an orc existed. An orc's body is fundamentally stronger than a human's body. Occasionally, an orc that is much stronger than other orcs is born. However, Dakin was a being that had exceeded the classification. Anyways, we need to be cautious. All right. Saiga nodded his head. When Saiga and his direct subordinates arrived at the county of Balden, they received a fervent reception from the people. Wah! Saiga! 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 The noble dragon demon prince's sword will light our way. Count Balden and the residents of his domain had been besieged by constant violence. In such a situation, the dragon demon prince of the rising fame had come to save them. Men and women of all ages yelled out Saga's name. It seems the situation was much worse than we predicted. They were barely able to harvest their crops for the winter, and their stores were plundered. Moreover, a town was burnt to the ground. The women and children were kidnapped. Pullman clicked his tongue at Saga's words. Pullman had thought this was a minor problem with bandits. However, the county had taken such a large damage that their survivability was being threatened. Saiga rested for the night, and he climbed up the mountain the next day. The Count scraped together more soldiers from his domain, and they were sent with Saiga and his forces. Saiga mused when he saw the treacherous terrain of the mountain. Those bastards are hiding in such a treacherous location. How are they able to conduct their raid? Wouldn't they have to traverse this terrain every time they want to reach the Count's domain? A troop of over hundred wouldn't be able to fight on this terrain. He now understood why Count Balden hadn't been successful in his subjugation. However, it was almost unbelievable to think that the bandits would traverse this terrain every time they wanted to plunder a village. Maybe they have a secret route. Even if there is such a route, it is unlikely that the residents wouldn't know about it. I guess this means we won't know anything until we run across them. Since we don't know what might happen, please be vigilant of our surrounding. I'll scout ahead. What? That is a bit. Regular soldiers won't be able to do a proper reconnaissance. I'll be throwing sacrificial lambs to our enemies. Isn't that right? Then shouldn't we send out the knights? I trust in the competence of my knights, but this is the front yard of our enemies. Moreover, I learned how to deal with such situations from my teacher. Saiga had gone through a massive amount of training as he had been instructed by the dragon sword Duke Chiron Tarantos. On occasion, he was required to hunt wild animals and monsters on a frigid mountain during winter. These prior experiences would allow Saiga to make needed tactical decisions during the reconnaissance. He would lead from the front if needed. He was conservative with how he used his men. He didn't want to send them into a place where there was a high possibility of them being slaughtered. Then I'll be going with you. 
Don't overdo it. If you go alongside me, the command structure would be disturbed. I'll take young knights instead of your old bones. I still can hold my own against the young ones. However, the young ones can't replace your experienced self. This is why I'm asking you to stay behind. After Saiga joked around with Pullman, he picked out three mercenaries he had elevated to knighthood. Two of the three were veterans of many skirmishes, and they moved as they were ordered. Saiga was cognizant of his surrounding as he moved nimbly. The knights were astonished. The prince was trained in reconnaissance. Everyone knew Saiga's martial arts was exceptional. He had overwhelming martial power, yet he didn't discriminate others based on their station in life. He judged a person by their ability, and he always looked at others with a fair gaze. He was a young man, yet he boldly fought in the front lines. He put his life on the line with his men, and his actions brought out loyalty from others. Still, it was surprising to see such an ability from a person of his station, and power. Just a little bit. I wasn't trained as a scout, but I was trained to be a hunter. If you see me making rookie mistakes, please point it out to me. It seems we should be the one learning from you. Even if you try to flatter me, I won't easily raise your annual salary. They conversed in low whispers as they scouted their surrounding. Periodically, they used a communication magic tool to send back reports as the main force advanced. They advanced very carefully. It happened at that moment. You are still young, yet you are very cautious. He heard a voice that shouldn't be present in such a place. He heard a voice of a young woman. Saiga raised his head in surprise. A young woman was sitting atop a steep cliff. She kept her knees together as she looked down at him. I'm in danger. Saiga's instinct was give a very strong warning. It was almost surreal, since the young woman looked very out of place here. Was she of similar age as Arietta? She had blonde hair, and her eyes were the color of amethyst. Her skin was white as snow. She was a very beautiful young woman. She had on an expressionless face that didn't reveal any emotions. She had a doll-like beauty. Her features didn't suit the rough terrains of the mountain, but her clothes made the dissonance even more pronounced. She wore a black dress with red trims. Saiga asked her a question. Who are you? I'm a magician sent to retrieve you. The conditions needed for me to reveal my name hasn't been fulfilled. You are going to take me. I'm merely following orders. Wah! Suddenly, yells erupted from his rear. Saiga was taken aback. What's going on? A report that sounded like a scream came through the magic communication tool. Prince. The enemies suddenly appeared. What? That can't be. They climbed up the ridge of the mountain and we were ambushed without any warning. Kook, I don't know how this could have happened. Sir Pullman, I'll immediately. The magical communication suddenly broke up. The young woman spoke to the alarmed Saiga. I wanted to observe good manners, so I allowed you to send a brief communication. Saiga trembled. There hadn't been any signs of the girl using magic. It wasn't just that she hadn't recited any spells or performed any hand seals. I didn't feel any magical reverberation. How can this be? Sega's magic detection ability was much more sensitive than others. However, he hadn't felt a single ounce of magic coming from the young woman. Yet she was able to easily terminate the communication magic. The young woman walked off the cliff as if she was walking on a flat surface. Moreover, a blue pillar of light appeared in front of her. Woo! At the same time, an oppressive magical wave was swept over him. Saiga was shocked. No way. Her magical energy exceeds amount possessed by teacher. From the young woman. No, to be precise, the oppressive magical wave that made him want to scream was being formed in front of her. This was dragon demon magic. It wasn't magical energy. It was dragon demon magic. It was a tool that emitted dragon demon magic. Moreover, it was emitting an amount that far outstripped Chiron. It made his heart leap into his mouth. He had thought Chiron and his friends were the only ones able to create dragon weapons that possessed dragon demon magic. The young woman mumbled to herself as if she was letting out a sigh. Dragon magic device Vitten's glass. From the light, the young woman pulled out a long staff. The staff looked as if it was carved out of ice. It was colorless, and the light distorted as it penetrated through the staff. There was something that looked like a large chalice attached at head of the staff. 
Some of the light that passed through the staff flowed upwards. It was a mysterious sight where it looked as if water was flowing upwards. For a brief moment, Saiga gawked at it, but he came to his senses. His hand moved towards the enormous sword strapped to his back. The magically spelled sheath pushed the sword out. Saiga grasped the sword, and he got into his stance. It was an unnatural sight. Saiga was a 15-year-old young man, so his stature was small. He was only 160 centimeters tall. However, the weapon in his hand was a very large two-handed sword, which didn't suit him. The entire length of the sword almost matched Saiga's height, and normal people wouldn't be able to lift this weapon. However, Saiga's physical prowess was much superior to a human, so he swung it easily. I call the name of the light. Become a dragon that tears away the evil darkness. As he shouted out his spell, dragon demon magic exploded forth from him. The powerful light exited from the tip of his sword, and it shot towards the young woman in an erratic path. The cliff exploded, and the mountain shook. Saiga let out a shout. You guys rejoin the main force. I'll. Saiga flinched from surprise in mid-sentence. They were gone. The three knights that had been by his side only a moment ago was nowhere to be seen. Am I in a dream right now? Did she deceive his senses as she got rid of the knights next to him? Was such a thing possible in reality? He wondered if she used a magic that deceived his mind. Her voice was heard in Sega's ears. How unfortunate. What? The young woman was fine as she walked through the explosion. It seemed she hadn't even paused in her walk. It was as if Sega's attack wasn't even a hindrance. She had stepped off the cliff, and now she landed on top of a level surface. The blood of the Great One is flowing within you. However, you are denied power, because you lack knowledge. What are you talking about? I'll give you an answer at a later time. She ignored the confused Sega's question. She grabbed the hem of her skirt with one hand, and she elegantly gave a greeting. It seems the conditions required to tell you my name has been met. My name is Laura. She spoke as she raised her strange staff called the Vitten's Glass. It was letting out dragon demon magic. I am the inheritor of the great name of Ornsoras. I welcome you to the Vitten's Maze. Let us test if you are able to defeat me. You will have to find the exit before your power bottoms out. Her surrounding rippled, and Sega's reality started to distort like a nightmare. Chapter 77. Those who covered the blood of a royal. Part 3. Dragon Demon Prince Saiga Vile Rulan is missing. The unexpected and urgent news had put the throne of the Rulan kingdom into a state of shock. The throne quickly dispatched a search party with the Dragon Demon Princess Arietta included in the group. At the same time, they sent a request for help to Chiron, since his dukedom was geographically closer to where Saiga had went missing. Chiron had left immediately after he sent a message to Azel asking for help. Azel met up with Biorin, who was waiting for Azel in his domain. They were about to set off for the county of Balden. I told Chiron to leave behind a marker as he went. We just have to follow those markers. Since Biorin was an archmage, he could move at an incredible speed. He could maintain a flying speed of a horse galloping at full speed, and the terrain didn't hinder him. This resulted in bringing out an unimaginable moving speed. However, in terms of pure moving speed, he couldn't be compared to Chiron. Even though Biorin was also a dragon magen, he was too old, so there was a limit on how long he could maintain his high-speed flight. This was the reason why Chiron had left behind Biorin. Azel took the magic tool that would allow him to track down Chiron. It was a small platform with a needle, and it was able to point out directions. Biorin asked him a question. Are you sure you are okay? You don't look like you are in a good condition. Azel had finished his third cycle of training, and it had been four days since he entered his fourth cycle. He had abused his body for several days. He had pushed his body and mind to the brink today from morning to evening. He had quickly drank the magic recovery potions like water, and he had mediated to replenish his magical energy. He also received treatment from the healers, but his condition was a mess. There were still numerous wounds all over his body that hadn't healed completely. Azel spoke. I'm all right. He had experienced fighting in extreme situations during the Dragon Demon War. 
so his current condition didn't even rise to the level of troubling him. Real battles weren't kind enough to wait for him to be in his peak condition. Then I'll head out first too. Him, shouldn't we go together? It is impossible for us to catch up to Chiron. Still, it would be best if I got there quicker. Ah, could you step back for a moment? Him, Biorin was puzzled, but he followed Azel's direction. Azel placed a spear on the floor. He got on it and he crouched on top of it. Then he created three clones. Biorin asked him a question. What are you doing? Please step back a little bit further. This will be dangerous. After saying those words, Azel took in a deep breath. One of the clones lifted the spear with Azel on it. Then the two clones stood on both sides as they created a thread of light, and the spear with Azel on it was placed on this thread. The first clone moved to the other side to load it diagonally. The thread of light was pulled back taut as Azel's body was loaded. I'll be going. After he spoke his words, Azel gritted his teeth. At the same time, the three clones exploded. The clone holding up Azel threw his body as if it was launching a javelin, and it exploded. The clones placed on the side had made sure the maximum tension was achieved with the thread of light, and they simultaneously exploded as Azel and the spear was shot forward. The recoil propelled Azel's body into the sky at a frightening speed. As the sound of the explosions rang out, Azel turned into a blue streak of light as he accelerated high into the sky. At that moment, an enormous pressure pressed in on Azel's body. If he was a normal person, his body would have been ripped into pieces. In a flash, he was rising above the clouds. While he tolerated the violent acceleration, Azel didn't want to waste all the force in ascending the sky. He tilted the flight path as if he had just climbed over a mountain. Then he created a fierce gust of wind with his magical energy to take control of his flight path. Then he created a gradual slope to descend towards the ground. In a flash, he started accelerating, and he flew towards Chiron's direction at a frightening speed. Biorin was dumbfounded as he watched it all from the ground. Biorin blinked his eyes as he mumbled to himself. My god! What the hell just happened? Chiron was running like a gale. If he drew a straight line on a map, he had to cover 230 kilometers. If he moved in a hurry, he could get there in four hours if he ignored the terrain of the land. He had sent a message to Azel, but Chiron didn't hold high hopes for Azel arriving on time. Since he didn't have a clear grasp of the current situation, he had to travel to the county of Balden as soon as possible. It happened when he was 30 kilometers from reaching the county of Balden. Him, Chiron suddenly sensed a powerful magical resonance in the sky. Something was approaching him at incredible speed. When he looked up, a blue light was coming towards his direction as it parted the cloudy skies. Chiron stopped running from surprise, and he unsheathed his twin swords. However, a clear barrier formed behind the light. The blue light decelerated, and a person jumped out from within it. The person landed in front of Chiron. Chiron was taken aback when he saw the man's red hair, which billowed like fire. Azel, it's been a while, Duke. Azel grabbed the spear that fell from the sky, and he gave his greetings. Chiron's mouth had fallen open from the absurdity of this event. What did you do? I used my key to fly over here quickly. No, what I'm trying to ask. Let me satisfy your curiosity at a later time. We don't have time for a leisurely conversation. Shall we go? Him. When Azel pointed it out, Chiron quickly regained his senses. Chiron spoke. Can we use the method you just used to cover the remaining distance? One has to make constant adjustments in flight, and it is impossible for someone who hadn't learned the technique. That is unfortunate. Also, you have a lot of wounds on your body. Are you really okay? Count Michael asked me the same question before I traveled here. I'm fine. Let us depart. All right. I'm going to run on full tilt, so do your best to follow after me. The two men started to run like the wind. Chiron once again became surprised. What the hell did he do to himself? It had been only four months ago when Azel was barely able to keep up as they traveled 70 kilometers per day. Chiron was truly running at full speed. Yet Azel wasn't having any difficulty keeping up with him. Is it really possible to raise one's magical energy this much in such a short amount of time? 
There were wounds all over his body, but one could tell at a glance that his body's foundation was splendidly trained. Moreover, the magical resonance that was flowing out of him was incredibly strong. The magical resonance was comparable to the sextuple masters Chiron was acquainted with. Azel asked a question as he ran. I was told the dragon demon prince went missing, but I wasn't given any details. What happened? It isn't as if I was given a lot of information either. The request had come with a lot of urgency. Chiron started to tell Azel of the information he was given. Saiger and his men were sent to subjugate a band of bandits that was led by a powerful mutated orc. The bandits were conducting frequent raids on the county of Balden. Unfortunately, Saiger and his men were met with an unexpected accident. Saiger had volunteered himself for scouting duty, and he had suddenly gone missing. On top of that, enemies attacked Saiger's troops in an ambush. They suffered heavy damage, and they almost been annihilated. Azel furrowed his eyebrows. I'll have to hear a more detailed account, but it seems the dragon demon king worshippers may have intervened. What basis do you have for that theory? We just have to look at the circumstantial evidence. There must be a reason why those bastards tried to kidnap the princess. They still had no idea why the dragon demon king worshippers had wanted to kidnap Arietta. However, the two of them were dragon demon royalty, and they were siblings, who had come out of the same womb. It wasn't too much of a stretch to see why Saiger had become a target. However, can they actually act so overtly with the guardian shadows around? If we consider the conditions the guardian shadow works under, if the dragon demon worshippers really wanted to avoid the detection of the guardian shadows, it's not an impossible task. The guardian shadows surveillance net was an incredible weapon that could be used against their enemies. However, its reliability lessened as one traveled to the less populated locations. Moreover, there was the problem of the people other than the dragon demon worshippers having to realize that they had spotted a dragon demon worshipper. If the dragon demon king worshippers were involved in the disappearance of Saiga, they probably went through extraordinary measures to avoid that condition from being fulfilled. First, no one knew how Saiga had gone missing, and the report had no indications suggesting it was done by the dragon demon king worshippers. Azel continued to speak. Moreover, the prince's personal troops didn't realize an ambush was coming. It was as if the enemies had appeared through teleportation. They are the only ones who could pull it off. Sega's personal troops had magicians, yet they had been completely fooled. Even if the archmage Biorin tried to do it, it would have been impossible for him to do this feat. However, what if it was Niberus? In Azul's estimation, she could have done it. She had the skills to hide even the evil intent of her troops. It wouldn't be too hard for her to fool this era's magicians and knights. Azel queried. The Guardian Shadows probably knows what's going on since the Duke knows about it. How about we ask them for some support? Before he could finish his sentence, he started sensing an odd presence nearby. As the two of them were running at high speed, three spirit-looking presences wearing white robes were approaching them. Chiron clicked his tongue. Well, speak of the devil. They showed up awfully fast. You have such sayings here too. There are places that don't have it. Chiron came to a stop as he spoke those words. The whisper of children rang out in the surrounding, and the words were indecipherable. The being hidden within the darkness of the white robe spoke. Dragon demon prince kidnapped, from the plane of darkness. High-ranked dragon demon. Are they saying a high-ranking member of the dragon demon king worshippers left the plane of darkness to kidnap Saiga? It was still hard to decipher what the guardian shadows were trying to say. The guardian shadows continued their whispers. Tracking. Do you know their location? Disappeared. Flowing tears blinds our eyes. However, we followed the trace of the tears to encircle them. Chiron frowned. He had no idea what they were trying to say. However, Azel asked them with a serious expression on his face. When you make reference to the tears, do you mean to say the landscape is being obscured like this? Azel drew a shape with his finger through the empty air. A wave-like ripple occurred as the sight on the other side of the shape became distorted. The guardian shadows replied. Correct. Flows like tears. Tears swallowed by Vitan.
When did these bastards become poets? Azel spoke to Chiron, who just spoke out in frustration. It seems a big fish might have really come out. Him. If this characteristic they described matches with someone I know, we might have to prepare for the worst. What are you talking about? I'll tell you as we go. Fortunately, the guardian shadows are able to track them even though the enemy is taking active steps to hide their tracks. They are able to see the traces that can't be seen by a normal person. Azel started running again. The guardian shadows whispered as they followed them. The dragon is coming. It will come to test. It'll be here. What? Azel turned around in surprise, but the guardian shadows drifted farther away as if they had said everything they wanted to say. Azel marveled at this sight. Duke, I can't believe you worked with them for over several dozen years. If they were my subordinates, I would have retrained them a hundred times over by putting them through hellish training. Chiron grumbled as he increased his speed. Chapter 78 Those Who Covered the Blood of a Royal. Part 4. However, they found out what those words meant not too long after they arrived at the county of Balden. From dozens of kilometers away, one could hear oppressive roar ringing out. Afterward, a thunder clap illuminated the gloomy skies. After a couple seconds delay, a deafening sound of thunderclap rang out around Azel and Chiron. Chiron was amazed. Dragon's roar. The fearsome roar by the dragon and the destruction that happened afterwards was akin to Azel's power. It was similar to what happened after he used the roar of the dragon. Azel spoke. It is a thunder dragon. Moreover, another dragon's roar rang out. It was happening on the other side of the mountain, but one could detect an incredible power going off. What are two dragons doing here? We'll know when we get there. But. Azel spoke as he started running again. It sounds like they are fighting. They are fighting each other. Aren't they a little bit too close to the human territory? The domain of dragons were mostly located deep within perilous lands where human traffic was sparse. This was why it was rare for human to become scared from hearing dragons fight. The aftermath of the fight almost never had direct effect on the humans. However, when the two of them were at a distance where they could see the county of Balden, they realized their worries were well founded. Shit. Azul's expression crumpled. Half of Balden Castle was in ruins as smoke rose into the air. The nearby houses were ruthlessly crushed as if a tornado had passed through. The dragons had already descended from the mountain, and they had fought about within the town. Then they had continued their fight as they ascended the mountain again. The sound of an explosion rang out from afar as thunder fell from the sky. The clear sky of the fall night was swept over by a snowstorm, and a portion of the mountain froze. Numerous chunks of ice impacted on the mountain as if siege ordinances were bombarding the mountain. Azel headed towards the town regardless of what was going on. When he got there, he saw people busily moving within the ruthlessly destroyed town. Fuckers. Azel grinded his teeth. He heard children crying, and he heard the moans of the injured people. Then there was the cries of those, who lost their family members. It was a heart-rending scene. The knights moving busily through this mess caught their eyes. Chiron grabbed one of the knights, and he asked a question. Are there any survivors from the knights, who accompanied the dragon demon prince? Soon, the two men was able to meet the old knight Pullman. The old knight had bloody bandages all over his body. Pullman had been busily commanding his men to save the people inside the town. He gave his respects when he saw Chiron. You came, Dragon Sword Duke. It is a real honor to once again. You don't have go through the effort of paying useless respects to me. We don't have the time. Every second matters right now, so I want to hear your report. Please keep it as short as possible. Yes. Pullman had lived as a royal knight for most of his adult life, so he had fought with Chiron several times before. He already knew about Chiron, personality, so he had already prepared what he was going to say beforehand. He quickly conveyed the information. Dragon demon prince Saiga Vile Rulan was missing. While he was on reconnaissance, the communication was cut off. At the same time, the bandits led by the mutated orc ambushed them. There were several monsters and magicians mixed in with the bandit group. Still, no one in Pullman's group detected their movements. 
Pullman's forces lost about 70% of his forces before he was barely able to muster a retreat. The mutated orc was a fearsome bastard. To what degree? It makes me think of Dakin. However, this one was inferior. Still, several knights attacked it, yet they weren't a match for the orc. Him. Their magicians were quite skilled. However, there is no way they could have approached us without giving any signs of. I have a hunch on the reason behind that, so you don't have to talk about it. What? This isn't a suitable time for me to satisfy your curiosity. What else? Pullman decided to gather his remaining men, and they retreated to the Balden Castle. He immediately used the Balden Castle's communication magic tool to inform the throne. Then he planned on reorganizing his remaining forces to go look for the whereabouts of Saiga. It was suicide to take his decimated group into the mountain occupied by the mutated orc and the bandits. However, they couldn't just stay in place while Saiga was missing. Before they could climb the mountain, thunders crashed as the mountain shook, and the dragons started to fight. They appeared near here. As they started to fight each other, the town was struck in the aftermath. Chiron let out a moan. He had no idea what was going on here. It happened at that moment. I believe I can give you a more detailed account of what's going on. A very easy-going voice that was incongruous with the current situation interjected. A teen was walking towards them. He had on an expression that made him look as if he couldn't see the absolute horrors surrounding him. He was a blonde-haired and blue-eyed teen that looked to be about 14 years old. It was Leon, the keeper of prophecy for the Guardian Shadows. Azul's expression crumpled. You, Leon let out an awkward laugh when an abundant amount of hostility was focused on him. You are scaring me, so please stop glaring at me. How can I not glare at you? Well, I do think it is a reasonable response. Still, aren't there more important tasks at hand? Azel clicked his tongue. He had a debt to pay against Leon. To be exact, he had to settle with the undead named Zeta. However, this wasn't the time to obsess over it. Azel withdrew the energy that felt as if it was pressing down on their body. Chiron spoke. Why are you here? I have two answers to the question. First, I was never too far away from you, Sir Azel. So you are stalking me. What's the other reason? There was the matter of those beings that came out of the plane of darkness. They had attempted to kidnap the dragon demon princess. At the request of the dragon demon queen, we put guardian shadows near her two children. This was why we were alerted so quickly about this incident. At the very least, I like the measure you guys took. Go ahead. Quickly give me an explanation. Keep it concise. A dragon demon that exited the plane of darkness disappeared after taking the dragon demon prince. I guess it really was done by the dragon demon king worshippers. Chiron grinded his teeth. Azel asked a question. Is there evidence that they came out of the plane of darkness? We've faced this big shot several times. To be precise, she is the successor of a powerful figure. A big shot. The goblet containing the heaven's tears. Are you perhaps talking about Ornsaurus? Chiron asked the question. Ornsaurus. During the Dragon Demon War, the Dragon Demon King had four subordinates called the Dragon Demon Generals, and Ornsaurus was one of them. According to records, he had been able to gather all the light in existence in the sky to himself, and it allowed him to use fearsome abilities. This was why he was nicknamed, the Goblet Containing the Heaven's Tears. Chiron furrowed his eyebrows. I hope you aren't trying to say he's still alive right now. I'm pretty sure he was killed by the Archmage Carlos during the Dragon Demon War. We even killed his heir to this power. What? That happened only seven years ago. We suffered incredible amount of damage from that incident. So who's behind Sega's kidnapping? She is an heir of an heir. Basically, she is the third generation Ornsaurus. We've gone against her several times. She uses an incredible magic key called, Vitten's Chalice. It isn't magic key. Azel cut off Leon's words. Leon tilted his head in confusion. Azel continued to speak with a hardened expression on his face. It is Dragon Demon Key. Dragon Demon Key. I don't have the time to explain it right now. Tell me the rest of it. Ornsaurus's heir used Vitten's Chalice to obfuscate the prince and her location. Similar phenomenons happened before. I think she has the talent to make a pocket dimension. 
she is able to move in this state, and it leaves behind a very faint trace. It is the Vitten's maze. What is that? Find out for yourself. When the guardian shadow expressed seeing, tears, this is what they saw. How long has the prince been inside the maze? It's been seven hours. At those words, Azel asked Chiron a question. How is the prince's martial prowess compared to the princess? Arietta is better in terms of technique. Saiga is stronger in terms of strength. If we consider the whole package, they are similar in ability. Him. Why do you want to know that? I'm trying to guess what kind of state the prince is in. I believe he was suppressed by the enemy, and he's been taken captive. Are you absolutely sure Saiga lost? The woman from the dragon demon race called Nibirus pretty much toyed with Princess Arietta. If this woman is the heir to Ormsaurus, this person can't be worse than Nibirus. Moreover, if she was able to form the Vitten's Maze. What is the Vitten's Maze? It separates one from outside. The user of the Vitten's Chalice is able to create and use an overwhelming advantageous pocket dimension. If the opponent possesses Dragon Demon Key, the prince's defeat is a given. We have to thank the Guardian Shadows. They recognized the trace left behind by the Vitten's Chalice, and they gave pursuit. If they hadn't, it would have been impossible to track it. Azel clicked his tongue. The memory of fighting Ormsaurus during the Dragon Demon War was still fresh in his mind. Vitten's Chalice had such a ridiculous ability that even Carlos had called it a bad joke. Amongst weapons that was able to generate Dragon Demon Key, it was considered classified in the highest rank of how dangerous it was. Azel queried, May you guide us to this location? Of course. However, don't you have more to tell us? Are you talking about the dragons? Yes. We called them here. What? Azel and Chiron was taken aback at Leon's nonchalant answer. Leon spoke. To be precise, we are one of our comrades called the Frost Dragon here. Originally, we made a contract with it to make it fight Sir Azel. However, I never expected it to be used in this fashion. What are you talking about? I'm not the only keeper of prophecy. It seems you aren't talking about those dirty undeads. Yes. Those beings do not making any decisions. It isn't their role. Anyways, the keepers of prophecy aren't a unified entity. We all do things our own way. One decided to test you again, so he called in a dragon. The enemy decided to mobilize a thunder dragon as reserve for an unexpected situation. This resulted in the dragons fighting each other, and this state of affair came to be. Azul's patience wore out. He lifted Leon by grabbing his throat. Leon struggled. Keck. That hurts. Do you realize the consequences of your actions? Look at this terrible sight. Azul's anger was like fire. However, Leon didn't cringe. He wasn't afraid. He just struggled, since he couldn't breathe. In the next moment, Azel felt a sharp killing intent, so he dodged to the side. A black energy was exiting Leon's shadow. A black sword shot out from the shadow, and Azel retreated. Leon lost his balance, but it grabbed Leon as he was falling. I don't want any trouble right now. It was the skeleton knight wearing metal armor with ominous black red lines crisscrossing it. It was Zeta. Sparks ignited behind Azul's eyes when he saw Zeta. You bastard. How violent. That was close. Leon massaged his neck as he grumbled. He spoke to Azel as he hid behind Zeta. I get why you are mad, but I'm not the one to blame. I didn't call the Frost Dragon, and I didn't order it to fight with the Thunder Dragon called here by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Take that weak excuse out of here. Ha! Leon let out a sigh. Then he spoke as he shook his head from side to side. Well, I'll just say what I have to say. If you go to the entrance of the mountain, there will be guardian shadows that'll guide you to where the Dragon Demon Prince is located at. There's a chance that the Dragon Demon Prince might disappear without a trace, so you should hurry up and get there. Azel grinded his teeth as he glared at Zeta and Leon. Leon was still hiding behind Zeta. If he had his way, Azel would have destroyed Zeta, and he would have killed Leon. Chiron grabbed Azel's shoulder. I fully understand your feeling, but you'll have to settle it at another time. I'll do that. Azel and Chiron turned their body. Then they ran towards the entrance of the mountain like a gust of wind. 
When Leon felt people's gazes heading towards him, he used his magic to cloak Zeta and himself. Zeta spoke as they exited the town. How surprising. Him. What is. That man. It'll be worth it to observe him. A powerful light was emitted from inside the skeleton's eye sockets. Chapter 79. Those who covered the blood of a royal. Part 5. Azel and Chiron climbed the mountain as they were guided by the guardian shadows. The terrain of the mountain was rough, and on top of that, the sun had set. Even in the dark, their speed hadn't slow at all. However, when they were halfway up the mountain, bandits hidden on superior grounds started shooting arrows at them. Hmm, the two of them were unperturbed. They had known beforehand that the bandits were there. The two of them swung their swords. A transparent blue force followed the path of the sword as it blocked the arrows. While the ambushing bandits were confused, Azel spoke. Your entire body has completely assimilated the technique for detecting the gaze of others. It is a very useful technique, gaze detection. Before Azel went into the Lance Mountain to train, Azel had taught Chiron of the method behind detecting others' gazes. There was a lot of overlap between spirit order and dragon arts, so the main concept behind the technique was easily understood by Chiron. Moreover, Chiron had completely perfected his technique in the past four months. His opponents completely hid their bodies, and they didn't show any indication of life. However, they couldn't hide the fact that the gazers was on him. Chiron spoke. Still, these bastards are able to completely evade my eyesight. Incredible. Still, I think the one that kidnapped Saiga isn't here. I guess they have a lot of high-quality individuals in their ranks. Even last time, there were men who used camouflage skill comparable to this. Azel wasn't just able to detect their gazes. He was able to read the mental waves leaking out of the ambushing men. It was natural for humans to naturally emit a mental wave when they were concentrating. Since they weren't able to hide their mental waves, these men were inferior to the dragon's shadow members inserted to kidnap Arietta. Azel and Chiron saw the enemies reload their bow, so they split up in opposite directions. Then they ran up the cliff to attack the enemies. The swords were moving like flashes of lightning, and blood was sprayed into the air. Azel and Chiron were too fast as the enemies couldn't see their movements. The men weren't even sure when they had been stabbed, but they fell as blood surged out of them. Why are they dying so easily? The magician was taken aback. He used an invisibility spell as he floated in the air. He was like the men from the dragon's shadow, who worked with Niberus. He was affiliated with a lower level organization. This was also the reason he wasn't well informed on what was going on. Still, he was able to catch the scent of Chiron's powerful dragon demon magic, so the group had been expecting the appearance of a dragon demon. However, the two who showed up was completely beyond their imagination. Then, a gruesome sound was heard from below. Ah, the magician looked down with a dumbfounded expression on his face. His stomach had been fine a moment ago, yet he found something had erupted from his stomach. No, this can't. It wasn't an eruption. A sword had been thrown from the ground, and that sword had pierced through his stomach. He tried to come up with some measure in the midst of the shock and horror he felt. However, it was too late. The sword that was planted in his body moved as if it was alive, and it was obliquely cutting open his upper body. The magician fell as he screamed, and he immediately died as he impacted on the ground. Azel changed the direction of the sword in midair, and it returned to his hand. However, this was a deception. The sword suddenly switched direction right before it could be grasped by Azel's hand. It passed through the boulder next to him. From behind the boulder, an inhuman cry rang out. An enormous orc immediately came flying out. It was about two heads taller than a regular orc, and it had a ruddy coloring. Its body was rippling with muscles, and blood was dripping down its chest. Azel used telekinesis to bring his sword back to him. He looked up as he grasped his sword. So you are the orc that's purported to be the leader of the mountain bandits. You bastard. You are only a weak human, yet you dare. You are a dumb orc, yet you are quite fluent in the words of men. It means you aren't a normal one. I don't have time. Hurry up and come at me. 
Azel glared at it. In the next moment, the orc charged forward. It moved as fast as a spirit order practitioner. A human would have to use both hands to raise the enormous mace, yet it used one hand to swing its mace. The sound of an explosion rang out as the ground exploded. The rock fragments shot into the air. It was powerful enough to crush one's bones. Human knights, who boasted as being superior to other humans, were easily sent flying in the previous battle. However, it missed. At that moment, the orc moved its body as it swung the mace to the side. The orc's mace collided with Azul's sword as a loud and resonant sound rang out. Azul's sword was slender compared to the enormous mace, and it looked as if it should shatter as it absorbed a hit from the mace. However, Azul's sword was fine, and Azel didn't even budge an inch. Azel asked the orc in a calm voice. Is this all you got? Coo! Bastard! Rage made the orc's eyes turn the color of blood. At the same time, a powerful magical resonance poured out, and the mace started to let out a light. Azel waited as he gave the orc an opportunity to raise its mace. At the same time, he let his sword droop to the floor as he awoke his magic. Die! The orc let out a yell as it brought down its shining iron mace. At the same time, a thunder struck. Suddenly, a blue light erupted in front of the orc's vision. That was it. Azel was surrounded by a blue light as he leisurely passed by the orc. The orc couldn't comprehend the man's unhurried movement, so it tried to grab the man with his hand. At this moment, it realized something. Its arm was gone. No, it wasn't just its arm. Half of its upper body was charred, and it was sent flying away. Azul's sword had let out lighting, and it had cut off the arm holding the mace. As if that wasn't enough, a large chunk of its body was sent flying with it. This can't be. Orc was in disbelief as it fell over with its eyes wide open. Azel didn't even look back. He started running immediately as he spoke to Chiron. If you took too long, I was going to help you. I guess it wasn't necessary. Chiron had already taken care of all the enemies that had been hiding in ambush. Azel spoke. It stinks. What are you talking about? That orc smells similar to a mutated orc I knew. Which mutated orc? I'll give you a more thorough explanation at a later time. You have a lot of things you'll have to explain to me. Keep that in mind. If this happens as I expected it to, the number of explanations I'll have to give will mount. Let us go. The two men followed the guardian shadows as they ran. There were eyes that were watching the two from a very far away distance. Jarrus was one of them. As a keeper of prophecy, he was given the codename of Omicron. Jarrus clicked his tongue. He is very cool. He killed the orc that troubled the knights under the dragon demon prince with one blow. They had made sure that Azel wouldn't be able to sense their gazes. The reason why they were able to avoid detection from Azel, who had the ability to detect gazes on him, was simple. They weren't actually looking at him, including Jarrus. There were four keepers of prophecy here, and they all had their eyes closed. A guardian shadow was floating in the air, and they were looking through its eyes. The guardian shadows had the unimaginable ability to share the information on its surveillance of the dragon demon king worshippers. They had the ability to see out of each other's eyes from a far distance. The group started to speak amongst themselves. Isn't he completely different from Leon's report? A little bit of time did pass, but it was only half a year. A human could change so much in that small amount of a time. I guess, at the time of your report, it was said he was very outstanding in terms of skills. I think what he showed right now just confirms that assessment. Him. Is that how it looks through the eyes of a high rank spirit order practitioner? He looked overpowering to me. They evaluated Azul's martial skills. Jarrus spoke. This is a bit different from what we planned, but we can work with this. Omicron. What? Instead of testing Azel's Estringer, shouldn't we be saving the Dragon Demon Prince from the Dragon Demon King worshippers? There's the Guardian Shadows, and Epsilon has taken out the Guardian that never sleeps. I don't see it as a problem. Still, well, let's just observe for now. I realize the other task is more important. Jarrus snickered as he left. When they heard Jarrus' unreliable laugh, the other keepers of the prophecy frowned as they looked at each other. As Azel suspected, 
Laura Ornsaurus had already subdued Siger. Siger was strong. However, his power was only passable in an outside world where the true techniques had been erased. Siger had an unbelievable amount of fighting spirit for a 15-year-old teen, but he wasn't even able to harm the hem of Laura's dress. However, it had taken Laura a good amount of time to subdue Siger. The cause being she wanted to take him, while causing the minimum amount of damage. It had been about two hours, since Saiga had fallen from exhausting his power. At that moment, Laura encountered a totally unexpected problem. How is this possible? The Guardian shadows were tracking her. She had deployed her subordinates carefully in an attempt to avoid the detection of the Guardian shadows. She had readied bandits that most wouldn't call Dragon Demon King worshippers. She used them to trick the Dragon Demon Prince to come out to a location where there weren't any witnesses. She had been in luck when the Dragon Demon Prince separated from his party to scout. It really made her wonder if he really didn't realize how valuable he was. In her original plan, she would have disguised herself as a human, and she would have lured Saiger out. Then she would have used Vitten's maze on him. However, when Saiger separated from his main force, she was able to omit the middle portion of her plan. The main force was destroyed without them finding out how Saiga had gone missing. There was no reason why the Guardian Shadows should intervene, yet they surrounded the Vitten's Maze as if they had been waiting for her. The Vitten's Maze was a pocket dimension that severed her from the outside world. However, the exit from this space was fixed if she decided to unravel it. Laura had tried moving slowly for the exit, but the Guardian Shadows weren't fooled. They continued to chase after her. This is getting difficult. As time continued to pass, the Guardian Shadows from various regions would congregate, and their number would grow. When Laura comprehended this, Laura used a hidden card she had readied. She had called out the Thunder Dragon that was living deep within the mountain. The Thunder Dragon was mobilized using the Dragon Slayer's ritual as bait. The Thunder Dragon unhesitatingly attacked the Guardian Shadows. However, even then another unexpected situation occurred. They brought a dragon too. The frost dragon that lived nearby appeared, and it started to fight the thunder dragon. One couldn't just snap one's fingers to get a dragon to move. One had to negotiate beforehand. One had to agree to do the dragon slayer's ritual. This was an immemorial contract, and it was unforgivable if one lied during the negotiation. This was the reason why the Plane of Darkness had to go into the negotiations expecting to participate in the Dragon Slayer's ritual. It was quite possible that the Guardian Shadows predicted the kidnapping of the Dragon Demon Prince. Laura had moved with that worry in the back of her mind. However, she had no idea how they could have prepared a dragon to. It wasn't as if they had predicted this kidnapping. It was as if they had been sure this would occur. How can this be? Still, she didn't feel any sense of crisis. Her role in this endeavor had pretty much ended when she suppressed Saiga. If she bought some time, the reinforcements would be here. They would get her out even if they had to sacrifice their lives. From that point, she'll go to a place where she would be able to use the legacy left behind by the dragon demon king Atane. She'll be able to use the road of emptiness to escape her enemies. With that thought in mind, she had been observing the outside situation, and something unexpected happened. That man is. The organization had taken the trouble to ready a mutated orc, yet the red-haired man had killed it in an instant. Laura knew about the man approaching her location. Azel Zestringer. Niberus was the direct descendant of the dragon demon king, and she was Laura's rival. This mystery human was responsible for Niberus' failure. That man really looks similar to that person. Curiosity bloomed in Laura's eyes. Chapter 80. Those who covered the blood of a royal. Part 6. Is this the trace left behind by the tear? Chiron spoke as he looked at the location pointed out by Azel. It was located in midair. It looked as if a small shimmer had appeared. One could see a distorted space beyond the shimmer. It was as if water droplets was slowly descending a wall before it disappeared. Azel spoke. You are correct. Him. It seems I wouldn't have noticed it unless I had my eyes fixed on it. It was a trace that was merely as big as a finger length. These traces were spaced apart at a distance of several dozen meters, 
and it was located in random locations. If one had no idea what to look for beforehand, it would be almost impossible to find it. This was more true since it was night, and they were in a mountain. Azel spoke. It seems the user is very inexperienced. Why do you say that? She left behind a trace that can be detected by the eyes. Originally, it is supposed to leave behind a much smaller trace. It should be the size of a raindrop. Also, it's supposed to disappear after a short amount of time. You speak as if you have seen this before. I've seen it. Azel put on a mysterious smile. Then he looked at the guardian shadow. It happened at that moment. You aren't supposed to go that way. A teen with light red hair appeared between two guardian shadows. He had on a haughty expression that made him look like he was from the nobility. Azel spoke. I don't know who you are, but by how protective you are of yourself, it seems you did something that deserves a beating from me. I have no idea what you are talking about. Don't try to trick me with such a shoddy illusion, idiot. Azel's eyes of truth could see through all illusions. The teen had put an illusion over one the guardian shadows. It looked like the real thing, but Azel immediately saw through it. The teen let out a whistle. Wow, that's impressive. Well, it did transform in front of you, so I don't have time to listen to you rattle on. If you have business with me, speak quickly. Him, you have a very high-handed personality. My name is Jarras, or you can call me Omicron. I don't really care. I am one of the keepers of the prophecy that is testing you. A test. Does this mean you are in league with Leon? Unlike me, Leon has a different opinion about you. Anyways, we are in the process of testing you. Shouldn't you be working hard to impress us? I don't give a damn about your test. I know where you are right now. If you waste any more of my time, I'll track you down, and I'll beat you up. You must think the concealment skill of the Guardian Shadow's use is infallible, but I'll give you a chance to test it out. Let us see if you can run away from me. Ha ha. Your bluff is outra geo. You move two steps to the side. From your perspective, you move to the left. Jara's expression hardened. Azel spoke. Do you now believe that my words aren't a bluff? Don't ask me how I did it. This will be your last warning. Erase everything frivolous you wanted to say to me from your head. If you don't, I won't care what your organization want or intends to do. You'll be the first one I will chase down and kill. Ha! I see you are gathering the guardian shadows to your side. Are you sure they'll be able to save you if you gather enough of them? They might be able to. If you want to face hostility from me, you should continue to waste my time. A zell cold expression was like a sheet of ice. He glared at the illusion created by the teen as he spoke. There was no emotion reflected in his voice, and this made it that much more terrifying. At that moment, Azel was using a mystic technique of the spirit order. He was using the eyes of truth to see through the illusion, and he was looking at the real body that was projecting the illusion. Then he subtly put magical energy into his voice to upset the other's mind. Jarrah's raised both his hands. Ah. All right, I'll do as you ask. I need you to do the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Right now, yes. Amongst the two fighting dragons, the Thunder Dragon was called here by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. The Frost Dragon was called in by us. Originally, it was a dragon prepared for you, but there was a hitch in the plan. You wanted it to fight me. You were going to use the Dragon Slayer's ritual as a test. You almost guessed it correctly. It is slightly different from that. Jarrah's made an invidious remark. Azel furrowed his eyebrows as he asked a question. How did you get the dragon to move? The dragon slayer's ritual was used as bait. As expected, Jarrah's was puzzled by Azel's knowing attitude. Did you suspect it? There is no other way to do it. In truth, it is a deal without much benefit, yet there are those who try to use that method. This tactic was also used in the dragon demon war. It wasn't just used by the the Dragon Demon King's army. It had also been used by Azul's allies. However, it wasn't a smart solution, so it had rarely been used in real life. Two problems arose from using this method. First, one must deal with the Dragon Slayer's ritual afterwards. A one-on-one -on -one fight with a dragon wasn't recommended. In the midst of a war, it was very important to have strong personnel at one's disposal. 
Secondly, one could block the dragon slayer's ritual even if a dragon was mobilized. If a qualified individual asks for the dragon slayer's ritual, the dragon always agreed to it. If this other being was able to defeat the dragon, it would just benefit the enemy in the end. Azel spoke. Well, all right, I don't care about a trash test that was planned by an idiot like you. So the essential point is you want me to use the dragon slayer's ritual to kill the thunder dragon, and you will change the target of the frost dragon to the Ornsaris's heir. Yes, all right, I like the simplicity of the plan. After saying this, Azel lifted his eyes. I refuse. What? There is no reason why I should follow your instructions. If you plan on doing this next time, at the very least, you'll have to catch a hostage to coerce me. Of course, the vengeance I'll unleash on you guys will be that much more painful. Him. If you continue to act this way, do you realize you might turn the keepers of the prophecy and the guardian shadows into enemies? Do you really think that is an effective threat against me? Azel let out a snort. Then he glared at Jarrah's with contempt in his eyes. I'll give you a warning, idiot. At that moment, Jarrah's expression crumpled from pain. Kook, this is. What the hell? Any method that allows you to converse with others is never truly a one-way street. All the mystic techniques of spirit order used the senses of humans as a medium. Whether it was magic sense, sight, hearing, smell and taste, it was all subject to attack. Azel saw through the illusion from the beginning. As he kept up the conversation, he found where the magic was being emitted. Then he put magical energy in his gaze and voice to cause Jarrah's pain. It felt as if his heart was being ripped out, so Jarrah's fell over without even being able to scream. Azel turned around as he spoke to Chiron. Let's go. Him. I really like you. As expected of someone I acknowledge. As I see more of the Guardian Shadows, I'm of the opinion that it is a broken organization. I agree. Azel and Chiron ignored Jarrah's illusion, which was doubled over in pain, and they started walking. It happened at that moment. You. You resemble him. A young woman's voice was heard. At the same time, a girl that was so out of place in this rough mountain appeared by herself. She appeared above the guardian shadows. It was the Ornsaurus's heir, who had suppressed Saiga. It was Laura. Laura had just exited the Vitten's maze, and she wasn't holding the Vitten's chalice that generated the dragon demon key. However, Azel spoke as soon as he saw her. It's another woman from the dragon demon race. Are you Ornsaurus's heir? Do I look a dragon demon? Laura had an expressionless face as she tilted her head in confusion. Her outer appearance was that of a human. It was perfect. In fact, the resonance she emitted was of magic instead of dragon demon magic. Chiron asked a question. No matter how I look at her, she looks like a human. She isn't. Even if we put aside her appearance, I don't feel any dragon demon magic coming from her. At the statement, Azel spoke as he looked at Laura. Her horns, dragon demon stone and pupil are of the same color. Since you might assume I guessed based on your eye color, I'll give you a more detailed description. Your horns look like feathers. The horns are curved upwards. How did you recognize me? Laura was fascinated. However, there was no change in her expression. One couldn't feel any humanity from her. Her countenance was that of a beautiful doll. She let go of her disguise. The intricate illusion disappeared, and a dragon demon appeared. It was as Azel had said. She had blonde hair, eyes like amethysts, porcelain-like skin, and horns that flared upwards as it looked to be a crafted item made out of amethysts. A dragon demon stone was embedded on the back of her hand, and it was letting out a brilliant light of the same color. At the same time, a powerful wave of dragon demon magic started to spread. Chiron was taken aback. She was able to perfectly disguise such power perfectly as human magic. Surprisingly, Laura's dragon demon magic exceeded Chiron in terms of quantity. This wasn't the first time Chiron had met a dragon demon that possessed a stronger dragon demon magic than him. However, he couldn't help but be surprised by the fact that she was able to completely disguise her power as magic. Azel spoke. All the dragon demon king worshippers are uncanny at hitting the smell of dragon demon magic. Did you guys develop some unique magic? 
the members of the Dragon's Shadow and Nibirus were all the same. Just their ability to hide their dragon demon magic was really peerless. Laura asked him a question. Azel Zestringer. Am I right? Correct. At least, you don't call me that long and annoying title. The man with the name seeped in sin. Yes. My blood relatives have very different view from him. Not all of us call Azel the man with the name seeped in sin. A blue spark suddenly erupted in front of her. Azel had just tried an ambush attack. She had been sure Azel was in front of her yet another Azel had appeared to attack her. Laura was surprised. Ha! Huh, a clone! She had been facing him, yet he had switched places with his clone. How did she miss it? While she was wondering this point, the Azel that had attacked went missing. It had been a clone made using the shadow dance. At the same time, Azel used instantaneous movement to jump in. Thunder Dragon's Claw the sword let out a thunder. A single strike was able to rip apart Laura's shield as if it was a piece of paper. The power couldn't be compared to the one used in the fight against Nibirus. However, a white light appeared across the lightning that was burning up the space. Pa! Azel quickly turned his body to evade. When he landed on the ground, Azel let out a grumble. Insulation. You were very fast. When Azel came in for an attack, her real body was moved to a location where his sword couldn't be reached. Then she used the insulation magic to drain away the lightning. Even if one considered a dragon demon to have a quick reaction time, it had been impossible for anyone in the par to dodge this attack unless one knew it was coming. However, Laura had seen the flow of his magic. Her actions was evidence that she had read his technique's attribute. Laura spoke. Amazing. At the same time, a light erupted in front of her. An oppressive resonance of dragon demon magic was spreading outwards. Chiron was taken aback. What is that? Dragon demon magic that exceeded most dragon demon erupted from the light instead of Laura. Azel narrowed his eyes. Vitten's chalice. It really was left behind to his heir. I'm not sure how that's possible. Ornsaurus had been one of the four dragon demon generals, and dragon magic weapon Vitten's chalice was his pride. During the dragon demon war, it had been one of the most powerful dragon magic weapon in existence, even amongst the other powerful dragon magic weapon. Its appearance was as Azel had remembered, and it was grasped in Laura's hand. For a brief moment, Laura stared at Azel before she spoke. You really do look like him. What are you talking about? Your face is really similar to him. It is similar to the Azel Kazakh in the records. Are you his descendant? I heard he didn't have any descendants, yet humans procreate so easily. Or that's what I've heard. Maybe. Azel gave a flippant answer as he looked for Laura's weak point. However, she was holding up the Vitten's chalice, and unlike before, he couldn't find any hole in her defense. Her dragon demon magic and the dragon demon magic of the Vitten's chalice resonated with each other, and an incredible pressure poured out. Laura briefly looked at Azel before she spoke. I won't fight you right now. Do you really think you can do as you like? Even if you have the Vitten's chalice. Azel stopped speaking, and he jerked his head up. Why? A heavy sound rang out, and the ground shook. A large shadow on top of the mountain opened its wings, and it rose up into the air. It was the Thunder Dragon. The Thunder Dragon had been in a fierce fight with the Frost Dragon, yet it was descending towards them with thunder wrapped around it. Laura spoke. It is easy to attract a dragon. It is easy if there is an opponent that is willing to fight with one's life on the line. Is it the dragon slayer's ritual? Yes. Laura acknowledged the point without much fuss. Another dragon demon king worshipper had initiated the dragon slayer's ritual with the frost dragon, and the act had freed the thunder dragon. Laura hadn't lost her composure, since she had been waiting for this. It'll be impossible for me to face you the dragon sword duke and the guardian shadows. I'll leave that to the dragon. Azel had on an expression of dismay as Laura started distorting her surrounding space as if it was a wave. Laura disappeared without a trace in the midst of it. At the same time, lightning erupted from the three horns of the thunder dragon's head. The thunder strike struck the ground as it swept over everything nearby. Large dust clouds rose into the sky. From the surrounding, 
A cry that was like several hundred children whispering rang out. The guardian shadows let out a moan as they were swept up in the lightning attack. Azel queried in the midst of the attack. Are you okay? Duke. Somewhat. Could you teach me that technique later? You are able so comfortable in defending against it that I feel spiteful towards you. Chiron had used his defensive shield to block the dragon's thunder strike. Azel barely used any power as he allowed the insulation magic to redirect the thunder strike. Azel smirked. I will. Also, I regret to tell you this news. What is it? This is annoying. But I guess I'll have to follow that idiot's plan. Somehow, it turned out that way. I'll have to leave the prince's rescue to the duke. I. Azel glared at the thunder dragon that was descending the mountain using broad wing strokes. I have to do the dragon slayer's ritual. Chapter 81. The Scar Left on the World. Part 1. It was during the height of the dragon demon war. Carlos had talked to Azel about the dragon slayer's ritual. He talked about both sides, the human and dragon, who had to enter into the dragon slayer's ritual. Humans, who challenge the dragons in their thirst for power, are like moths flying towards the flame. However, the one that is truly pitiable isn't the humans. In my opinion, it is the dragons. What nonsense are you spouting now? When the dragon slayer's ritual is initiated, the choice is always given to the humans. If a human requested for a dragon slayer's ritual, the dragons always accepted it. It didn't matter how disadvantageous the situation was. When the dragons were born into the world, there was a thirst that tormented their souls, and they knew only one method that could quench this thirst. This was why the dragons always had their choices made for them. The one who made the selection were the humans. Wisdom and language. If a dragon didn't have those two things, the dragon could only wait until a human makes the choice for them. If there is a dragon that can refuse the challenge of a human, the dragon had already achieved its earnest wish by gaining wisdom. However, it isn't too hard for me to imagine how much a dragon would have to wait, and how much it would have to fight to gain it. A dragon might live out its long life, and not be chosen. It might be chosen when it is wounded or sick. On the other hand, humans could wait for the perfect situation, and they could even choose the site of the battle. In the end, they would only need two things. They need strength and resolve. I think it is a bit much to trivialize those two requirements. Of course, I'm not trying to do that. However, this is the difference between those who have a choice, and those who do not. I don't need to go into a lengthy explanation for you to know which side was heaped with the more severe fate. It happened in the distant past, but it was merely several years ago for Azel. In his mind, it felt as if it happened only a couple months ago, and his memories randomly popped up in his mind. For a brief moment, Azel watched the thunder dragon approach him. However, there are times when a human is also driven into a corner where one doesn't have a choice. He was in that situation right now. Azel had no choice as he had to step forward for the dragon slayer's ritual. At that moment, Chiron spoke to him. It is as you said to me before, Azel. In the past, Chiron had asked Azel about swords, and he had given Chiron an answer. Azel had said the sword was merely a tool being used to achieve his goal. If a tool was being used, there was a chance that it might break. If the tool breaks, one shouldn't obsess over the fact that the tool was broken. Instead, one should seek for a different method to achieve one's goal. That was what Azel had said. However, the dragon sword is my soul. It is my life. When a person invests meaning into an item, it is reasonable for the item to take on life as it becomes personified. Azel spoke. He treated almost all weapons as if it was a disposable tool, but he had an item that held the same significance as what Chiron described. It was the dragon Macon. Chiron handed Azel one of his two dragon swords. I'll lend you my soul. You have to win and return without fail. Azel momentarily looked at him with surprised eyes. It was as Chiron had said. To him, the dragon sword wasn't merely a tool. The dragon sword was the culmination of his life's work, and it was basically like a clone of himself. The fact that he was lending Azel the dragon sword was a big deal. Azel stared at him for a brief moment before he accepted the dragon sword, then he gave Chiron his own sword. 
I'll use it with thanks. I know you probably hadn't expected to fulfill your promise to me at this point in time. I understand. However, however, you are the only one I can entrust this task to. Azul's situation wasn't ideal. The training period he had planned out hadn't been completed yet. The dragon sword being made for him was incomplete, and his condition was a mess from pushing his body to cover this great distance. If one considered all of this, it was extremely cruel to ask Azel to go through the dragon slayer's ritual. If we was able to do as he liked, Chiron wanted to stay behind and fight alongside Azel. His feelings manifested itself on Chiron's expression. Azel laughed when he saw E. This will be enough. From Chiron's perspective, he had to put the highest priority on rescuing Saiga. Even if this was a cruel request, Chiron had no choice but to ask it of Azel. Azel understood where Chiron was coming from. This was why he turned around before Chiron could speak any further. This isn't anything new for me. You should go save the prince. It seems Saiga has switched roles with the princess this time. Do you really think Arietta would be suitable playing the role of a damsel in distress? Chiron asked as he burst out laughing at the ridiculous idea. Azel didn't turn around as he replied. Still, the picture that is conjured up by her in the role is better than the prince. Isn't that so? I see. Saiga that bastard. When this is all resolved, I'm going to train him mercilessly again. After saying those words, Chiron turned away. Azel gripped and swung the dragon sword that had been loaned out to him. It was the first time he had used this sword, but it felt right in his hand. The fact that it was a well-made sword contributed to this feeling, but it had more to do with the familiar energy that had been imbued within the sword. Dragon Demon Magic. In the past, he had felt this energy every time he used his dragon Macon. That energy was within this sword. The dragon sword wasn't something that could replace a dragon Macon, which was forged from one's own soul. Still, it was too exquisite to just call it a mere sword. It could self-regulate the emission of dragon demon magic, and it could transform the user's magic into dragon demon magic. However, this wasn't like the dragon Macon where the, the sword and the owner worked in harmony to create power. Still, the fact that he had the dragon sword increased Azul's options by a lot. Oh dragon. Azel checked through the dragon sword's sense, then he called out in a low voice towards the thunder dragon. However, his voice was amplified by magic, so his voice cut through the ruckus being made by the thunder dragon. His voice reached its ears. My name is Azel Zestringer. Azel brought up all the magical energy he had gained through his training, then he made a declaration. I challenge you do the dragon slayer's ritual. The thunder dragon had been making a lot of noise as it was charging towards Azel. However, it suddenly quieted down as if everything before had been a lie. The thunder dragon looked to Azel as if to confirm what it had just heard. Azel slowly raised his dragon sword, and he got into his stance. After a moment, the dragon broke the stillness by nodding its head. It had accepted the dragon slayer's ritual. Every time Azul's heart beat inside his chest, the rings of life vibrated roughly as they emitted magical energy. There were five rings of life encompassing Azul's heart. Every single one of them had gone through the dual banding process. However, if one asked Azel if this was enough, Azel would have shook his head from side to side. The amount of magic, his physical constitution, and his condition wasn't at a state where he could say it satisfied the necessary and sufficient condition for this battle. However, it has always been like this. A live battle wasn't about. It had been the norm for Azel to step onto the battlefield when his body was in no condition to fight. He stepped forward to fight his enemies despite the circumstances. Yes, it has always. Whether it was the past or now, it was all the same. After he awoke from his deep sleep, he had been chased, and he had fought in his lessened state. Yet wasn't he still here? Thunder Dragon. This was intentional, but it seems we are fighting on pretty equal grounds. You and I are both injured. Azel quickly assessed the Thunder Dragon's condition. Azel wasn't in perfect condition, but this was also true for the Thunder Dragon. Of course, it had fought a battle with the Frost Dragon until recently. Its injuries had been recovered by its incredible regeneration ability. 
but one could do nothing about the accumulated fatigue and the already consumed magical energy. I stand before you, because I also don't have much of a choice available to me. However, there was no pity in the dragon's eyes. It just planned to treat this as a kill or be killed battle whether it was fair or not. The thunder dragon answered Azul's words with its action. The thunder dragons were fastest in terms of attack amongst the dragons. Each type of dragons handled different type of element. Lightning was faster than every other elements. When the thunderclap rang out, the target would have already been fried by the lightning. In this thunder dragon's lifetime, it had never met its match except other dragons. No matter how strong the being was, it couldn't stand up to the lightning that was emitted by its horn. It used the lightning to immediately close the distance and burn the enemy. Yes, I am very well acquainted with it. I would dare to say that I understand your plight better than any other human. However, Azel was different from any other beings it faced before. The thunder dragon was taken aback. It was sure its lightning strike had hit Azel straight on, yet it hadn't even ruffled his hair. It was a defensive technique Azel had already used against Nibiris and Laura. It was the insulation technique. The fact that the thunder dragon would use lightning attacks was too predictable. He could easily defend against it. Azel took advantage of the flustered thunder dragon. He charged forward. The more distance there was between him, the advantage was on the thunder dragon's side. He had to get to a distance where his sword could touch it. The surprised thunder dragon let out a chain of lightning strikes. It didn't care if its body was hit by the lightning. The thunder dragon started emitting a storm of lightning. The thunder dragon controlled the lightning. It didn't take any damage from the lightning that was emitted from the thunder dragon's body. Its inner constitution was even resistant against lightning created by an enemy. Its preparation is faster than expected. This dragon has some prior experience in fighting. The previous earth dragon he had fought had been a young dragon. When its first attack was neutralized, it had been taken aback. Azel had used this opening to take down the earth dragon. However, the thunder dragon continued to attack and defend even when it ran into something it didn't understand. The thunder dragon's horn was burning with a blue flame, and it was shooting out lightning towards every direction. The ground was scorched, and the lightning discharged into the air. The thunder dragon controlled the diffuse electricity to make a lightning barrier, which burned everything it touched. Azel was attempting to get closer to it, but he was being pushed outside by the influence of the barrier. He had formed insulation using his magical energy, but it wouldn't last much longer. If the lighting continued to encompass the whole area, then there was no way he would be able to counteract it using the insulation technique. When Azel was pushed farther away, the thunder dragon immediately carpet bombed Azel with lightning. Azel used instantaneous movement technique to cause confusion as to where he really was, and he approached the thunder dragon from its blind spot. He repeated this process several times. From Azel's perspective, he was lacking in power and speed. If he was just a little bit more faster and stronger, he would be able to time his attack. However, the thunder dragon was barely able to push him out using the barrier attack. Hmm, this was already his sixth attempt. He had been rebuffed at every try, and the thunder dragon continued to let out its lightning toward Azel. If one turned back the time, one would have seen the exact process be repeated multiple times. It almost created an illusion of a loop. At that point, Azel had two choices. He could accelerate using instantaneous movement to escape to the side, or he could charge again after letting the lightning flow through him using insulation. This won't do. Every time he was rebuffed, a huge portion of his stamina and concentration was used up. This pattern kept repeating itself, and both sides were waiting for each other to make a mistake. Since the dragon had an enormous surplus of energy, the dragon's victory was almost guaranteed if this continued. When he came to that assessment, Azel decided to use a new method. Azel stood in place as he received the bombardment of lightning. Up to this point, the thunder dragon had been spreading out its continuous attacks, so the thunder dragon flinched when Azel stopped moving. Those who eat lightning. This was a much more difficult technique than the insulation technique. One was able to use this technique only if one was sure the enemy would use a lightning strike. 
This technique used the insulation technique to divert the lightning, and it allowed a portion of the lightning to be absorbed back as one's energy. Convert. The absorbed lightning was sent along the vibration of the rings of life, and the lightning was changed into a power with different property. Azel had accomplished this in an instant, but it was one of the most difficult high-rank spirit order technique. If a high-rank spirit order practitioner saw it, it would leave him flabbergasted. Azel endured the assault as he refused to budge. The lightning were conducted from the top to the bottom as it grounded into the floor. Afterwards, Azel's eyes flashed as he swung his sword. Earth dragons charge. The ground shook, and the shockwave pushed through the surface of the ground. It was akin to a shark surfacing from beneath the sea at high speeds. When it collided with the barrier of lightning put up by the thunder dragon, the entire earth was flipped over. The power that exploded from within the earth flipped over the ground that the thunder dragon was standing on. It was a really surprising turn of event. One usually attacked by causing an explosion that disturbed the surface of the ground. However, Azel had turned over a localized region of earth. This was only possible if one was able to meld overwhelming strength, and an almost miraculous amount of control over one's senses. The Thunder Dragon was taken aback by the unexpected attack. It had lived a long life as a Thunder Dragon, but it would have never expected such an attack was feasible. The Thunder Dragon was imposing in its size and weight. Moreover, it stood on four feet. A dragon had a better sense of balance than a human, yet it was being flipped over on its back. At that moment, Azel lamented deeply about his own shortcomings. It had been the perfect opportunity. While the Thunder Dragon was in a state of panic, he should have immediately rushed in to deal the critical blow. However, the lightning that was channeling through him was still discharging. The lightning gave Azel an electrifying pain, and it was escaping the control of his body as the power of the lightning was on a rampage. I underestimated it. He had his past self in mind when he tried this brash move. Currently, he couldn't absorb the entirety of the Thunder Dragon's strike. In the end, the power that couldn't be absorbed and transformed was running amok inside his body. This was why he had missed the golden opportunity to attack. He had no choice, but to look at the opportunity pass by with his eyes wide open. Azel gathered the unruly lightnings into a single location and he discharged it towards the sky. He tried to gather his breath while on one knee. He had done something dumb. Wouldn't this unnecessarily deplete his reserve of power? However, a fight was always like this. A single moment of mistake could end with the loss of one's life. He had accepted the risk, and he had gambled. The reward from the success was large, but at the same time, failure brought an equally large backlash. In front of him, the Thunder Dragon was barely able to struggle to its feet. Its body was surrounded by blue lightning, and a fiendish silhouette was starting to rise out of its body. Chapter 82. The Scar Left on the World. Part 2. The lightning drew silhouettes in the air, and these silhouettes were dancing in the air. It was so bright and beautiful that one might become bewitched by the sight at first glance. However, these were very dangerous beings that could burn any living being that approached them. Constructs. These were constructs created by the dragon. The earth dragon's constructs were made from the soil. The thunder dragon's constructs were monsters made out of lightning itself. So the real fight starts now. These particular constructs were very troublesome to face. The constructs were akin to the thunder dragon's attack, which was the fastest amongst the dragons. The Thunder Dragon's constructs attacked so fast that its speed couldn't even be compared to the other constructs. They were the essence of lightning. When they flew into the air, they traveled along the thread of lightning that formed when the lightning barrier was set up by the Thunder Dragon. They flickered in and out, but when they decided to hit a target, they coalesced to travel along the same thread of lightning. No matter how fast Azel was, it was impossible for him to dodge a lightning through visual cues, especially when the lightning was already on its way. If he had an instant, Azel could move faster than the speed of sound, but the speed of lightning was much faster than that. Azel desperately sensed the flow of magical energy and the energy of the lightning. In a flash, he was able to pick up on it. The constructs of the Thunder Dragon could move unrestricted around the surrounding as it attacked. If Azel wanted to block them, 
he would have to read the attacks beforehand. The lightning flowers bloomed. The lighting let out by the dragon came at Azel in vertical and diagonal lines. Constructs were born in the backwash of these attacks, and they aimed for Azel from all directions. Azel was using dazzling movements to dodge the torrent of attacks, but he had his limits. If he couldn't dodge it, he used the insulation technique, but even that technique wasn't infallible. After avoiding the attacks using insulation, he had to block the lightning strikes that immediately followed afterwards using his barrier. The lightning was hitting him more frequently by the minute. Every time the lightning hit his barrier, it felt as if the shock would eviscerate his internal organs. There was too much of a difference between their haves and have-nots. The dragon could control the lightning as easy as breathing. The dragon's raw power were indescribably larger than any other living organisms on this world. On top of it all, the dragon just needed to get a decent shot in from a distance, and the fight would be over. On the other hand, Azel had to get close to damage the dragon, and even this task was difficult. Humans were more advanced than dragons in one aspect. It was techniques. There were countless species living in this world, and humans weren't that powerful of an existence. If a human fought unarmed, the human might not even win against a trained dog. Even if a human was to fight against herbivores, the human would lose in a landslide. However, the humans hadn't become the losers of this world. What was the reason behind it? Humans possessed wisdom. They made tools to supplement their shortcomings, and they devised ways to use these tools more effectively. Then they shared these know-hows to slowly come up with exceptional techniques. A new skill called martial arts developed as this process was refined. This was all done so the weak could stack the deck and win against the strong. This concept bordered on madness for the dragons. The dragons had been born as the strongest beings in this world yet they were born without wisdom. They were dull-witted, so the only answer as to how a human could win against a dragon could be only known by gaining this wisdom. Azel let out a shout. He couldn't get out of the way of the lightning strike, so he absorbed it into his sword. Then he discharged the energy. The fact that he was using such a method meant Azel had been driven into a corner. It looked as if he had reached his limit. He was barely avoiding and blocking the attacks. In the end, the lightning barrier spread out by the thunder dragon, and the constructs had completely surrounded Azel. Azel couldn't dodge the attacks, so he engaged his barrier. The attacks hit his barrier, and Azel was sent flying. It seemed he hadn't been able to neutralize all the shock so he was seen flying through the air as blood was spilled. In a flash, the thunder dragon glared as it opened its mouth. It was sure its prey had been weakened. It didn't hesitate to use its strongest weapon in its arsenal. At the same time, a light shone in Azel's eyes. Dragons roar. I anticipated as much. The thunder dragon was a violent and impatient being. In the first place, it had the power of lightning to instantly incinerate its enemies. So how would a word like patience be associated with such a being? Even though it was fighting against a foe it couldn't comprehend, the thunder dragon didn't hesitate in its attack. It had to hit hard. It was getting more aggressive as it continued to attack. Even if it developed numerous techniques through its experience in live battles, it couldn't change its base nature. Azel reaffirmed this truth as he fought the dragon. The dragon's roar exploded forth. The lightning barrier being used by the thunder dragon coalesced into a single point. It gathered around the roaring dragon's mouth as an incredible pillar of lightning was emitted. In a flash, several hundred meter of the surrounding land burned white. After a second, an enormous cloud of dust rose into the air. This dragon was on a different level in terms of technique compared to the earth dragon Azel had fought in the Balan forest. This thunder dragon was very adept at knowing how to use its power. This was also the reason why it was doing as Azel had intended. I was waiting for this. Even the appearance of him being cornered was part of his battle tactic. His life would end in a flash if he made a momentary mistake, but he used this fact to his advantage. He had to do this if he wanted to win against the dragon. Even as the explosion started to scatter the pillar of lightning, Azel circulated a powerful current within his body. It was a lightning strike he couldn't block with just the insulation technique. 
Even though Azel had become stronger through his training, Azel would have died without being able to do anything by the Pillar of Lightning. It would have happened if Chiron hadn't lent him the Dragon Sword. Thunder Dragons. A powerful wave of dragon demon magic was being emitted by the Dragon Sword. It was a power that bent reality through one's will. The dragon demon magic imbued Azel with a power that allowed him to exceed his own limits. A blinding electric light gathered and burned around the dragon sword that was held by Azel. By the look of it, it was clear that a part of the powerful lightning that had been generated by the thunder dragon was imbued into the sword. Horn. The sound of an explosion rang out, but the lightning had already cut through the thunder dragon. The pillar of lightning exploded as the world burned white. Azel's magical energy was lower than what he had possessed at the Balan forest when he defeated the earth dragon. However, he had just took in the thunder dragon's lightning attack, and he had sent it back after amplifying it. This strike exceeded the strike he had used against the earth dragon. However, Azel didn't stop there. He immediately jumped into the lightning that had just exploded forth. The sound of flesh being ripped apart was heard as blood fountained into the air. The dragon let out a cry of pain. Surprisingly, the thunder dragon was still alive. This was the strike that had ended the life of the earth dragon, yet it looked almost unharmed from the previous attack. It was to be expected. The thunder dragon treated lightning that fell in a storm as nourishment. Even if a strike could part a mountain, it wouldn't receive any damage if the attack was lightning-based. Azel was well aware of this fact. However, he had used the Thunder Dragon's own technique to put into a state of panic. This gamble, I am the winner, after letting out the dragon's roar, the Thunder Dragon received a strike that it could have never predicted. The power that protected its power diminished as its mind was in a defenseless state. It suffered an attack to a vulnerable spot. The dragon was swept up by exquisite pain, and Azel pulled up all his strength to attack before the dragon's mind returned to its normal state. After consecutive sounds of explosion rang out, blood sprayed out from the dragon's body. Something was wrong. It couldn't do something that it should be able to do. It couldn't stop itself from bleeding. It wasn't as if Azel had attacked the same location. Its initial wound should have stopped bleeding through regeneration. However, the wound continued to widen as blood continued to pour out. Blame the duke. If it wasn't for this sword, it would have been my loss. Azel had used a hemorrhagic curse that worked even on a dragon. Azel was being backed up by plenty of dragon demon magic, so he was able to use this technique. Moreover, Chiron's dragon sword made this attack possible. However, its bleeding wasn't the only strange occurrence that created confusion within the thunder dragon. There wasn't only one sword hitting its body. Numerous sword strikes were parting its body at the same time. It felt as if several dozen humans were attacking it. However, it knew that wasn't possible. It was performing the Dragon Slayer's ritual with the single human, who was in front of it. Dance of the Shadows. In that moment, Azel created several dozen clones that had the substance of his real body, and they all charged towards the Thunder Dagon. The hemorrhagic curse could only be used by Azel's real body. However, the sword strikes all over its body could still cause damage. The thunder dragon didn't know what to do as pain washed over it. Kaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
The terrifying blue eyes looked down at the dragon, and flame erupted from his body like an active volcano. Horn. Then he brought down his burning sword down on the crown of the dragon's head. My god, how can he dispatch a dragon so easily? The keepers of the prophecy was taken aback as they watched Azel and the thunder dragon conduct the dragon slayer's ritual. They were well aware of how frightening of an existence a dragon was. This was quite apparent since the surrounding landscape was being rearranged by the fight between the thunder dragon and Azel. However, Azel had defeated the dragon very handily. If one knew the inside story, one would have found out that Azel had stolen the victory through a gamble. It had been a gamble with his life as a collateral. However, these beings didn't know the inside circumstances, so his victory looked unbelievably simple. Was he really the same person that impotently lost to Zeta only four months ago? Maybe he really is the figure mentioned in the prophecy. One of the keeper of prophecy spoke. Leon was also surprised. This fight hadn't been planned. Of course, the frost dragon hadn't been mobilized to be used at this point in time. Still, it was a card they had prepared, so the frost dragon could be mobilized any point in time. However, they had to use prematurely use the frost dragon, because of machination of the dragon demon king worshippers. Leon asked a question. What would happen if you fight him now, Zeta? I don't know. I can't guarantee anything. Are you able to win against a dragon, Zeta? It is possible. However, Zeta wasn't confident he could do it like Azel. When he was alive, he had been known as a genius and an expert as a spirit order practitioner. However, when he faced Azel before, he had been outclassed by Azel in terms of techniques. Yet this man now had matured in power up to a point where he could defeat a dragon in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Will he really be able to defeat him? Leon spoke. Jarras. Sometimes your harebrained schemes are useful. Jarras was struggling like a bug beside Leon's feet. Shit. If you are going to give me a compliment, you should. Why don't you speak in a more agreeable tone? Jarras was letting out cold sweat as he laughed. The pain given to him by Azel was quite terrible. His body was still struggling from the pain. Leon furrowed his eyebrows. You should pick one reaction. Either you can be in pain or you can put on a smile of victory. You look creepy right now. The man called Azel. His actions have more bite than expected, but in the end. He is a virtuous man. If he is such a man, he can't help but choose this course of action. You just dropped a line that would be spoken by a real villain. Well, I guess you are a trash that is worse than a villain. We are all the same. It is annoying, but I have no basis to refute your words. Anyways, I'm really starting to think he is the one being pointed out by the prophecy. Jarras was still crumpled on the floor as he he let out a dark laughter. Leon spoke. He looked at Jarras as if he was an idiot. It seems Theta and Delta is doing well. Chapter 83. The Scar Left on the World. Part 3. While Azel was conducting the Dragon Slayer's ritual, Chiron chased after Laura. He was chasing after her by himself, and he lost her trail when she hid herself inside Vitten's maze. Fortunately, the Guardian Shadows were able to pick up on her whereabouts again. Then, him. Legendary runt. I use my artistic sense to decorate your eyes, but now it is back to its mundane appearance. I neatly cleansed your ugly-looking skeleton, yet it seems it has become dirty again. Chiron growled. The one making the sarcastic remarks as soon as it saw Chiron was the dragon demon undead named Delta. It was allied with the Keepers of Prophecy. Its skull was crushed in the fight against Chiron, but it arrived to battle Laura after it had recovered its original appearance. We don't have the luxury to unnecessarily squabble over our feelings. The one to speak in such an annoyed tone was the undead magician Theta. Chiron grumbled. Hey, skeleton magician, can't you tell me if I'm in a nightmare or not? Then maybe I'll have some impetuous to be more thankful towards you. You should try biting your tongue to see if you are of right mind. You are fighting in a united front with the dirty undeads. That is an undeniable reality. Shit. You've lived for a pretty long time, yet you haven't experienced this before. You should be more accepting of these new emotions. It is best to have a flexible mind in regards to this arrangement. 
You are an annoying bastard. What a very unoriginal assessment. From Chiron's perspective, he was really annoyed, but he couldn't deny the fact that Delta and Theta were reliable allies. This was especially true of Theta. If it wasn't for Theta's magic, he would have already lost Laura. You guys are really persistent. Laura let out a sigh. She was clearly vexed by all of this. However, one could feel a sense of danger coming from within her. I never expected him to attempt the Dragon Slayer's ritual. She had planned on escaping, while letting the Thunder Dragon deal with most of her pursuers. However, her plan had gone awry. This was especially true in regards to Azel. He had occupied the Thunder Dragon by using the Dragon Slayer's ritual. This possibility was completely outside of her calculations. Still, did he really have the requisite power to face off against it? Before Chiron had arrived, Theta, Delta and several other Guardian shadows had surrounded her, and they sent fierce attacks towards her. She hadn't been able to travel very far when Chiron suddenly appeared. He had sent an attack towards her without a moment's notice. Everything looked as if it was burning bright. Afterwards, Chiron struck atop her barrier. The barrier shook violently. Chiron's attack was so fierce that it made her blood run cold. As it stands now, I'll be in danger. She had been completely wrong in her calculations. There were too many strong enemies for her to fight and defeat them. She was well informed of these beings. Aside from Chiron, these two undeads were beings that had been killed in a fight with Laura's predecessor. Basically, they were Laura's sworn enemies, but it didn't rise to a threshold where she held a bitter resentment against them. In the first place, Laura didn't hold any affection towards the previous heir of Ornsaurus. During that fight, all the members of this organization hadn't gathered in a single location. Moreover, the Dragon Sword Duke is also formidable. As she was having these thoughts, she was exchanging attacks in the fierce battle. Laura was using all kinds of magic in an attempt to escape this place. However, the encirclement by her enemies was too sturdy. About half of her magic was being offset by Theta. While the Guardian Shadows annoyed her by attempting to slow her down, Chiron and Delta rushed in close to hit her with terrifying sword strikes. What should I do? It wasn't as if she didn't have any methods that'll allow her to escape from this place. She just had to withdraw the Vitten's maze being used to imprison Saiga. She had to turn the full ability of the Vitten's chalice towards her enemies. However, that would cause her to fail her mission. I don't want that to happen. Her head knew which choice was sensible. If one considered the merits she had accrued until now, a single failure wouldn't cause too much harm to her. Wasn't this something even her rival, Niberus, had failed? If I do fail, I'll be fine. Laura mumbled to herself as if she was convincing herself. Yes, it'll be all right if she failed. The right move was to concede Segia to them, so she could get out of here safely. However, there was a stuffy feeling at the corner of her chest as if there was an obstruction. It won't be too late to give them a name after we sort him out. When she was young, she didn't know much about the world, and she hadn't received her name of Laura yet. She remembered the adults speaking as they coldly looked down at her. Their eyes had looked at her as if they were judging the worth of an item. Only those who don't fail will be given a name. We don't need failures. She always heard a variation of those words. Laura had once been pitted against the children for the seat of being an heir. Those who failed were weeded out through natural selection. They only wanted the children, who achieved results. Only these select children were given names. The children, who were weeded out, disappeared from this world. The children were tools that would be used to achieve their earnest wish. This was why many children were, produced, and only those that met the requirements were left alive. This was the first time there was a change to Laura's expressionless face. She made a sensible and cool judgment. She decided to give up on this mission. Her well-being had to be prioritized. This was supposed to be a simple decision. However, a wound had been engraved into her mind starting from her childhood, and it was getting in the way of her making this simple choice. Qua ha ha heart. Her barrier was cut open. While her concentration was faltering, Delta and Chiron used the opportunity to focus their attacks on a single point. Laura let out a scream. Her sturdy barrier was broken, 
and her long dress was torn. You are having idle thoughts during a battle. You must be overflowing with confidence, miss. This was the perfect opportunity. Laura had been flung away. Chiron stormed in front of her, and he unhesitatingly brought his sword down. This would be the end for her. At that moment, a light exploded in front of his eyes. What? Chiron was shocked. The light hadn't caused him any harm. His vision was momentarily obstructed, but he didn't suffer any physical damage. However, he didn't feel anything at the end of his sword. He capitalized on the perfect opportunity, yet his sword had swung down on empty air. Laura was letting out a deep sigh in front of him. At that moment, Chiron couldn't believe his eyes. The light had ignited in front of him, but he had closed his eyes instantly. He hadn't been blinded by the light. However, the sight in front of his eyes were distorted as if he was seeing a heat shimmer in an early summer day. Theta spoke. It is a distortion of space. Vitten's chalice gathered the light from the sky, and it was a tool that distorted the space. The distortion of space could be used to create a completely secluded space. It was also possible to cause a local distortion of space other than creating the Vitten's maze. Moments ago, Laura was in a desperate situation, so she had created a distortion in space. Chiron was accurate in his strike, but the distortion made him cut through empty air. I failed, a pale-faced Laura mumbled to herself. She had created a distortion in space, and at the same time, the Vitten's maze had been broken. Azul's assessment was spot on. Laura was still inexperienced in using the Vitten's chalice. She couldn't maintain the Vitten's maze and cause a distortion in space at the same time. The unconscious Saiga was on the floor next to her. Saiga, Chiron yelled out in surprise. However, Saiga had lost complete consciousness. He didn't respond to Chiron's words. Suddenly, Laura spoke. Since things turned out like this, it would have been great if he followed me. Light was emanating far in the distance. A powerful surge of dragon demon magic was felt a beat later. Woo! The air was shaking slightly. In the midst of a battle, Laura, Chiron, Delta and Theta all looked backwards. This wasn't the time to take one's eyes from one's opponent, but the wave of dragon demon magic that swept over them from the back had been too powerful. Laura mumbled to herself. In the end, he slayed the dragon. Azel Zestringer. Maybe you are. Maybe you are descended from the one who saved the world from the king's destiny. What did you just say? He had never expected to hear such words from her. Chiron turned around to look at her in surprise. However, instead of giving an answer, she lifted Saiga with her magic. I was able to come to a decision regarding this failure, thanks to you, Dragon Sword Duke. As she spoke those words, she waved her hand once. Saiga's body was flung towards the wrong direction, and he started to fall off a cliff. Shit. Chiron unhesitatingly threw his body off the cliff to follow after Saiga. No, he didn't just throw himself off the cliff. He was running down the cliff. He couldn't use his movement skills if he didn't have any place to step on. When Chiron was sent away from her, Laura moved her body. Of course, Theta and Delta wouldn't just stand by as she ran away. They immediately ran towards her, but, by now, as if she had been waiting for them to move, the distortion of space was used to flip the space. They had been running full force towards her, but they were now running in the opposite direction as her. When they realized this fact, Laura had already hidden herself with magic, and she exited the location at high speed. Shit. The angry guardian shadows started to chase after her. Azel started to slowly open his eyes as the light surrounding him was dimming. The dragon slayer's ritual was over. The defeated thunder dragon had offered everything it had to the winner, Azel. Azel momentarily closed his eyes, and he felt the dragon's power permeate his body. He could feel it. The enormous power he had taken from the dragon was twitching within him. If he wanted to digest all this power, he would need a good amount of time. However, at that moment, he was full of energy as if his body's previous state had been a lie. All his wounds had healed, and the magical energy he had consumed to the extreme was now full. Now I should. If he had his way, he wanted to immediately go into meditation to digest this power. 
he wanted to give this task his full attention. However, he didn't have the luxury to do that. It was at that moment. Azel let out his killing intent as he asked a question. Are you so eager to die? The Keeper of Prophecy Leon had appeared in front of him. Unlike Jarrah's, he had come here with his true body. No, I just wanted to let you know that you don't have to be in a hurry anymore. What do you mean by that? We lost the Ornsaurus's heir. However, we were able to rescue the Dragon Demon Prince. I see. At the very least, you doused the most immediate fire. I guess it is time for me to solve a personal business now. What personal business are you talking about? You should immediately send out the bastard called Zeta. I'll destroy him. Then I'll go after Jarrah's next. I'll make it so that he won't be able to think about doing this ever again. About Jarrah's. Him. I won't defend that Runt's action, but. Runt. Azul's eyes opened wide. Leon spoke. Ah, I may look like this, but I'm much older than you, Sir Azel. What do you mean? When one becomes a keeper of the prophecy, it means you forfeit your life of living as a human. I was born during the great darkness. Azel swallowed his breath when he heard those words. It was hard to believe his story. If he was born during the great darkness, wasn't he at the very least an old man over sixty? You aren't a dragon demon or a dragon magian. Does this mean you avoided the flow of time for all these years? Yes. However, you don't have to treat me like an old man. I've already thrown away my past. Leon was speaking about an incredible story, yet he was smiling brightly. Azel was temporarily at a loss for words, so Leon spoke. Then I'll return to talking about Jarrah's. I fully understand Sir Azel's feelings, but his unnecessary method hatched a good result for you. May you take that fact into consideration. Birds of a feather flock together. You are only looking at the result. It was true that the frost dragon was used to lure away the dragon demon king worshippers. This in turn allowed him to block the thunder dragon. However, if Azel thought about the original reason why Jarrah's had prepared the frost dragon, he couldn't forgive Jarrah's. I see. Well, that is too bad. It seems Jarrah's will have to look out for his own life. I think it'll be more convenient for me to torture you. It'll prompt him to show up in front of me. Unfortunately, we aren't tied to each other through affection. We all prioritize our own safety over others. You guys are trash. I won't deny that fact. However, the reason behind our choices may differ from what you are thinking, Sir Azel. What do you mean? There is a reason why we emphasize putting our own safety above all others. Our lives are a tool being used to achieve our earnest wish. The keepers of prophecy gave up our lives as humans by choice. We are now the tools being used to eradicate the dragon demon king worshippers. So this is why you are suddenly a bit more free with the information you offer. This is why you continue to flap your lips. You want me to feel pity towards you. Do you expect me to sympathize with you guys? We never considered such a thing. We assessed that there was a high chance that you are the person mentioned in the prophecy. This is the only reason why we are being more cooperative with you. However, I have no plans to cooperate with you. If you are able to destroy the dragon demon worshippers, then that is the best kind of cooperation you can give. It didn't matter what words were said. Leon kept smiling, and his face was really like a mask. Azel furrowed his brows as he spoke. Well, all right, I'll hunt down Jarrah's myself, and I'll make him suffer. Give me the bastard called Zeta. I refuse. What did you just say? Chapter 84. The Scar Left on the World. Part 4. It is useless to test you through Zeta anymore. Ho oh, oh, I thought you said you only look out for yourself. Or do you think I'm not capable of killing you too? In my opinion, I don't think you will. I would have understood it if you were really a child. However, you are acting like a black-hearted old man. Leon's eyes widened. He could barely see Azel's movement as a sword was aimed at Leon's throat. Azel was so fast that it looked as if time had stopped for a brief moment. It was as if Leon couldn't pick up what had happened in between. However, Leon continued to smile even in such circumstances. You can take out your anger on me. I'll accept it, but you won't kill me. Azel grinded his teeth. This bastard. He isn't bluffing. Azel realized it when he saw Leon's eyes. This bastard meant what he said. 
It was as if he didn't believe that Azel would do such an act. He wasn't saying this with determination or fear. His eyes really said he didn't care what happened. Azel might be the person they are looking for, so he would accept Azel's retaliation. In the end, Azel lowered his sword. What is this prophecy you keep talking about? He is a human yet he possesses dragon demon magic. He is the bowl that will be filled with the great power, and he will fulfill your most earnest wish. The prophecy was very short. The keepers of the prophecy's earnest wish was for the dragon demon king worshippers to be wiped out. They had given up their lives as humans to see it come true. They had become a part of the guardian shadows. Azel asked a question. A bowl that will be filled with a great power. What do you mean by that? We aren't at the point where we can tell you more about it. We'll probably tell you when we receive confirmation that you are the one. So you'll tell me when you confirm that I'm the person that is prophesied to bring the end to the dragon demon king. Yes. How can you confirm such a thing? That we do not know. You can look at me that way. But I'm not lying. In truth, we also don't know much. The Guardian Shadows are a real mess of an organization. It seems there are a lot of keepers of prophecy. I thought there would at least be a hierarchy amongst you guys. I'm guessing there isn't one. Not really. For example, we have no idea what criteria was used in selecting us as the keepers of prophecy. We just know we were chosen, and we accepted it. From that moment on, we were like newly born beings that just learned how to breathe. We instinctively knew what to do and we merely acted on those instincts. What? Azel was dumbfounded. Leon shrugged his shoulders. I know about the process in becoming a guardian shadow. However, I don't have much information in regards to how a keeper of prophecy is chosen. If one wants to become a member of the guardian shadows, I was told that another guardian shadow has to choose you. Ah, this is what I just spoke to you about. It is the process in how one becomes a guardian shadow. Ha! Huh. The members of the organization called the Guardian Shadows chooses the other Guardian Shadows. Basically, they are given a choice. The sound of a children whispering was heard, and at the same time, the ghostly Guardian Shadows started to appear. There was someone with a small stature like a child. There was someone with a bent back like an old man. There was someone with a stature of a giant. There was a someone that was fat. A variety of silhouettes formed but they all shared the same appearance as they circled around Leon. Leon looked at them as he told Azel a secret. The Guardian Shadows were all humans once. They were humans once. Azel was surprised. Maybe he should have expected it. However, the Guardian Shadows had been too alien for him to think of them as former humans. Azel looked at variety shapes of humans. Magic and spirit order techniques could be used to alter a human. There were living beings, who chose to change until they became monsters. Then there were those who became undeads in death. However, the alterations seen by Azel in the past didn't resemble anything to the Guardian Shadows. In some ways, they looked like spirits without bodies. In some other aspects, they resembled the undead. However, they were neither of the two. One couldn't feel evil energy from them, yet they didn't have true forms. They were strange beings. It was as if they were living between this world and another. There used to be a great magician in the past. Him. There might have been couple more magicians, but in the story I was told, there was only one. Leon was talking about the origins of the Guardian Shadows. Azel had seen numerous magic in the Dragon Demon War. He had witnessed the greatest mysteries of these magic, yet he couldn't wrap his mind around the Guardian Shadows. How was such an organization born? He opposed dragon demon king Atane, and the people who worshipped him. He wanted to fight those that were manipulating the situation of the world from behind the curtain. However, even if he did possess incredible magic, he didn't have enough power to fight all of them. This was why the great magician had come up with this method. He couldn't stop all of them by himself. He couldn't just simply create an organization. He decided to gather the power of more people. The dragon demon worshippers built a relationship of cooperation based on their worship for the dragon demon king. He wanted to something akin to that. He needed people that wouldn't calculate the gains and losses. He needed beings that would cooperate on the pure desire of obstructing the dragon demon king and his worshippers. Basically, 
He picked beings that held a grudge against the dragon demon king worshippers that couldn't be washed away. However, there had been a problem. Normally, those with that much enmity against the dragon demon king worshippers were already all dead. The dragon demon king worshippers were obsessed with keeping their secrets. The easiest way to keep a secret is to dispose of all the witnesses. This was why he didn't recruit the living. He found willing allies in the dead. This was how this great magic was completed. If other magicians were told what he was doing, they would have said it was impossible to do. This was a massive magical spell that would encompass every person in this world. This magic is basically called the Guardian Shadow. There had been souls of the dead where the enmity against the dragon demon king worshippers couldn't be washed away. The souls was confronted with the essence of this magic, and they were given a choice. They could either pass on to the land of the dead, or they could give up the peace of the afterlife. They could become a part of the magic, and they could fight against the dragon demon king worshippers until the end of the world. The guardian shadows were the souls, who picked the latter choice. Do you really want me to believe such a story? Azel was struck dumb. If he looked back on the dragon demon war, his enemies and allies had used almost calamity level magic. The land over a town, which supported a thousand people, were turned to the land of the dead. All the living beings were infected with a magical infectious disease, and it turned the living beings into undeads. Such evil miracles had occurred before. However, even if Azel used the standard of magic that had been used during that time, this was preposterous. Leon spoke. I'm also a magician, so I know my words sound absurd. However, there is one dream that every magician possesses. A cataclysmic event had forever left a scar on this world. When Carlos was being full of himself, he used to repeat his desire to achieve this very same dream. It was the ultimate task all magicians worked towards solving. It was passed down that the dragon slayer's ritual and the common language between people were the result of fulfilling this desire. If one thought in those terms, the magic that had formed as the guardian shadows didn't seem impossible. Through the long history of magic, the knowledge and techniques were passed down, and there were beings that rose above those past knowledge. They were able to create miracles. The guardian shadows is one of these miraculous feats. This was the information that had been passed down amongst us. Azel was at a loss for words when Leon revealed the origins of the Guardian Shadows. Jarrah's was far away as he synced his vision with a Guardian Shadow next to Leon. He furrowed his brows as he mumbled to himself. I had this thought from the beginning, but. He really looks like someone I know. What are you talking about? I don't have much of my memories left, but. Jarrah's went over his memories when he heard his comrade's question. When one became a keeper of prophecy, one looked like a human, but one had given up everything that made one be a human. They weren't affected by the passage of time, and the keepers of the prophecy always maintained their original appearance. They didn't age or get sick. They didn't die unless they were murdered. In a way, they were the manifestation of the desire for humanity to live forever. Of course, they had given up being humans, so they had also given up the advantages of being humans that allowed them to enjoy their life. They were beings that were gripped by their most powerful memory. They had enmity against the dragon demon king worshippers that couldn't be washed away. This memory was embedded like a curse, and it wrapped itself around their minds. It wouldn't let them go. Any other memories unrelated to that one became fuzzy. The other memories were like heat shimmers in a summer day. The memories disappeared across the fog in their mind. Even amongst the keepers of the prophecy, Jarrah's had lost the most memories. He knew he was of noble birth, so he maintained his prideful attitude. However, he had lost all his memories from childhood. Currently, he only had a vague sense that he had a father, mother, older brother and a little sister. However, he couldn't even remember their faces. At time, he thought about them, and it drove him nuts. He could remember some of the memories he had with them. He could remember some one of the precious feelings he had felt. However, he couldn't remember their faces, no matter what methods he used. Azel Zestringer. I've seen that man before. Jarrah's furrowed his brow. He couldn't even remember his precious family. Yet how could he feel as if he had see Azel's face? Was he mistaken? It couldn't be. When they first went to greet Azel, 
There was a voice in the back of his mind that kept speaking to him. This is something important. I can't let this go. I must not pass this by. Jarrah's put a big importance on his intuition. It had never ended well when he ignored such a feeling. At that moment, another keeper of prophecy spoke. I think I know what you are thinking about. Him, what are you talking about? Portrait. He also closed his eyes to get a closer look at Azel's face. He looks very similar to the portrait of the hero Azel Kazark that I saw before. A portrait? Yes, it might be, because they share the same distinctive red hair and blue eyes. However, their overall features are quite similar. From what I gathered, every portrait of Azel Kazark looks different from each other, so I'm not sure if it is a reliable source. Him, Jarrah's furrowed his eyebrows as he tried to remember the past. A voice he heard when he was still a young child brushed by his mind. Jarrah's, no one else in this world knows about this, but we are a family that had been descended from a great bloodline. You should be proud of this truth. He was sure that this was something his father had told him. He had a feeling that he had heard this story many times before. Moreover, he was sure he had loved listening to this story. Jarrah's head hurt as he focused on his memories. However, he couldn't remember anything related to that story. Shit. Jarrah's grinded his teeth from frustration. Chapter 85. The Scar Left on the World. Part 5. Laura Ornsoras had failed at her mission, and she eventually returned to the Plane of Darkness. The elders didn't blame her. They had read the reports given by her, and the members that went along to carry out the plan. They decided nothing else could have been done by her. After she retreated away from the elders, Laura went towards a detached palace where the Ornsaurus family lived. Someone appeared in front of her when she arrived. Laura. It was a beautiful blonde-haired dragon demon teen. He possessed horns that looked as if it had been cut from ice, and color was infused into it. It was Kieran Baldazark. Laura spoke as she looked at him with a blank face. Lord Baldazark. Shouldn't you be conducting a mission right now? Kieran had addressed Laura in a friendly manner. However, Laura was strict in using honorifics by calling him a lord. Kieran shrugged his shoulders. I was merely given a scouting mission where I had to assess the Marquisate of Kazakh. As I was conducting my mission, I received a report saying the cold-blooded queen was on the move. I was given an order to return. So you just cleanly broke off from your mission. That is very like you, Lord Baldazark. Of course, I was given a return order. If it was Niberus, she would have stayed to obtain a good result. She would have fought with the cold-blooded queen. Baldazark's expression stiffened slightly. Laura spoke. Of course, I'm not in a position to speak about such things. Ah, him, Laura. What happened this time? Kieran knew Laura had come back after failing her mission. Laura had never experienced failure before. He was wondering if he should console her or not. Laura spoke. Surprisingly, it wasn't too bad. Ha! Huh, I'm talking about failure, now that I experienced it, and I don't think it's that big of a deal. He couldn't comprehend what she was talking about. Laura spoke to Baldazark, who had a puzzled expression on his face. However, it is regretful that Sir Rick had to meet his death. I judged he would be able to succeed in his task. I guess I was too hasty with my decision. At those words, Kieran let out a bitter laugh. Rick was a dragon magian that had been a vassal of the Baldazark family. He was dispatched alongside Laura to complete this mission. Originally, he was tasked to do the dragon slayer's ritual with the thunder dragon after the mission. However, he was pushed into a dragon slayer's ritual with the frost dragon which was unexpectedly brought forth by the Guardian Shadows. In the end, he was defeated in the life and death battle. He died after presenting his wisdom to the Frost Dragon. Laura was silent for a brief moment as she looked at Kieran. She dropped the issue as she changed the topic. Cold-blooded queen. I've never seen her, but I heard she is more dangerous than the Dragon Sword Duke. Him. I haven't met her either. Even if I do come across her, I was given orders not to fight her. These were the guidelines given to me. She is someone I want to pit against Niberus at least once. Laura. Kieran's brows furrowed a little bit as Laura continued to express her desire to trip up Niberus. Normally, Laura didn't even bother with Niberus. 
one could actually feel the tangible malice emanating from Niberus towards Laura. However, Laura's indifferent attitude had always bugged Niberus. So what had changed? Laura spoke. Sorry, am I being petulant? Huh, I'm somehow in that sort of a mood. When I return, I'll probably be compared to Lord Baldazark, and you know how much I don't like hearing that. Niberus, Laura and Kieran were the young geniuses that received the most attention in the Plains of Darkness. Of course, they thought of each other as competition. This was why they were mindful of each other's merits. In truth, this wasn't something they demanded of themselves. Their backgrounds put pressure on them, and it was sometimes hard to breath. Kieran was someone that was pulling ahead of the competition. Unlike Niberus and Laura, he had experienced several failures earlier on. However, he had used this experience to better himself. He was more careful in his planning now, and he steadily increased the merits he achieved. Niberus had been doing well compared to Kieran, yet she had suffered a very painful failure. Laura had suffered something very similar this time around. The elders of the Ornsoras family had requested perfection from her starting a young age. It had been said enough that she was fed up with it. She was annoyed when she thought about the words that would be directed towards her. Laura spoke. Lord Baldazark, what would you do if there was a descendant of Azel Kazark still alive? Him, you mean the Azel Kazark? Why are you asking such a question? I'm just curious. Laura didn't go out of her way to explain to Kieran about Azel's Estringer. Kieran tilted his head in confusion at the question that had came out of nowhere. He answered her. I guess it could happen. Humans are able to procreate easily, so there might be some descendants left in the world. We killed the house of Kazark, and anyone related to him by blood. However, we aren't gods. We can't always be perfect in our tasks. If Azel had heard this conversation, he would have used every method possible to kill them. The eradication of the Kazark family had been a calamity carried out by the dragon demon king worshippers. I guess that isn't what I wanted to ask you. What would you do if his descendant really got in our way? We have to kill him. That is an obvious question. Isn't it? Thank you for giving me an answer. As if she expected such an answer, she nodded her head before she turned her body away. However, when she reached a point where Kieran couldn't see her, she looked up into the air as she mumbled to herself. However, I want to ask him a question. How did our burdens, which comes with our bloodlines, differ from each other? The dragon demon king had wanted to make a new world, and they were the chosen ones that had received the blood of such an exalted being. Then there were the humans who had received the blood of the one that stopped the dragon demon king from establishing himself as a ruler. It had been 220 years, and she wondered the different significance each side put in their bloodlines. Laura was very curious as to learn about this. She stopped walking. She had been heading towards the detached palace of the Ornsaurus family. However, she started heading towards a new direction. She wanted to meet someone that'll give a different answer to the question she posed. She was going to meet an elder, who was the oldest being on this land. After rescuing the dragon demon Prince Saiga, the guardian shadows didn't say any goodbyes. They just disappeared. It seemed they didn't want to reveal themselves to Saiga, who wasn't part of the guardian shadows. The unconscious Segia woke up the next day. Saiga realized his teacher had saved him, and this knowledge made his face turn red. Then he explained what happened in his battle with Laura. So if we piece together your story, Segia. When he heard Segia's words, Chiron was able to come to a conclusion. So the reason why they tried to kidnap you and Arietta. Maybe you guys are from the Dragon Demon King's lineage. That is what I think. Saiga nodded his head. As Laura Ornsaurus was subduing him in the fight, she had dropped several clues, and he was able to come up with a conjecture. She had pointed out Saiga as she spoke regarding the great being. She had said he was someone, who had a part of the king within him. In some ways, their conclusion was a bit hastily made. They only had snippets of information. However, Laura was basically a noble that had come out from the plains of darkness. The only one she would call, king, was the dragon demon king. Azel spoke. The probability is high. It somewhat explains the reason behind their kidnap attempts. Him. No. This doesn't really explain it. 
How can it not? I know right. However, there are a lot of dragon magians, who were descended from the dragon demon king Atane. Hmm. What are you talking about? Chiron asked in surprised. From what he observed from working as part of the guardian shadow, the dragon demon king worshippers treated anyone with the blood of dragon demon king Atane as nobles. No, they were treated almost as royalty. Yet Azel was speaking about such existences as if they were commonplace. Azel spoke. That is, Atane is one of the oldest dragon demon, and he is hypothesized to be the very first mage. He named himself the dragon demon king, but before he could unite the dragon demon race to muster up an army, he had lived for a very long time. He probably had a lot of relationship throughout his lifetime, and from what I know, he left behind a long of descendants. Therefore, there are an abundant amount of beings all over the world with a Tyne's blood in them. This is the first time I've heard such a story. Did the records regarding Atane get erased too? No. That's him. I guess so. Chiron had been about to deny it, but he furrowed his brows. For the past 220 years, the dragon demon king worshippers had erased numerous records off of the world's history. It was reasonable to think that records about Atane was included in this deletion. No, it was likely. I knew the dragon demon king had lived for a long time, and he was one of the very first dragon demons. However, I never realized he had so many descendants. No, it would be more accurate if I said I've never even thought about it. Well, it is probably hard to fathom a being that named himself a king left behind descendants all over the world. I guess it is normal to not want such information spread widely. Azel accepted that possibility. Before the Dragon Demon War had started, Atine's existence was an unverified legend. He had been treated like a character from a myth that disappeared a long time ago. The knowledge of the origin of the Dragon Demon race and the existence of Atane was limited to magicians. Moreover, no one expected Atane to live so long. Basically, the world found out about Atine's existence after he named himself, the Dragon Demon King, and started the Dragon Demon War. Even Azel didn't know about Atane, and he had learned the information through Carlos at a later date. Moreover, Atine's past was discovered when Carlos researched in depth into the subject. Azel spoke. Well, even if the princess and prince was born with a more undiluted blood of the Dragon Demon King, it wouldn't be a reason to kidnap them. If we are comparing the purity of their bloodlines, the ones in the Plains of Darkness are probably superior in those terms. That's true, yet they still tried to kidnap them even as far as going through such danger. There must be an underlying reason. We don't have any other clues to speculate on the topic. We could expend more of our efforts on speculation, but it'll be a shock in the dark. That is unfortunate. Chiron clicked his tongue. Saiger spoke. Him. That woman was a really scary magician. If compared to the dragon demon Niberus, whom my sister fought, Laura was her equal. She probably is stronger than Niberus. This is why you don't have to be so down on yourself. Of course, you would have come up short against her. No, if I was a little bit more careful. Saiga let out a sigh. He was too careful with his subordinates. He made the error of stepping forward in such a defenseless state. He knew what he was worth, so he should have been a little bit more cautious. Chiron just looked at Saiga before he spoke. Saiga. Yes. As this event has an impetus, why don't you come with me to be retrained for an extended period of time? Again. Yes. I still have a lot I can still teach you. Him. Saiga was conflicted. It was an attractive offer. It was true the teachings under Chiron had been pure pain. However, if he hadn't spent that time with him, Saiga wouldn't be the man he is right now. He knew he couldn't hold a candle to Chiron, but he had thought he had enough power. However, that notion was demolished by what had happened. He almost felt a compulsive need to get stronger. Chiron spoke. I want you to think over it then you can make your decision. I'm going to spend a good amount of time exchanging sword strikes with Azel. What? Saiga was surprised. He didn't know how he had been rescued. He had just woken up from his state of unconsciousness. The guardian shadows had hidden themselves long time ago, and Saiga assumed it was Chiron, who had rescued him. Of course, 
he would have such a reaction. If one looked at Sega's standards, Chiron represented absolute strength to him. Chiron hadn't said he would instruct this human knight. He had used the expression of sharing swords with Azel. Chiron could read his pupil's thought, so he smirked. Azel distinguished himself greatly in his actions to save you. If Sir Azel hadn't fought and defeated the Thunder Dragon called out by them, you would probably be still on your way to the Plains of Darkness. You might have been subjected to all kinds of treatments. He fought and defeated the Thunder Dragon in an one-on-one -on -one battle. Segia's confusion became much deeper. A human had fought a one-on-one -on -one battle with a dragon, and he had won. Did they want him to really believe such a story? Chiron spoke as he looked at Azel. As you can see, you did something that couldn't be done by a human in Segia's way of looking at this world. In the past, wasn't Duke skeptical of my claims too? Still, I remember myself showing a little more flexibility in my attitude towards your claim. Well, I guess everyone beautifies the past memories sometimes in the course of one's life. I heard this tendency develops as one gets older. Chet, you are always so insolent. Chiron clicked his tongue as if he was indignant. Then he spoke. So in the spirit of this conversation, I want you to have a sparring session with Segia. I'll have to refuse the offer. Ho oh, oh, I think what I did this time around allows me to be a little bit more obstinate. Isn't that so? Unfortunately, I cannot gainsay you on that point. If the prince accept your offer and he comes to the dukedom of Tarantos, I'll think about it. In truth, I just want to rest for the next few days. Him. Chiron shut his mouth at those words. I'm such a. I spoke for the betterment of my student, and it caused me to put my foot in my mouth. Chiron lamented on the fact that his thoughts had been too shallow. Azul's condition had been poor prior to arriving here, and he hadn't been able to sufficiently grow his power. He also didn't have the needed tools, yet he had gone through the Dragon Slayer's ritual. After all that, Chiron was asking him to have a sparring session with Saiga. I'm sorry, you don't have to be so earnest with your apology. In terms of my physical health, I'm much better now than when I arrived here. Azel let out a light laugh. Saiga was listening to the conversation, and his expression indicated that he had no idea what was going on. Everyone in this kingdom including the royal family treated his teacher with the utmost respect. Yet his teacher was being so friendly and respectful towards a young human. No, it would be understandable if his teacher was treating Azel as if he took a liking to him. However, Chiron's attitude indicated that he was treating Azel as an equal. Chiron didn't pay attention to Segia's confusion as he spoke. Well, you probably have a lot of work to do now, so you should go meet your lieutenant. We are going to stay here for the night, and we plan on leaving in the morning. On that day, Saiga had to thorough a busy day of work. In the end, he couldn't give an answer to Chiron's offer. Moreover, there were too many things for him to consider when making the decision. Chiron didn't ask for an immediate answer. He gave his farewell to Saiga, and he left for the Dukedom of Tarantos with Azel in the morning. Chapter 86, Birth of the Dragon Sword. Part 1. Another two months passed after rescuing the dragon demon Prince Segia from an attempted kidnapping carried out by the dragon demon king worshippers. The estate in the Lance Mountain was occupied by Azel. The mountain was in the midst of a cold winter, and the whole mountain was starting to become painted white by snow and ice. Chiron had kept his promise he made around half a year ago. He had completed the dragon sword. When he heard the news, Azel left the estate in the Lance Mountain, and he came down to the Taranto's castle. This is a bit abrupt, but Havan spoke. Your body can't be compared to the state you were in when you first got here. I wanted a body like this one. Azel took off his shirt, and he stood in front of the mirror. He spoke as took poses that showed off his rippling muscles. His body had completely changed from the body he had half a year ago. He had a lot of scars on his body as he endure a harsh training regiment. However, he didn't have a single ounce of fat now. His body was perfect as it was balanced out by flexible muscles. His outer appearance wasn't the only change that had occurred. His energy pulse couldn't be compared the before. As his energy pulse became revitalized, his capacity for storing magic had increased. 
One's increase in physical ability could be seen outwardly, but the changes occurring inside was far outstripping his physical improvement. Moreover, he now had six rings of life encasing his heart. All of them had gone through the process of dual banding. He had been able to drastically recover his power, because he had the perfect environment and support. Azel had taken advantage of what was made available to him to achieve this result. Moreover, there was the Thunder Dragon's power he had absorbed from the Dragon Slayer's ritual. It allowed him to grow past the point he had originally targeted. Still, I'm falling short of making the Dragon Demon Key. He had gone through his second Dragon Slayer's ritual, so Azel's magical energy had a stronger flavor of Dragon Demon Key. However, he was short of being able to forge it into Dragon Demon Key. But maybe, there was one thing that was bothering him. He became aware of a faint difference in his energy pulse. He became aware of this difference after the second Dragon Slayer's ritual. His magical energy took on a stronger flavor of Dragon Demon magic, and he sensed some unknown particles floating around inside his energy pulse. Basically, he wouldn't have been able to sense it at all until his Dragon Demon magic had risen to a certain level. It meant something was reacting to the Dragon Demon magic. It wasn't as if he didn't have a hunch on what was going on. However, Azel wasn't going to speculate. He decided to calmly observe it. I guess I have to head out now. Azel put on his clothes, and he gave a farewell to the Lance Mountain estate, which he had occupied for the past half a year. Then he descended to travel to the Taranto's castle. During his stay, winter had come. Snow had piled up on the mountain roads, and various places were frozen solid. The going was slow as they traveled down the road. Azel and Havans could have easily descended the mountain in short order, but there were other people in their group. They couldn't just leave them behind. When they reached the Taranto's castle, the sun was starting to set, and Chiron's patience had reached its limit. You were late. What took you so long? The winter roads are dangerous. Moreover, there are delicate women in our party. How could I just leave them behind and come here by myself? You could have left everything to Havans. You could have just come by yourself. These people have looked over me for the past half year. I'm not boorish enough to leave them behind. You. The fact that you don't like to lose any verbal exchanges is still the same. Chiron grumbled. Azel grinned. I really want to give thanks to you, Duke. I was able to train to my heart's content thanks to you. Your thanks can come in the form of sparring matches. That I can do as much as you like. Azel gave an exaggerated bow. Chiron snorted as he took Azel underground. It was a secret room that had been prepared for the magic ritual. Biorin was sitting in a chair, and he was asleep. He opened his eyes when he felt the presence of two others in the room. Him, you are finally here. You made an old man wait. What an inconsiderate fellow. It seems the Duke didn't think at all about the time it would take us to come down the mountain. That fellow is always like that. He believes the world revolves around him. Biorin got up as he massaged his back. Then he went to the corner of the room. The dragon sword was there. So this is. The dragon sword was floating atop the magic circle, and one couldn't call its appearance as being sword-like. A sword was manufactured with utmost care, yet the blade of this sword didn't hold an edge. The surface was roughly carved. It looked like a club that had been carved into the shape of a sword. Azel approached the sword that didn't look like a sword. Biorin spoke. Do you remember the explanation I gave you last time? The final step has to be done through your hands. Yes. Azel gave his answer as he grabbed the sword. At the same time, the dragon sword resonated. Bar dump. Azel's heart beat loudly alongside the sword. At the same time, the magical energy that arose from the rings of life responded to the dragon demon magic seeped inside the dragon sword. It resonated with each other. The ripple of light started to spread outwards. Azel could feel a powerful dragon demon magic within the dragon sword, so he couldn't hide his excitement. This reaction was as strong as the time he grasped the Chiron's dragon sword, which had been loaned out to him. He had felt this electrifying feeling only when he had held his dragon Macon, and this feeling dominated his whole body. I already have a shape in mind. The last step in the production of the dragon's sword had to be done by the owner. First, 
one had to cause a resonance. Then one used the powerful image-making skill to decide on the final shape of the dragon sword. Azel had already decided on the shape of the dragon sword early on. It was the shape of the dragon Macon, which had been preserved for the past 220 years by Carlos' powerful magic. Wu, the powerful dragon demon magic raged inside the room like a storm. It was so intense that the magical circle couldn't handle the power, and the room shook. Biorin was taken aback. Isn't this much more fierce than the time you made your sword? Is this going to be okay? His magical energy has expanded so much that it can't be compared to before. In such a short amount of time, he. It was weird to call half a year's time as being short. However, for a spirit order practitioner, it was extremely short when considering how much Azel had increased his magical energy. Chiron watched Azel, who was emitting magical energy that couldn't be compared to his former self. At this level, he might be the strongest human alive. Numerous cracks started to form on the surface of the dragon sword, and pieces started to fall away. From within this item, a snow-white blade made out of the dragon bone emerged. The dragon sword made its appearance. Ha ha ha. Azel couldn't hold back his laughter. Ha ha ha. Dragon demon magic. It allowed one to coerce nature through imagery. A human could only gain this through the dragon slayer's ritual. Yet this power was erupting out of Azel's hand. Powerful dragon demon magic was exploding forth from Azel. And he stored it inside the dragon sword. A sharp sword strike was executed at the empty air. The sound was so clear that it almost gave one goosebumps. The sound rang out as something surprising occurred. A normal person wouldn't be able to recognize it, but Chiron and Biorin was astounded. The magical wave. He cut through it. The powerful magical wave had been swirling around him, and Azel had just sliced through it with a sword strike. The energy was cut so cleanly that it was hard to believe there had been a magical wave present before. There was a stillness in the room. It was a hair-raising strike. Was it really possible to cut off the flow of magical energy so abruptly? The magical energy was instantly put into dormancy. Azel's face was glowing with excitement as he spoke to the two frozen men. This is the greatest gift of all. I really thank you Duke and Count. Then it is time for you to show me your gratitude. You won't act like a goody two-shoes that insists on proper sleeping time. Of course not. I am willing to spar with you until the crack of dawn. Azel answered Chiron's request with a smile. Chiron also hadn't been taking it easy for the past half year. Chiron had visited the Lance Mountain estate early on, and they had made a promise to each other. Chiron had kept this promise. Did you completely master the gaze detection technique? Him. In truth, it's a very tiring technique. Chiron grumbled. Gaze detection. It was more useful than any detection ability out there. Sir Azel had taught it to Chiron. There was a lot of overlap between spirit order and dragon arts. So Chiron had an easier time understanding the technique's secrets. Chiron followed the know-how given by Azel to learn the technique. And in the beginning, it had been a time full of torment. When someone laid their eyes on him, he would become aware of it. On the surface, it looked like a very useful skill but there were downsides to the technique. Normally, he hadn't been aware that a numerous number of gazes were always on him. The information regarding these gazes started pouring in, and his mind turned chaotic. In this process, he had to go through the painful experience of processing the slew of information. Azel had warned Chiron that if this process wasn't done properly one might develop a psychosis. His mind would trick him into thinking that someone was staring at him even though no one was staring at him. Chiron had felt the weight of this warning in his bones. Azel spoke. As with all techniques dealing with the mind, the learning process is painful. It is much more troublesome than learning a technique that deals with the body. I agree. Still, it was too useful of a technique to pass up on it. After he fought and overcame this process, he earned the ability to detect danger, which far outstripped his previous capabilities. As a test, he performed a guerrilla warfare with his subordinates. He even allowed him to employ snipers. His subordinates were allowed to use magic and arrows. However, he was able to assess and react to everything that was thrown at him. Azel spoke. 
Now you have to learn the second lesson. What? I'll tell you about what happens when a fight occurs between people who mastered the gaze detection technique. At the same time, Chiron felt a cold gaze behind him. It was a gaze filled with killing intent. Moreover, he could tell something was rapidly coming up behind him. Is it a clone? Chiron already knew that Azel used the cloning technique, Dance of the Shadow, which gave substance to his clones. This was why he didn't hesitate to turn his body as he swung his left sword. Then he readied himself for a frontal attack with his right sword. Ah, however, there was nothing in the place where he had attacked. There wasn't a clone where he had attacked, and Azel used instantaneous movement to quickly attack Chiron's side. Chiron's attack had created an opening. Accompanying a sound of explosion, Chiron was pushed backwards. He was taken aback. He became really strong. He wasn't talking about combat ability. When their swords clash, Chiron had felt a brute force. Azel's physical ability was much higher than what Chiron had estimated it to be. He defeated a dragon in a one-on-one -on -one battle, so I knew he wasn't normal. Still, however, he didn't have the luxury to ruminate over this thoughts. He started feeling gazes from all over the place. Front, back, left, right. Numerous gazes stimulated his senses before disappearing. It started messing with his senses. However, it was impossible to ignore the gazes. The gaze detection technique was a focused ability that alerted the user whenever a hostile gaze was on him. Moreover, in reality, Azel's clones appeared to attack, and they disappeared afterwards. Azel used terrifying speed to continue his attack. Chiron could tell with his eyes that Azel was barely using his magical energy, yet his speed couldn't be compared to before. Chiron would no longer be able to suppress him with brute strength. Shit. Chiron's stance crumbled, and he was sent flying. Chiron was barely able to right himself when Biorin spoke. Oh, this is a new experience for you. I never imagined a day would come when you would get embarrassed by a young man. This is a treat for my eyes today. I was an exploratory skirmish. An exploratory skirmish. Just shut up and watch. Chiron threw a fit. Azel spoke. Of course, it was an exploratory skirmish. I gave you a taste. So shall we get to the main course? Now you know how this will go. I'll act in kind. Chiron belatedly activated his dragon demon magic. The effects of the dragon arts was to drastically increase one's physical abilities. When he sparred about half a year ago, he had to considerably restrict his ability. They had to fight in terms of techniques. Azel displayed surprising level of skill, but the difference in physical and magical capacity was too large. However, it was different now. Azel's physical ability had risen to the level of a dragon demon. Chiron, who had trained to his utmost limit, couldn't take Azel lightly. Chiron asked a question. What method did you use? How can a human's body reach such a level? He didn't know how this was possible. If Azel was really the descendant of the hero Azel Kazak, were all human heroes this strong in the dragon demon war? Were humans able to distinguish themselves through bravery against the dragon demon race? Azel spoke. You just have to train the tributaries to the energy pulse. Tributaries. This was the first time Chiron had heard of this word. Azel gave an explanation. Blood vessels have capillaries, and muscles have fibers. Right. It is a similar concept. Basically, a spirit order practitioner forms an energy pulse with the magical energy that naturally follows a root in a human's body. This flow of energy is strengthened. The basic framework was similar in a macro view, but slight differences appeared when one looked at the details. To be precise, Azel had followed Liglan's teachings. He had branched small tributaries from his main branch of energy pulse, and he had expanded the reach of his energy pulse to every corner of his body. Every part of his body was flowing with magic. This meant his capacity to hold magical energy was expanded to an incomprehensible level, and the magical energy that reinforced his physical body was strengthened. After hearing Azel's explanation up to this point, Chiron was amazed. That is, isn't that quite similar to how the dragon demon's body is structured? Yes, it is a way to copy the body of the dragon demon race, which is filled with the grace of the dragon demon magic. This is the extreme form of body reinforcement. 
The dragon demon race was an amalgamation of wisdom-seeking dragons and life-seeking demonic race. From the moment of their birth, the dragon demons possessed a body blessed with magical energy and dragon demon magic. The sturdiness of their bodies couldn't even be compared to the humans. Chiron spoke. Basically, you aren't using spirit order to temporarily boost your physical ability. Your body has actually reached the level of a dragon demon. So that's how it is. However, it isn't foolproof. I haven't finalized it yet. Do you have more to do? As one partakes from the dragon's power from the dragon slayer's ritual. A human may exceed those from the dragon demon race. In Azul's prime, his strength and speed had exceeded that of the dragon demons. In terms of pure physical ability, the only ones that could rival him was the dragon demon King Atain, Atain's direct descendants and the four great dragon demon generals. Azel spoke. Well, shall we continue this? You really are an impertinent bastard. Excuse me, doesn't this mean that you hid your true skill in our previous spa sessions? Technically, I wasn't. I didn't have the means to use these techniques. Now you are able to. Yes. However, I can't use them all yet. A faint blue light started to flow over Azel's dragon sword like running water. Azel spoke as he took in what was happening in front of him. However, I won't hold back in showing it all to the duke. Then, Chiron suffered a complete defeat. He hadn't lost like this, since his parents had passed away. He experienced it on that day. Chapter 87. Birth of the Dragon Sword. Part 2. Two weeks had passed. During this time, Chiron had experienced his pride become thoroughly wrecked. Ooh, shit. After a round of sparring session, Chiron spoke as he healed the wounds on his cheeks. He spoke as he glared at Azel. How many secret techniques do you have? Every time it looks like I'm about to break one another new technique come out. It feels like an infinite loop. I still have 472 left. Is that for real? I'm joking. Uh, it had been two weeks since Azel had gained the dragon sword. The two of them had participated in fierce sparring matches every day. Currently, they had already conducted over 200 sparring matches. They've already demolished two training halls, and these halls were in the process of being rebuilt. They had to move their location to the mountain, and everything was being overturned as they clashed with each other. Moreover, the result was. Chiron had lost all of them. Some sparring matches lasted less than five minutes, and there were long training sessions that lasted over an hour. Every match had different conditions and rules set as they fought each other's to test their mettle as martial artists. Chiron flopped backwards as he lie on the floor. Ah, I really can't do this anymore. Are you finally giving up? Wow, in truth, I was getting a bit tired of this. I'm glad, now I can sleep in a comfortable bed. Azel smirked. For the past two weeks, Chiron had been very dogged in his request for matches that it was wearing a little thin for Azel. One more match. I want one more match. Chiron kept repeating those words as he charged towards Azel. He didn't have much time to rest. Chiron was going to retort, but he just sighed as he spoke. I feel as if I'm 80 years younger, so you are saying you are like a 20-year-old young man. Does this mean I can treat you as an equal? Don't push your luck or that the status quo we have right now might be scrapped. Chiron spoke as he snorted. I've never been thoroughly beaten like this, since my father trained me. You are talking about the previous Duke of Taranto's. Yes, it was hard to find any good opponents after my father passed away. When did your father pass away? As I said before, it was around 80 years ago. It was right when I was about to enter into my sleep cycle. The dragon demon race was an amalgamation of dragons and demons. This was why the dragon demon race shared the activity and sleep pattern of these races. During childhood, it was common for a dragon demon to fall into a hibernation period every few years. If it was short, it would last one week. If it was long, it would last a month or two. This happened quite frequently. Chiron was deep in his recollection. That is why I didn't get to see my parents for the last time. I was told later that the Dragon Demon King worshippers had targeted me during my hibernation period, and they caused a lot of problems. Our castle was set on fire, so I don't have single picture of them left in my possession. 
Well, don't look at me like that. This happened a long time ago. My mother and father died by the hands of the villains. This was also why I chose to become a guardian shadow. Chiron let out a bitter laugh. It had already been over 80 years. However, the wound was still present inside Chiron's heart. It was also the main motivation behind his fight against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Chiron spoke as he stood up. For all my life, I trained in an attempt to surpass my father. There were too many things I wasn't able to learn from my father. However, I've been running out of available skills that I can learn from others, so I believed I had achieved my goal. He was called the Dragon Sword Duke, and no one in the kingdom could teach him anything new about the martial arts. It was actually the opposite now. Everyone was trying to learn from him. This was why Chiron didn't stop his efforts to get better. He wanted to surpass the prior goal he had set. The creation of the dragon weapons had been part of that plan. However, I now realize that I have been too arrogant. This is the thought I had when I was thoroughly defeated by you. You were right to think that way. Aren't you supposed to console me by saying it isn't true? I forgot the Duke likes people paying lip service to you. I'll rephrase my words. You were wrong. If your parent heard what you have achieved, they would most definitely feel a swell of pride at the fact that you have surpassed. Stop. You are giving me the goosebumps. Chiron grumbled, then he laughed. Please continue speaking. Which approach do you want? Don't pay lip service to me. Just tell me what you were originally going to say. In my opinion, Azel paused for a brief moment before he continued to speak. Your predecessor might have. I believe your father was learning what is called the forgotten technique. It was a term coined by the dragon demon king worshippers. Like you. Yes. Are you saying they probably wanted to eliminate the knowledge from being passed on to the future generations, so my father was eliminated? That is what I think. I also believe the castle was intentionally set on fire to burn the records. If what I suffered up until now is any indication, I think it is quite possible they put in a lot of effort into making that happen. 220 years was a long time for the humans, but it was almost a single lifespan for the dragon demons. These beings lived as part of the human society, so the knowledge and techniques wouldn't be easily forgotten. However, the fact that one was from the dragon demon race didn't mean they all learned magic or the dragon arts. Even if they did, they didn't learn it to the extreme for the express purpose of battle. Moreover, they weren't going to willingly pass on the knowledge and techniques to strangers. This was why it was enough for the dragon demon king worshippers to eliminate the beings that had critical knowledge, and the high-level techniques. Azel spoke. I've heard it from Mr. Havans. The knowledge of the Dragon Slayer's ritual and the Dragon Arts wasn't passed down in Sir Rogan's family. However, Count Aldrich's children weren't inclined towards martial arts. Wouldn't that make it more likely that he would have been targeted? Him. This is a little bit weird for me to say, but I can teach you some of the stuff you were supposed to have learned from your father. At the very least, I can teach you a portion of it. I have a lot to teach you. I would have never expected to hear such words from a human that is the age of my grandchild if I had one. Are you averse to it? I'm not saying that, because I don't like the idea. Now I have something to learn, and there is someone willing to teach me. This is. I'm in a bit of an unfamiliar territory. Chiron put on a bitter smile. It had been a long time, since he was the one learning from someone else. For a long time, everyone put him on a pedestal, and they wanted to learn from him. Moreover, Chiron had thought that was how it should be. Now he was in the position to be the student learning from someone else. He had never imagined such a day would have come. Chiron suddenly asked a question. Azel. Yes. Why are you being so good to me? You were also good to me. Isn't that enough? It is hard for me to accept that. These techniques are something I wouldn't even teach to a friend. I would understand it if you had decided to take up the sword and use those techniques for my cause. However, you plan on teaching me these valuable techniques. As a martial artist, I question why you are doing this. Whether it was a magician, spirit order practitioner or dragon arts practitioner, it was all the same. All of them were very careful in choosing the candidates they'll pass on their techniques and knowledge to. Chiron had taught Arietta and Saiga at the plea of the Dragon Demon Queen. 
However, he didn't have a true disciple yet. Azel could understand what Chiron was thinking. After a brief moment of thought, he spoke the truth. It is needed. Needed, it is to prepare for the danger that might come in the near future. I feel the need to return the power that was stolen from the beings that the dragon demon worshippers consider to be enemies. The dragon demon king worshippers had weakened the power of the population and those that might rise up against them through a long period of time. At the same time, they had kept their history and techniques intact. It was a very dangerous situation. If it is as they believe and the dragon demon king Atain really revives. Azel remembered going up against Atain. He was the first of the dragon demon race, and he was also the world's first magician. He had lived as long as the existence of a single race. He was an unnatural being that looked at the world through a strange and long-range view. The dragon demon king worshippers that reside in the faraway plains of darkness will sweep over the world again. When that time comes, we need power to be able to fight against them. Do you think we'll be at a disadvantage if it does happen? Yes. Currently, our side has forgotten about the Dragon Slayer's ritual, and the Dragon Demon Key. Moreover, our side forgot the true techniques behind the Spirit Order and Dragon Arts. If our enemies use these knowledge against us, we will be powerless. You said Dragon Demon Key. You still haven't given an explanation on what it is. Azel had mentioned the Dragon Demon Key when he explained the Dragon Slayer's ritual. However, he had too many questions he had wanted to ask that Chiron had half forgotten about it. Azel didn't answer his question. He continued to speak. I was impressed by the Duke. The fact that you were able to make the Dragon Sword. Currently, there were only scraps of record left regarding the Dragon Demon Key. However, Chiron had spent 30 years to gather these scraps, and he had made the Dragon Sword through these efforts. It was a less powerful than having the dragon demon key, but it was much superior in the fact that it was a tool that anyone would be able to use. It was superior to the dragon demon key in that aspect. Didn't you tell me that the record you had found was the impetus in making the dragon weapons? That is correct. That record was about the dragon demon key. Azel started to explain to Chiron about the dragon demon key. The soul had to be used as ingredient as it was refined through the dragon's power. This was the ultimate weapon that came out as a result. Humans and dragon magin can take the power of a dragon through the dragon slayer's ritual, and the dragon demon key can be produced. This was beyond having a tool of power like the dragon swords. It was a miraculous power for the spirit order, dragon arts and magic that strived for the pinnacle of power. Chiron swallowed his breath. Such a thing really exists. Yes. It was one of the reason why humans were able to win in the fight against the dragon demon race. There is a big gulf between those that have and don't have the dragon demon key. Him. This is why the duke has to produce dragon demon key too. What? Chiron was surprised. He asked the question as if he didn't understand what had just been said. Didn't you say the dragon demon key is made through taking the dragon's power? Moreover, this can only be done through the dragon slayer's ritual. Yes. However, I'm of the dragon demon race. I thought you said I couldn't participate in the dragon slayer's ritual. You can't. Then how will I be able to make the dragon demon key? Of course, I haven't told you the full story regarding the dragon demon key. Azel smirked. I told you that this was made through taking the power of a dragon by conducting the dragon slayer's ritual. However, I was talking about it through the prism of being a human. The humans don't have dragon demon magic in the first place. A human has to defeat a dragon through the dragon slayer's ritual to gain the dragon demon magic. However, doesn't the dragon demon race already have dragon demon magic? This was why there were those that possessed dragon demon key within the dragon demon race. The most notable being the dragon demon king Atain and the dragon demon generals, who followed him. Each of them were walking calamities that could face down thousand troops. Of course, it isn't easy to make it. There are three methods. Azel unfurled three fingers, and he lowered one finger. The first method is to use the secret technique behind Dragon Demon Key to produce it yourself. It is the hardest method. Why is that? To my knowledge, it takes about ten years at the earliest to produce it. 
If it takes a long time, it might take up to 100 years. If you are from the first generation of the dragon demon race, then it might be a different story. The first generation dragon demons meant they were directly born from the amalgamation of a dragon and a demon. The dragon demons that were currently in the human society wasn't first generation dragon demons. They were the descendants. However, there were still first generation dragon demons born into the world. It happened from time to time. Moreover, these being possessed much more powerful dragon demon magic than the descendants. This was true for Atain and the dragon demon generals. Azel felt a chill as he thought about how strong they had been. They had dragons as parents, but they were the first of their kind. They didn't have dragon demon parents. Azel folded his second finger. The second method is to combine the power of a dragon demon and a dragon magen. It could also be a human that possessed dragon demon key. However, these candidates need to have cultivated their magic or dragon demon key. Of course, this also take a lot of time and effort. How long would it take? It really depends on the skill and quality of the participants. However, the difficult part is. You still fall short of meeting the requirement. If you really learn and train hard, then you might be able to reach the bare minimum requirement. However, do you think you'll be able to find people of similar level as you? Moreover, they would have to sacrifice their dragon demon magic to pour this power into you. Ah, I guess Count Michael fits this description. He is a magician, so this sacrifice might matter less than someone training in the dragon arts. Chiron frowned. Azel had a big smile as he folded his third and last finger. The last method is to use the dragons. Dragons. It is impossible for the dragon demons to conduct the dragon slayer's ritual. However, they can use the corpse of the dragon after killing it. The dragon demon race can't absorb the power of the dragons, but when the dragon demons saw the humans gain power through the dragon slayer's ritual, they attempted to gain power through the same method. However, the dragon demons found out that they couldn't absorb the dragon's power. They can use it to create the dragon demon key. Then, you can kill a dragon, and you can use its corpse. There was a massive amount of magic stored inside a dragon's corpse. One could use this special method to accelerate the formation of dragon demon key in a dragon demon. The efficiency isn't that great, but it can't be helped. The dragon demon key was meant to be created over a long period of time. Of course, this was to the best of his knowledge. At the time of the dragon demon war, there hadn't been a lot of dragon demons in the dragon demon army that possessed this power. Chiron spoke. That means there aren't that many amongst our enemies that possess it. Yes, even the one called Niberus didn't have the dragon demon key yet. Him. Azel suddenly asked a question. Ah, you did say they're coming here. It seems they have various functions they have to attend in the new year. They'll be coming here afterwards. It'll probably take them over two weeks to get here. Chiron grinned as he headed towards the estate with Azel. Chapter 88. Birth of the Dragon Sword. Part 3. When the new sun came up, Arietta left the capital with her brother to travel a long road. It had been a while, since she had done this. Moreover, there were over 200 escorts accompanying them on the road. Arietta let out a sigh inside the carriage. I wonder if our teacher will become infuriated at us. Currently, Arietta and Saiga was headed towards the Dukedom of Tarantos for a vacation. Their mother, the Dragon Demon Queen, strongly insisted on them taking a break. It was decided that they would take half a year of rest from the work required by them as members of the royal family. Originally, the throne would have never consented to such a plan, but the Dragon Demon King worshippers had tried to kidnap both of them. Since they were in personal danger, the throne decided to allow it. Of course, it was called a vacation on the surface. However, the real purpose of this break was for them to be retrained by Chiron. It wasn't just Saiga. Arietta also felt the need to get stronger. Saiga had a bitter smile on his face. Teacher will come to realize this wasn't your idea. They were currently being escorted by 200 people because the throne was worried the dragon demon king worshippers would try to kidnap them again. The throne put a stipulation that they couldn't refuse this escort, 
Sir Arietta brought the several personal subordinates she under her command. Saiga brought a large portion of the men enlisted under his banner. I hope so. It isn't as if we can send everyone back after arriving there. Well, you can talk to him nicely about it, Saiga. What? You are going to push that task off to me? I only brought 15 subordinates. Isn't the rest of the group under your command? If one of us has to be struck by teacher's severe reprimand, I still think you should be the one taking the brunt of it. Arietta was still in the progress of assembling her own unit that would be directly under her command. The Dragon Demon Queen and Saiga had gathered some useful people for her, but the number was still too low. Moreover, moreover, you brought selected members from your unit, so they can learn from the Duke Tarantos. However, you are trying to obfuscate this fact. Do you think our teacher won't see through your plans? Do you think he'll just go along without making a note of it? Him. Well, I guess I have no choice. Saiga scratched his cheek. It was as she surmised. Since Saiga was going for a prolonged stay, he was looking for an opportunity to ask for some tutelage from Chiron for his men. He would also ask a joint training session with the Knights of Tarantos. He was always trying to find a way to increase the power of his troops. This was why he chose suitable members for this trip with that purpose in mind. Arietta spoke. Now that I think about it, he might still be there. Who do you mean? I'm talking about Sir Azel. Ah, ah, he's probably there. At the midway point of this trip, Saiga had sent a message to update their progress. He indirectly heard about what was going on at the dukedom. From what I heard, it seems our teacher is deeply immersed in sparring with Azel. It is to the point where he is ignoring all his other works. Him. Arietta spoke when she saw a perplexed expression on her brother's face. It seems you can't accept it. If I'm being honest, I can't. I think there is sufficient information going for him. From what I heard from our teacher, Azel made significant contributions to your rescue. I heard about it, but I didn't witness it. Moreover, there's no other eyewitnesses except our teacher. Chiron had said Azel had won a one-on-one -on -one battle with a dragon. Even if he worshipped the ground walked on by his teacher, he was having a hard time taking his teacher at his word. If one of his subordinates that was with him saw it, then maybe. There is no way a human would be able to pull that off. Moreover, he is young. There was a time when I thought similar thoughts as you. Saiga raised his head at Arietta's words. She spoke. However, I changed my opinion when I saw Sir Azel. If he is still with our teacher, you'll be able to see his skills. It actually might be a good experience for you. Arietta smiled as she looked at her conflicted brother. She was happy at the thought of seeing Azel again. It had been over half a year, since she had seen him. How much had he changed? When Arietta and Segia arrived, they wanted to immediately meet with Chiron to extend their greetings. However, the house steward Havans told them Chiron was absent at the moment. He wanted him to wait. When they asked the reason behind it, Havans awkwardly gave them an answer. That's, Sir Azel is our guest, and the Duke went out to spar with him. They still haven't returned. I told the Duke to come back early since the two of you were arriving today. At those words, Arietta and Saiga asked Havans to assign lodging to their party. Then they were led by a servant to the back mountain where Chiron and Azel was present. They found Chiron and Azel at a frozen lake. Are they atop the water? Sega's eyes turned round. Azel and Chiron was running atop the lake as they exchanged sword blows. It was winter, but they weren't running a frozen lake. The ice had been broken, and the two of them were fighting atop the rolling waters. The surprising part was the fact that the fight continued to be fought atop from the water from the time they discovered the two from afar to the time they got close. Arietta was astonished. That's incredible. They aren't using repulsive power to impact against the water. They are actually walking on water. What? Saiga became surprised at her words, and he looked at the feet of the two men. If it was running and fighting atop a body of water, it was something Saiga could do. However, his method was done through pressurizing and detonating pockets of air with his dragon demon key. It wasn't truly walking on top of water. When he looked closely at Azel and Chiron, they were stepping on water as if it was solid ground. At times, they came to a stop, 
and they rocked back and forth with the surface of the water. They walked, skidded and ran across the water as they clashed. The act looked so natural that it looked unreal. The two were running in a circle as they clashed, and it sent up a spray of water. At the same time, Chiron's body dipped below the surface of the water. On the other side, Azel just slid back about two steps. Chiron realized what had happened, so he surged up to the surface of the water. Then they started up exchanging sword blows again. The rebound caused Chiron's body to descend below the surface of the water. The water that was displaced for their clash returned to its original location, and his body was pushed underwater. Azel had a carefree attitude as he rained down sword strikes from above. You really are going to go there. Chiron had swallowed some water, so he coughed. Azel responded to him. You ambushed me earlier before when the match hadn't started yet. I was dunked into the water. I don't think you have the right to say that. That was that and this is. Poo you HP. Ah poo. In the end, Chiron couldn't exit the water, so he was pushed underwater. Azel let out a laugh as he thoroughly enjoyed what was going on. He retreated backwards. In the next moment, the surface of the water exploded, and a rough spray of water rose into the air. Chiron exited the water, and he looked like a drowned rat. One could see his teeth chattering. Shit, it is cold enough to make me gnash my teeth. Of course, it's winter now. If it was a normal person, one would have to be worried for that person's life. Chiron raised his eyes. Are you saying you want to avoid a match on a wet field? It isn't anything like that. I'll spar you no matter where it is. However, we should end this here. What are you saying? We are far from done. Guests have arrived. Wouldn't it be unbecoming to show such a disgraceful behavior in front of your students? Azel pointed towards the shore of the lake where Arietta and Saiga were standing. Chiron furrowed his eyebrows. It's already that time. I told you earlier that I was hungry, so we should head back and eat. I don't remember hearing that. Wow, you are getting more thick-skinned as time passes. Chiron snorted at Azel's idle remarks. He started walking towards the shore of the lake. It was as if he was walking on solid ground, but he was walking on water. As he walked, heat emanated from his body, and the water on his body evaporated. Everything he did looked very natural. Chiron was learning techniques from Azel, and he was getting stronger each day. When he arrived at the shore, he laughed as he looked at his two students. It's been a while. I am glad you guys came. It hadn't even been a year since I last saw you. Arietta had a mystified light in her eyes as she spoke to Azel. You are like a completely different person. How were you able to do such a feat? I ate good meals, and I was able to get sufficient rest. Moreover, once you combine those factors with a great view, this is possible. Azel grinned. Arietta had a sudden fit of laughter. Thank you for teaching me such an incredible secret. Anyways, it is good to see you again, Sir Azel. I feel the same way, Princess. Honora also spoke a lot about you. When did I do that, Princess? When you heard Sir Azel was here, you agonized over whether you should send a letter or not. As expected of a maid to the royal family, Honora had been standing with impeccable posture. Her face turned red. Azel laughed. Wow, I can't believe Ms. Honora did that. It is an honor. You've grown more ill-natured during the time we haven't seen you. I think I was infected by the Duke's personality. I wasn't usually like this. Please come up with a more believable excuse. Honora harumphed as she turned her gaze away. Maybe, it was because she was at an age where she was still growing, but she had grown a lot in the past seven months. She looked to be a little bit taller, and there was a feeling of maturity around her. Still, she looked like a young girl to Azel. Azel spoke to the man sitting next to Arietta. It seems the life of being a personal knight to the princess suits you, Sir Giles. You look more open now. Is that so? My current work is clearly better than what I did at the western border. Giles had also changed a lot. His face hadn't changed, but he looked more stylish than before. Moreover, he had a dignified air around him. His clothes reflected the position of being the princess personal knight. Currently, he was wearing a formal outfit. He gave off a completely impression now. Azel asked a question. How's Sir Boar doing? 
He is actually doing quite well right now. I've received a lot of help from him. Bohr's attitude in how he treated others had changed drastically, and the opinion of him had improved. His family already had a lot of power, but his conduct went a long way in strengthening his family's power. Giles received a lot of benefit from his acquaintance with Bohr. Of course, Giles had gone from a soldier dispatched at the border to being a royal knight. If it wasn't for Bohr, Giles would have had a very hard time getting used to his current life. Of course, it wasn't as if the help was one-sided. Giles had been taught spirit order techniques from Azel, and he had passed it on to Bohr. Whenever they had time, the two of them met up to refine their techniques, and they trained to increase their internal energy. Giles had been a big help to Bohr in those terms. Azel spoke after hearing everyone's story. By the way, you guys brought 200 people. That is a lot of people. It couldn't be helped. The throne wouldn't have allowed us to come here if we didn't take a force of that size. Of course, Saiga jumped on this opportunity to bring his people. Chiron was belatedly informed of the situation, so Saiga was getting an earful from Chiron right now. If everything was done as it should have been done, the escort would have returned to the capital after a brief stay. However, Segia had insisted on bring his own people. Now the Dukedom of Tarantos had to be in charge of taking care of 200 people, who would be here for an extended stay. Azel spoke. It seems the prince is really passionate about his work. He is greedy. Maybe when he retires from the seat of the dragon demon prince, he'll try to aim for a post as a general. What about the princess? I'll probably live a free and easy in my retirement. I don't want to go out into the battlefields. I don't want a tiresome life where I'll have to deal with people. I'm aiming to become the world's best slacker. It is quite an enviable goal. Isn't it? She asked a question after she sipped her tea. Chapter 89. Birth of the Dragon Sword. Part 4. I heard an interesting story about you in regards to what my brother went through. Could you confirm the veracity of this story? Which story are you referring to? Teacher said that the Dragon Demon King worshippers had brought a Thunder Dragon to facilitate Segia's kidnapping. He said you bested a Thunder Dragon in an one-on-one -on -one battle. It is true, as I had suspected. She had expected it to be true, but she was still surprised when Azel confirmed it. A single human had fought and won against a dragon. How was such a thing possible? Of course, this wasn't just anyone. If it was Azel, she thought it was possible. When she had traveled with him, Azel had been an existence that was full of surprise. Arietta asked a question. I know I'm reaching back far for this question, but did you kill the earth dragon we met in the Balan forest? Yes, it was possible, because something anomalous occurred to my benefit. Azel didn't hesitate to answer the question. He readily admitted to his deed. He had determined that it would be okay to tell her what had happened now. Is that the friend you referred to before? Correct. He was an incredible magician. He had left something behind in my body, and thanks to it I was able to win. I see. She had just heard something incredible, yet Arietta didn't question him. She lauded his deed. She didn't doubt Hazel. He had done too much for her to doubt him. Still, she couldn't stop her curiosity. Arietta asked him a question. What is your identity, Sir Azel? It seems I'll have to give you the same speech as the Duke. What if? Azel had expected this question. He had show Arietta too much to gloss over it by saying he had lost his memories. As he did with Chiron, he was going to tell her the truth first. After defeating the Dragon Demon King Atain in the Dragon Demon War, Azel went missing two years after the war. The record doesn't specify if he died or not. Isn't that true? Yes. What if he hadn't died? Him, his best friend, Archmage Carlos, devoted himself to completing an incredible magic. What if this magic was used to put Azel in a deep sleep where his aging process was suspended? What if he was placed in a location far away from prying eyes? What if he slept like a dragon through the long years in a place where humans didn't dare travel? That's. Arietta furrowed her eyebrows. Are you saying that you are the actual hero Azel Kazak? An incredible magic allowed you to sleep for 200 years, and now you are awake. Will you believe me if I told you that is true? Him. Chiron had immediately rejected this question. 
However, Arietta was having a hard time answering the question, and her face hardened. It was most definitely an absurd story, but Azel had shown her too much marvelous deeds to outright deny his claim. Even if he was the actual Azel Kazakh, his powers of persuasion was a bit. No, if it is true, most of the questions I have becomes resolved. She had seen and experienced many secrets by watching Azel. It was as if he was from a different world. This sense of dissonance could be cleanly resolved by this single answer. She had seen Azel from an earlier date than Chiron, so she was having a hard time rejecting Azel's words. Arietta asked Giles, What do you think, Sir Giles? You want my opinion? Yes, from my knowledge, you were the first one to find Sir Azel. You've seen seen things about him that I haven't. I am curious as to what you think about this matter. Hadn't Giles seen Azel when he first awoke in his corpse-like state? After he thought for a brief moment, Giles shook his head from side to side. I'm sorry, but I don't know. In truth, the story is too incredible for me to say it is true or not. But, but, if it was proven that Sir Azel's story was true, I feel as if I would accept it. At the same time, I would feel silly for not accepting it beforehand. At his words, Arietta smiled as she looked at Giles briefly. I see, I feel the same way. Do you really believe in my words? In truth, it is unbelievable. When Arietta shook her head from side to side, Azel put on a bitter smile as if he had expected this. Arietta spoke. It is such an outlandish story. However, I can't help myself from entertaining the possibility of it being true. I've thought this from the first time I saw you. You are a really amazing man. Thank you. In truth, I am a secret descendant of Azel Kazakh. This is why the knowledge and techniques I have were passed down from my forefathers. That story is a bit more easier to digest. Arietta spoke. Let's leave it at that for now. For now, yes, I think I'm satisfied with that explanation for now. After she spoke, she raised her teacup. Azel shared a conversation with Arietta, Honora and Giles as they caught up on what they've been doing for the past seven months. When he exited the room, Azel was immediately confronted by Saiga. It was as if he had been waiting for Azel. Saiga had on an expression as if he was dubious. You should immediately make time for me, Sir Azel. May I ask what this is about, Prince? Azel queried when he heard the domineering order. Saiga replied, I want you to be my sparring partner. At those words, Azel let out a bitter laugh. This is just a guess, but did the Duke instigate this? My teacher said, you'll know once you fight him. I don't think I can pass this by without confirming it for myself. I see. Then I'll be your opponent. Shall we go to the back mountain where it'll be more discreet? Those words. Sega's eyes narrowed. Are you saying it? Because you are sure I'll be humiliated in front of my subordinates? You are so inexperienced that you can't even gauge how much internal energy your opponent has right now. At that moment, Saiga turned around in surprise as if he had been burned by fire. He was sure Azel was in front of him, but Azel's voice was suddenly heard from his back. How can this be? I didn't even see him move. Azel was looking at him from where the direction where the voice had emanated from. The man that was in front of his was behind Saiga, and he hadn't realized Azel had moved. Azel smiled as he spoke. In truth, I'm disappointed in you. What did you just say? Your previous reaction was understandable, but now you won't accept reality even when you saw it with your own two eyes. Will you not be able to accept reality until your reality shatters from being struck? If that is true, I don't think you will have much luck in facing your future opponents. The enemy has plenty of humans that can dominate you. You will suffer a miserable defeat by underestimating opponents that are better than you. His words were arrogant beyond measure. However, Saiga wasn't able to get mad at his words. No, he was looking at Azel with cold sweat running down his body. He felt an overwhelming and frightening feeling coming from Azel as Saiga looked at him. Was this feeling similar to what one felt when facing a dragon? Azel spoke. You believe there is no way a human can be stronger than a dragon magen. If you aren't able to throw away such arrogance, I will do as you wish. In truth, we don't have to go far. 
I can show it to you right now. Saiga gritted his teeth as he extended his hand towards his back. His sword was too large to equip at his waist, so he had it strapped to his back. Stop. At that moment, Chiron's voice was heard from behind Azel. At the same time, the pressure that was pressing down on Saiga disappeared as if it had been alive. Duke, both of you are overflowing with power. If you fight here, the damage to my property would be massive. Do you really want to destroy my storied castle? Somehow, I feel like destroying it. However, I'll restrain myself. It'll be troublesome for Mr. Havans. What about me? I kind of want to put the Duke in a difficult situation. Er, uh, you hate to lose even a single exchange of words. Chiron shook his head as if he had lost. I didn't realize you were so against fighting Saiga. I don't want to unnecessarily catch the prince's interest. Saiga had been quite blunt with his interest in Azel. This was why Saiga tried to bait Azel into a fight in their last meeting. However, Azel disliked Saiga's actions. Chiron spoke. All right, I apologize for ignoring your wishes. I want you to forgive me. I did it for the sake of my student. Teacher, Saiga jumped up when Chiron showed deference to Azel. From a common sense standpoint, this shouldn't have happened. Even the king shows deference to Chiron, yet he was apologizing to a young human over such a trivial manner. Saiga was taught by Chiron at an early age, so he was just and even-handed in treating others compared to the others in the royal family. Still, the fact that Saiga was of royal blood hadn't changed, and he was very self-aware about ranks. If he applied his common sense to this situation, Saiga couldn't understand what had just gone on. Chiron ignored Saiga as he asked Azel for a favor. Let me formally ask you this. Could you break apart my lacking student's ego? Unfortunately, I wasn't able to. Since you are asking me in such a manner, I can't refuse. Anyways, this was something I always thought had to happen one day. Azel accepted his request. Saiga received favorable assessment as a commander of an organization. He didn't care about the background of his men. He valued competence above all else, and he knew how to take advice from his subordinates. Even if he was outstanding, he knew there was a limit on what he could do by himself. This was why he didn't hesitate to borrow help for him subordinates. On the other hand, there was a part of Saiga that didn't trust them at all. Humans are weak. He believed in the, the competence of his human subordinates. However, no matter how competent they were, he believed there was a hard cap in terms of martial ability for humans. This idea had solidified in his mind as he lived his life. This was where he differed with Arietta in how he viewed the men he found. He searched all over for competent people, but the people he found were always within his preconceived notion. Every man he found just reaffirmed his way of belief. Azel was an anomaly that went against Saiga's way of thinking. Saiga let out a moan as he rolled across the ground. He immediately tried to right his balance as he stood up. Right before he got up the exquisite sword strike came in to disrupt his energy pulse. He was barely able to block the blow with the blade of his enormous sword. He once again rolled across the floor. At that moment, the sword was coming in at an angle right at the location where he would land. This doesn't make any sense. He dropped to the floor in fright. The balance he had almost recovered was broken once again. He had to roll across the ground again. This process kept repeating itself in an endless loop. Azel adjusted his sublime power on the first clash to put Saiga on the ground. It had been three minutes, yet Saiga was unable to get up even once. He continued to roll across the ground. My god, Arietta was at a loss for words when she saw the sight. She already knew Azel was outstanding in terms of the techniques. However, the techniques he was showing right now was beyond her imagination. Giles also stood there looking with rapt admiration. I never knew it was possible to control an opponent to this degree. Chapter 90. Birth of the Dragon Sword. Part 5. In three minutes, Azel used one hundredth of the power used by Saiga. Saiga was using the ability of his superhuman body to try to regain his broken stance. His senses were accelerated to the extreme using dragon demon magic, and he was even using the dragon arts technique that he had drilled at ad nauseum. Azel moved in a relaxed manner compared to him. He was emitting mental waves through spirit order, 
and he was stimulating Sega's senses. He was using it to bring out the response he wanted. It was as if he had the power to foresee the future. Azel took one or two step at a time as he stabbed his sword in an easygoing manner. Just by doing that Saigo wasn't able to get up. In terms of magical energy, techniques dealing with senses, and the gap in insight regarding a battle. In every facet, Azel was on a different stratosphere. Suddenly, a sound of an explosion rang out, and Saiga's body flew into the air. He had no sense of balance as his body spun in the air. Saiga's body struck the ground, and he rolled across the floor. When he got up, Saiga was a total wreck. He wasn't wounded, but he was out of breath. He was dripping with sweat. Saiga's stamina was absolute. He was able to swing a large sword, while wearing heavy armor, for an extended amount of time. However, he had been continuously rolling on the floor. He hadn't been able to tell the difference between up, down, left or right. As he rolled, he had felt his energy pulse being blocked intermittently, and his stamina had been drained at an incredible pace. His stamina had just bottomed out right now. He intentionally let me up. If Azel had wanted to, he could have forced Saiga to roll on the ground until he had fainted. Saiga realized this fact. He knew Azel had intentionally left open an opening, so he could get out of it. In the past, he had suffered all kinds of difficult situation as he was trained by Chiron. However, this experience was uncharted territory for Saiga. Azel approached as Saiga sucked in air. You took a spanking of this magnitude, yet all you can do is try to get your breath back. You are soft as they come. Saiga felt an unprecedented fear as he faced Azel. Saiga had lost his composure, and he unconsciously swung his sword when Azel closed the distance. It was a strike powerful enough to split a boulder in half. However, Azel didn't dodge it. I missed. Saiga's eyes bulged. Azel hadn't dodged, yet he had walked inside his strike to close the distance. Saiga's attack met no resistance as it cut through the air, and his stance broke down again. A combination of the cloning technique, concealment technique and the mental wave, which stimulated the senses, was used to produce this result. Azel had come into Saiga's personal space a beat late as if by magic. Azel was still unhurried as he leisurely took a step forward. Saiga's stance had been broken, so he couldn't do anything. Azel didn't even use his sword. He struck his fist against Saiga's shoulder before he could right himself. This wasn't just a simple blow. Saiga had been forcefully righting himself, and Azel's blow was perfectly timed. It accurately severed the flow of his energy pulse. Saiga was about to fall over once again. He gritted his teeth, and he used his powerful lower body to endure. Then he lashed out with his sword. The counter came even before Saiga could swing his sword halfway. Azel lightly backhanded Saiga's body with the hand holding his sword. The impact penetrated through his midsection, and the pain could be felt in his bones. Saiga was having a hard time breathing, and he felt his body folding. This was the end. When he realized this, Saiga tried to use his dragon arts. As if he had been waiting for this move, Azel focused his mind. In an instant, he planted a counter. This is impossible. Saiga felt as if he was in a nightmare. It felt as if his opponent could see everything that was going on within his body, and every one of his actions were counted. This wasn't something one could do just because one's techniques were good. Azul's extreme senses were able to read everything about Saiga. However, one needed an ungodly reflexive speed that could react to these sensory inputs. This exchange repeated itself several times, and it was hard for Saiga to even grip his sword. However, he refused to fall. Even as he was steadily moving backwards, Saiga gritted his teeth, and he stood on his own two feet. This is my chance. After intentionally baiting a counter, Saiga leaned in to deflect the blow with his shoulder. At the same time, he jumped, and he brought down his sword with everything he had. That wasn't too bad. If you did this about five exchanges earlier, I might have given you a passing score. Azel sounded as if he was enjoying this, and his words chilled Saiga. As Saiga continued to receive frightening blows, he had saved his energy for a chance to attack. However, 
It seemed even this had been within Azel's design. Azel countered Sabia's sword strike head on. As the sound of an explosion rang out, Saiga flew through the air. I lost the hold of my sword. In a fight, he was taught to hold onto the sword no matter what. This mandate was almost like scripture to him. However, for the first time in his life, he had received such an overwhelming blow that even his steel gauntlet exploded. He lost the grip on his sword. Accompanying the loud sound, Saiga rolled several times across the floor before he became sprawled out on the ground. When it quieted down, Azel asked a question. Would you like to continue this? No. It's fine. It is my defeat. Saiga acknowledged his defeat with a tired voice. On that night, Azel was in front of a mirror, and he was letting someone handle his hair. Honora was standing on a step, and she was brushing out Azel's hair. Azel had roughly cut his hair to keep it at a reasonable length, but it seemed Honora wasn't satisfied with his haircut. She volunteered her services. She suddenly asked him a question. Why were you so wicked against the prince? Him. He isn't just any person. He is the prince. Weren't your actions a bit too much? Didn't I do something similar to Bor? Azel thought about the time Bor requested a sparring match as he spoke. Honora thought for a brief moment before she spoke. Now that I think about it, you are right. You have always been reckless, Sir Azel. What? Reckless? In what way? How can you be so shameless? You treated the prince that way. No one would even think about doing what you have done. Do you know how afraid I was as I watched? If the prince became angry, he could have asked for your head. What would you do if he did that? I carried out the deed, because I assessed that the prince wasn't that narrow-minded. Anyways, I wanted to avoid it if possible. From Azul's perspective, he didn't feel the need to be considerate towards Saiga. It wasn't as if they had gone through a life and death situation alongside each other. Saiga was Chiron's student, and brother of Arietta, nothing more, nothing less. This was why Azel didn't want to bring unnecessary attention on himself. He didn't make himself known to Saiga. He was a bit bothered by the fact that the Dragon Demon King worshippers were targeting Saiga, but Saiga had experienced an attempted kidnapping once. Azel assumed Saiga would be careful on his own. On top of it all, Chiron had always been a bit too eager for Azel to fight Saiga, and there was some distaste from that fact too. Saiga had experienced bone-weary hardship, and he had seen everything with his own two eyes. However, he wasn't able to let go of his self-conceit. Why should Azel look kindly on a person like that? Honora spoke. Sir Azel is really. You look as if you aren't afraid of people in high places. In truth, I'm not afraid of them. In the past, he tried to spare himself from the trouble. If he fought with a person with power and rank, it would inevitably cause harm to the people in his surrounding. No, that's not entirely correct either. When he thought about it, no one in the Nadic Empire dared to get on his nerve after the Dragon Demon War. He was someone that had access to Carlos and the Emperor. Moreover, he had many friends in high places, and the people had loved him. Now that I think about it, if someone accused me of leading a reckless life, I have no argument against it. Honora worked as a maid to the royal family. Sir Azel's attitude shocked her. Honora was astonished. Is this because you are the legendary hero? Him. Do you believe my story, Ms. Honora? Maybe. Honora had the eyes of a surprised bunny when Azel started talking about his own identity. He wondered what thoughts were going through her head. Azel laughed when he had this thought. What kind of answer is that? I don't know. If I think about it logically, it doesn't make sense. Do you know what I mean? It isn't something you should try to confirm with me. Him. Is that so? Anyways, if it is true, I would be a little bit disappointed. Why? From the time I was young, I grew up listening to the story of hero Azel Kazark until my ears hurt. There were a lot of heroes in history. However, how many hero had received universal praise from everyone like Azel? Even in this era, Azel Kazark was the most well-known and popular hero. Many children during the Dragon Demon War grew up hearing the tales of Azel's heroism, and many young women dreamed about him showing up in front of them like a knight in shining armor. As time passed, Azel became an idol, and his image became engraved as the epitome of a hero. 
However, Sir Azel is a bit. How should I say this? Honora tilted her head as she thought about what to say. Then she spoke. You are like the brother next door. That's new. Azel laughed. He had never heard himself described as the brother next door. Honora spoke. It is as if the brother next door had a somewhat mysterious and secretive past. Moreover, this person had defeated a dragon by himself. All of this just makes everything surreal. Sometimes it feels like I'm listening to a story dreamed up by a bard. Sometimes reality can outstrip one's imagination. I guess so. If it really is true, it does sound really incredible. At the same time, it feels as if it isn't that big of a deal. What the heck? Azel couldn't help but laugh. Honora suddenly spoke. Let's say it is true. What? Do you mean what if I am the real Azel Kazakh? Yes. That is my supposition. You should just say you don't believe me. What the heck is up with a supposition? Don't be so picky about my answer. If a man shows such a behavior, he won't be popular with the ladies. I'll just shut up and listen to you. Please continue, miss. What do you think the era was like when Hero Azel was alive? People were tormented by the dragon demon race, and there were a lot of righteous people willingly sacrificed their lives for other people. How different was that era? Azel put on a bitter smile at her questions. Unexpectedly, there isn't much of a difference. At the very least, the people are the same. Really? Yup. However, if I hear about the tales describing the old times, it doesn't sound like it. As time passes, they only remember the memorable events. They remember the beautiful blinding moments, and they remember the evil events that one can't look away from. However, those events didn't make up the entirety of that era. At the time, people had to join forces to fight an enormous enemy that threatened their future. However, even in such a dire situation, people continued to fight those within the same organization for profit. There were those that tried to avoid facing death when it was time to cooperate each other. Discrimination occurred regardless of one's position. During that era, everyone was backed up against a wall. When people have nowhere to run, their true character is revealed. One wouldn't know if a person was truly hideous or noble unless they reached this point. It didn't matter if a person normally acted like a crook or if that person acted with integrity. When people were driven into a corner, they sometimes chose the coward's way out. They also chose to act villainous at times. Then there was the people that were noble, and they sacrificed for others. He had seen it all play out too many times. There were highborns, baseborns, young, old, the weak, the strong. It was all the same. It was an era where one's worth could only be proven only by one's actions. Azel had seen countless people. There were those that had been abominable, and there were those that had been pure. Then there were the unsure people that had been too weak. They were like reeds that shook from the hardships of life. Dragon demon worshippers. When he woke up in the era, the most shocking part had been the existence of the dragon demon king worshippers. It wasn't the fact that the remnant of the group he had fought still existed in this age. He was shocked at the fact that the dragon demon king had become deified as time had passed in this world. This wasn't just dragon demons and dragon magians. He couldn't understand why the humans were worshipping him. Why do they worship him in this era? It is an evil that had ended a long time ago. Chapter 91. Birth of the Dragon Sword. Part 6. If it was during the Dragon Macon War, he would have understood the existence of these humans. It was common for humans to betray their own kind for survival as they crawled underneath the Dragon Demon Army. Then there were some that had been true believers of Dragon Demon King. They believed him to be a god. However, why would such humans exist in this era? Azel was having a hard time comprehending this point. Honora spoke. You really speak like someone who had lived through that era. I thought you were going to consider my story as only speculation. I did. Him. Doesn't this mean Sir Azel is over 200 years old? Should I call you Elder from now on? I'll be thankful if you call me that in about 40 years from now. Azel let out a bitter laugh. He was a human, but he was allowed to reside in the plane of darkness as a dragon demon king worshipper. Black swordsman Duran thought about the moment when he developed his great faith. When a human was born, one was either a noble or baseborn. 
It didn't matter if one were talented. It didn't matter what character one had. If one was born from low caste parents, one would never break above their station no matter how talented one was. One would be treated like trash by those born as nobles. In such an unfair societal structure, Joran had been at the bottom. He had been a slave. There were seven kingdoms that ruled over this continent, and only two allowed slavery. Moreover, slaves were viewed basically as gutter scums. From a young age, Joran had a massive build, and he was known for his strength. He was a head taller than anyone else in his age group, and no one could surpass him in work that dealt with strength. When he grew up, he naturally did all the hard work. If violence was needed, he was called to take care of it. When he had shown aptitude for fighting, he was taught martial art. His owner wanted to put him to good use. Still, Joran didn't get a big head over his treatment. Even if he was strong, he knew he was insignificant compared to the knights, who had learned spirit order. At the same time, he hadn't put these knights on a pedestal. Those bastards are scared at the possibility of us getting stronger. He first became aware of it when he started learning martial arts. When he learned the systematized techniques that were monopolized by these men, a new world had opened up to Joran. Joran had a natural aptitude for martial arts. He learned snippets of technique as he was berated by the snobby men. Still, he was developing much faster than those who were receiving proper tutelage. At that moment, Joran had an epiphany. The only advantage they have is the fact that a lot had been passed down to them. It was the same for martial arts and spirit order. A person was able to become a great presence through the knowledge one was able to monopolize. If all the secret techniques were shared equally amongst the masses, will they be able to hold superior positions over the people under them? He made a mistake when he allowed such thoughts to enter his mind. Thank you. What is your name? When he went out on an excursion, he had come across his master's daughter being attacked by monsters. He threw his body in front of her to save her. The knights, who were supposed to be protecting her, were easily beaten. If Joran hadn't fought as he received severe wounds, the lady would have lost her life. However, Joran didn't receive any rewards after the incident. Instead, he was punished. A slave dared to touch a sword. Unforgivable. Joran had used a dead knight's sword to defeat the monsters. Slaves weren't allowed to pick up any weapons. At the very most, the slave owners allowed slaves to be armed with clubs. It was a given that slave would be put down even if one touched a sword by mistake. The knights considered their swords to be symbols of their honor. It was considered to be an unforgivable insult if a lowly slave touched one. It wasn't logical, but this was how the world worked here. Where Joran lived, this was common sense. The nobility didn't look at slaves as humans. The slaves were worth less than the cheapest item they owned. Joran despaired. At the time, he really had no choice. He couldn't win using only his fist. He couldn't overcome this situation using only his body. He could run away by himself, but he would later be executed for surviving the encounter, while a noble lady had died. You evil bastard. I showed favor to such a lowly bastard by teaching you martial arts. You dared to steal and learn swordsmanship. It was unfair. He had never learned swordsmanship. He only remembered snippets of swordsmanship he had seen by chance during his martial arts sessions. Even with such limited knowledge, he was able to defeat the monsters. It was the first time he had held a sword. Joran had saved his daughter's life. Yet the master was acting as if he had committed an evil act against God and man. He continued to berate Joran with a red face. At that moment, Joran had a thought that was unforgivable. They are all retarded bastards. The knights had been inferior to him. He had picked up the sword for the first time in his life. He had done the job for them, yet he was the who had sinned. The one, who came to the rescue of Joran, was the daughter of his master. Please forgive him. At the request of his daughter, her father forgave Joran's transgression. However, it wasn't as if he had gotten off easy. He was stripped naked as his entire body was chained. Then he was shut in an isolated underground room for five days. He wasn't even given water during his punishment. After the incident, the lady became interested in Joran. 
Joran. There is no way that is a name befitting a slave. She had made Joran her servant, and he was always by her side. However, she hadn't been a master with a good personality. She became hysteric at minor incidents, and of course, she took out her anger at the people under her. Joran had become the subject of her tantrums countless of times. One day she was taking out her anger on Joran by whipping him when she did something totally unexpected. Hong, you are probably better compared to that weak bastard. It was after she had broken up with her boyfriend. It was as if she had done it as a retaliation. She brought Joran into her bed. At the time, Joran had been 19 years old. However, this hadn't been his first experience. At the time, Joran was over two meters tall, and he was a massive man with taut muscles. He also had a well-defined and handsome face. He had received countless lustful gazes from the females. After a passionate night session, she always wanted Joran's body. She started showing strong possessiveness, so he had to sever all his relationships with the slave women. If a female slave tried to seduce Joran over any lingering attachment, the female slave would receive severe punishments. However, nothing else had changed aside from the sex. She still whipped him when she vented her anger, and she didn't hesitate to verbally abuse him. However, Joran calmly accepted such a relationship. It wasn't as if he liked it. He just didn't have a choice. The problem was, even though the slave was the victim, he would be treated as the biggest sinner if he did anything against the assailant. How dare you touch my daughter? I forgave you of your past transgression, yet you spat on my generosity. You dared to touch my daughter. She had become pregnant with Joran's child. It was a natural outcome. The two of them had mingled their bodies together whether it was day or night. Wouldn't it be more strange if a baby hadn't formed? When the truth was revealed, the entire household was flipped on its head. In the morning, Joran had been working as an attendant. He didn't know the reason behind it, but he was given a beating before his bloodied body was dragged into the yard. She was there too. She looked at Joran with tear-filled eyes. Joran had expected nothing out of his life, but her words shattered Joran's heart into pieces. H. He threw his body in front of me to save me. I kept him by my side as a favor, yet, when we were out of sight, he forced me to. I was so scared that I wasn't able to tell anyone. Joran wasn't the only one, who was dumbfounded by her words. They had made sure her parents didn't hear about it, but the whole household had known about the illicit affair. It wouldn't be too far-fetched if her family members also suspected what was going on. However, the truth didn't matter to them. A lowly slave had dared to mingle his body with his daughter. Joran deserved to die. They said Joran's sin was too large for them to give Joran a clean death. They beat him until he was a wreck. After throwing salt on his wounds, they chained him up in the basement prison cell. This process would continue every day until he would die. It was on the fourth day. Joran cursed himself for not taking his own life earlier. Now his entire body was restrained with steel chains, and there was a wooden stick put between his teeth. He couldn't kill himself by biting off his own tongue. However, on the fourth day, a miracle had occurred. No one came for him in the morning. Instead, he could hear explosions and screams coming from outside. What was going on out there? He was curious, but all he could do was wait for his inevitable death. A dragon demon appeared in front of him. Those bastards were very vicious. This man committed no sin, yet they treated him like this. Maybe I was too merciful in how I killed them. The dragon demon had exterminated the owner and his family. The one, who had rescued Joran, was named Sibane. He was the son of the great dragon demon king Atain. The reason why Sibane knew about Joran's situation was simple. There had been dragon demon king worshippers inside the household. Joran hadn't known this at the time, but the worship of the dragon demon king was pretty widespread amongst the slaves. The feelings he felt during his lifetime was a fertile soil for accepting this new faith. The world decried the worship of the dragon demon king as evil, yet wasn't the people who made those statements also part of an irrational and evil social structure? Humans are all equal. The determination of a person's status at birth is a tool used by the evil men. The true barometer of one's status shouldn't be determined this way. 
The dragon demon race were born superior to the humans. The true way is for the dragon demons to guide the humans from above them. This is how the world should be structured. Duran had been about to face the end after living an unreasonable life. Duran was willing to believe. He decided to dedicate his life to the faith of the dragon demon king, which had saved his life. Forty years had passed since that day. Duran desperately grew his power, and in a rare move, a human was allowed to reside in the plane of darkness. The dragon demons with the royal blood, and the dragon magian respected him for his martial prowess and position. They kept their manners. He had fought in countless battles, and he had killed countless enemies in each battle. He was living a life soaked in blood, but he had no regrets. He wanted to create the correct world, and he sacrificed everything for the day when his great savior would return. From Duran's perspective, he could have forgive those that rejected the truth. He couldn't forgive those that defended this unreasonable world. The world viewed the dragon demon king worshippers as religious fanatics. They were akin to worshippers of evil. These worshippers had deified the dragon demon king, and they believed he would return from his death. They had an ironclad belief that he'll right the wrongs of the world. However, not everyone in the organizations held such beliefs. These false dragon demon king worshippers hid their true intent as they mingled into the rest of the world. As time passed, these people developed different goals separate from their organization. Of course, the dragon demon king worshippers didn't forgive such beings. The organization systematically revealed those that no longer shared common goals with him, and there would be no forgiveness. Duran had killed countless betrayers amongst their ranks of dragon demon king worshippers. This was why he didn't show any change in expression in front of a man, who might be better off dead right now. The betrayer was in an appalling state. Duran grabbed the man by his neck as he spoke with a rage-filled voice. Uran, where's the wicked traitor, who has the name seeped in sin? Chapter 92, Those Who Seek Their Own Destiny. Part 1, The harsh winter that had frozen the whole world had come to an end. As the new years passed, the snow and ice started to melt. Greens could be seen everywhere. It was the fourth month of the year, and the color of spring was out in full force. Azel finally decided to go on a long journey. Now that I think about it, it's been exactly one year. The thought came over Azel as he looked out the window. He had woken up in the Balan forest one year ago today. He had gone through a lot after he woke. If he had his way, he would have left much earlier. However, he had made relationships here, and he had a lot of things he had to do before he could leave his friends. In the past three months, Azel and Chiron had focused on their training. Azel had taught a lot of things to Chiron. In turn, Chiron passed on the knowledge to Arietta, Saiga and Giles. Three months could be considered to be long or it could be considered to be short depending one's perspective. However, everyone's ability increased drastically in this period of time. The chaos caused by the fall of the Nadic Empire, the great darkness and the machination of the dragon demon king worshippers had caused the loss of concepts and techniques. They had the very rare opportunity to learn these lost concepts and techniques from Azel. I'll be leaving. Azel didn't have much to pack. Usually, people packed heavily for a long trip, but Azel only packed the items he thought were a necessity. Him. Are you really going to leave? When Azel came out with his pack, Giles was waiting for him with a question. Azel replied, Yes, in truth, I've been here too long. I want to thank you for all you have taught me. I don't know how I'll repay this kindness. It is hardly necessary to say such a thing. In the past, techniques were exchanged and shared during the Dragon Demon War. He just did something that would have occurred during that time. He had woken up after a long sleep, and he had developed valuable relationship with these people. However, they weren't his family or his students. I'm sure there will come a time when you'll need power. I want you to choose trustworthy people, and you should build up your ranks. He didn't have to teach them, but he felt that it was a necessary task. This was why he hadn't held back in his teachings. He was sure the remnants of darkness was roiling beneath the surface of the world, and there will come a time when it'll wake up once again. Even a single person, who would fight alongside him, would be a boon for him. Giles nodded his head. 
I will do my best. Azel patted Giles's shoulder once, and he exited the corridor. When he arrived at the front door, Arietta, Saiga and Honora was waiting for him. Arietta spoke. She had on a slightly sullen expression as she spoke. It was an expression that one never saw on her, and it made her look her age. Azel unconsciously smiled at the sight. Is it true that you aren't taking the horse I gifted you? Yes, I appreciate the thought, but a horse is too slow. Azel grinned as he spoke. This was the reason why he didn't have much luggage. Azel didn't plan on traveling like a normal traveler. He planned on running to his destination in the shortest amount of time. Arietta burst out laughing as if he had said something absurd. You said a horse is slow. If people don't already know you, people will think you are crazy. Fortunately, you know me. Yes, it is unfortunate, but you are right. If I knew this would have happened, I would have prepared something else. It is the thought that counts. Azel grinned. Arietta spoke that way, but it wasn't as if he hadn't received anything from her. He was given travel money, and the amount was much more than he needed. Azel suddenly felt a gaze on him, so he looked to the side. Saiga was also looking at him with a sullen expression. Unlike the others, the relationship between Azel and Saiga never improved. When he arrived at the Dukedom of Tarantan, Saiga had suffered a thorough defeat at the hands of Azel. Afterwards, Saiga acknowledged Azel's superiority, but he never displayed a friendly attitude. This was why Azel had made no efforts in trying to become friendly with Saiga. He had no reason to make such overture. Still, he had learned a lot from Azel, so there was respect in Saiga's attitude. Saiga spoke as he brought up his hand. I'll pray for your success in future battles. I'll work hard, so I can vindicate myself next time we meet. I'll look forward to it. Azel still smiled as he shook Saiga's hand. Honora stayed still until that moment. She was of lesser station, and she couldn't open her mouth until she was prompted by a person of higher rank. Azel was aware of this fact, so he initiated the conversation. When I see you next, Muzanora would have grown into a slender lady. Since Muzanora is great at your work, you'll probably be a veteran maid for the royal family. I bet you'll have a lot of people working for you by that time. Are you planning on not coming back for that long? Honora asked with round eyes. The new year had come, but her birthday was in the summer. She was only a 14-year-old girl. She was in the midst of her puberty, so she had grown a lot from the time he had met her. However, she was still a young girl, who still hadn't lost her baby fat. If he planned on seeing her when she was a slender lady, how many years was he talking about? Azel laughed. Well, it'll be great if I get to see you before that happens. Anyways, I owe a lot to Muzanora. At least, you are aware of it. After giving his farewell to Honora, he also gave a farewell to Havans and the staffs of the estate. Finally, he searched for Chiron. Havans let out a bitter laugh as he told Azel to head outside. You were too slow. By the time you finish your farewell, the day might come to an end. Chiron had come out early, and he had been waiting for Azel. The problem was the clothes he was wearing. Azel queried, Are you going somewhere today, Duke? Chiron wore his armor, and he had equipped his two dragon swords. He was fully armed. Moreover, he had on a magic tool that hid his horns, pointed ears, and the dragon stone. He was disguised as a human knight. On top of it all, he had a travel pack strapped to his back. No matter how one looked at it, it looked as if Chiron was planning on leaving for a trip. Chiron spoke. I'm guessing you are going to the former county of Kazark. I believe you are going to a region taken over by monsters. Duke, I have talented people under me, so my territory will be managed well even if I'm not here. Don't worry about it, you know how talented Havans is. Even if I'm gone for an extended amount of time, it won't be a problem. No. Wait a moment. Azel furrowed his brows. He had never considered this scenario. Chiron was one of the great nobles of this country. He was a shield that protected the people from the dragon demon king worshippers, and he was a member of the guardian shadows. Azel never expected someone of his personage to just follow him. However, no one seemed surprised by his intentions. It seemed Chiron had told him about his decision beforehand. 
Azel sighed as he asked the question. Are you serious about this? Of course, I'm serious. I hid it, because I wanted to see your expression. I have a legitimate reason, so don't look at me as if I'm some thoughtless child. You accurately figured out what I was feeling, and I want to thank you for packaging your words in such a manner. Chiron ignored Azel's words as he explained the reasons behind this move. As a member of the Guardian Shadows, I've fought against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. I have a gut feeling that I have to go with you. I feel as if your existence and what I experienced recently portends the beginning of something big. It is not my style to be in the dark. I don't want to react and cope with the situation blindly. If I stay with you, I have a feeling that I'll be able to get to the heart of this problem. Chiron didn't lie. He told the truth. Chiron had fought the Dragon Demon King worshippers for over several dozen years, yet he had never been able to get to the core of the problem. On top of it all, he didn't even know the real identity of his own organization. However, events started to change rapidly when Azel came into the scene. The real identities of his enemies were slowly peeled away, and he was able to find out about the Guardian Shadow's secret. So how could he not follow after Azel? He wasn't patient enough to step away from a fight, and wait for the result to come out. He always ran to the heart of a fight, and he dictated the result with his own hands. This was why he was the living legend of the Rulan Kingdom. This was why he was called the Dragon Sword Duke. After listening to Chiron's determined words, Azel looked at him for a brief moment. In the end, he had to laugh. If you are resolute on this, I won't say no to you. I just feel a bit sorry for Mr. Havans. The Duke has done this many times before. Please look out for the Duke. Havans spoke with a voice mixed with a sigh. This was how the two men left the dukedom. They would have to cross two borders, but in Azel's mind, the distance didn't seem too far away. Chiron and Azel crossed mountains and plains as they ran like the wind. The forest had been calm and still only an hour ago, and the darkness of the night ruled over the land. However, an explosion accompanied by fire shattered the darkness, and the fire started to spread. Duran put on the appearance of the Black Knight as he conducted a slaughter within the forest. As the flames burned the forest, Duran cut down a boy that hadn't even reached puberty. He had killed the boy with a single strike, and he immediately headed towards his next target. At that moment, a blue thunder struck Duran, and it stalled his advance. Him. If he was a normal human being, he would have died on the spot. However, Duran used the insulation technique to ground the electricity. He glared at his enemy. The enemy was a young girl. A freckled young girl was shaking in fright. Can't you tell your resistance is useless? It'll be easier for you if you accept this. The girl flinched at his words, which had come out like a sigh. She raised her magical energy. She was young, but she was a magician with enormous magical power. However, she looked inexperienced and lacking in front of Duran. Before her concentrated magical energy could do anything, his sword cut her throat open. She fell as blood sprayed out of her. Her eyes were wide open. You evil bastard. A bloodied young man cried out in despair, and he approached Duran from the side. He wasn't a magician. He was a spirit order practitioner like Duran. You threw away your faith, and you killed your master. How dare an immoral person like you say such a thing to me? Duran spoke as he easily parried the other's sword strike. Fire burned within the young man's eyes. You are a crazy devil. You aren't qualified to talk about immorality and duty. You are wrong. You guys are the ones that are crazy. You had the chance to follow the true faith, yet you voluntarily turned away from it. The young man used to be a prospect that the Dragon Demon King worshippers had groomed for his combat potential. He had been indoctrinated with the true faith from a young age, yet he had killed his teacher. He had tried to escape with the others. However, this young man wasn't the true mastermind behind the escape attempt. The young man was lured away by sweet talk, and he had committed a deadly sin. He was a pitiable soul. Duran knew this. So he asked a question. Urin chose to take up the name seeped in sin. What did this evil traitor do to you all? What words caused you to commit such foolish actions? 
Uran was recently causing a lot of problem within the ranks of the Dragon Demon King worshippers. He had killed all his comrades affiliated with the organization he was affiliated with. And now he was on the run. Moreover, he was going around destroying the bases connected to his organization. The problem was the fact that there was no strict structure to how the Dragon Demon King worshippers were organized. This was why even the ruling class in the Plane of Darkness wasn't able to keep up with all the activities of the various organizations. However, Uran was able to find out the overlapping points in these organizations, and he continued to attack the Dragon Demon King worshippers. From the perspective of the Dragon Demon King worshippers, Uren's action was so astounding that words didn't even come out of their mouths. Until a year ago, Uren had been a prospect placed in a secret training facility for magicians. Basically, he hadn't even been officially recognized as a magician. Moreover, he was only a 20 years old human. Unlike the Dragon Magian, he hadn't been born with naturally high reservoir of magic. Moreover, he was only an apprentice, so he hadn't received any valuable knowledge. The valuable techniques were only given when one did something of merit. Despite all of that, Uran had already killed Dragon Demon King worshippers in the hundreds. There were many Dragon Magian included in this number. I don't understand that bastard. Duran still haven't seen Uran in person. It was only in recent days that the upper management had inserted high-quality individuals like Duran. As Duran followed the traces left behind Uran, Duran was getting further away from understanding this young man. In the first place, why did Uran betray the Dragon Demon King worshippers? Moreover, how was he able to improve his skills so much? However, as time passed, Duran didn't worry about such thoughts. We now know the truth. We know how crazy and evil you guys are. The real problem was the existence like the young man pointing his sword towards Duran. The human dragon demon king worshippers were divided into two categories. There were the humans nurtured within the organizations. Then there were the humans akin to Duran. The truth was told to an outsider, and this human outsider became a convert. The children nurtured from within were mostly orphans. They were indoctrinated with the beliefs of the Dragon Demon King worshippers from the time they were able to talk. The children were indoctrinated in a completely controlled environment, so they shouldn't have any selfish desires. However, something had happened to Uran, and it made him have a change in heart. Even if was a magic that affected the mind, it would take a very long time and massive effort to change an inflexible mind. So how is this possible? Die. Duran held the question in his heart as he looked at the young man, who swung his sword. The young man didn't care about his own safety. His strike had the intent of taking both of them out. However, you are foolish until end. Before the young man could swing his sword, Duran's sword sliced through the young man's neck. After the teen fell, Duran approached a young dragon magian. The dragon magian youth was wearing the same armor as Duran. He spoke. Uran is on the run with the cold-blooded queen. Duran was an exception. He was a human given that was given a high rank. Naturally, he had command over both humans and dragon magians. Everyone knew about Duran's skill and accomplishments, so no one objected to his command. They respected him. Did they get to safety as they threw these powerless children into the maw of a dragon? I don't think that is entirely true. At his words, the young dragon magian let out a bitter laugh. Duran looked at him with a puzzled expression. Him. Chapter 93. Those who seek their own destiny. Part 2. Uran didn't know the exact moment when he became a dragon demon king worshipper. His earliest memory he could remember was the cold corpse of his mother. He didn't know the exact cause, but his mother had been sick and poor. She froze to death in a back alley of a city. Uran was probably fated to die like his mother. However, someone had taken Uran, who was unable to speak yet. He was sent to a training school for talented humans. He learned how to speak in this place. He grew up being indoctrinated with the knowledge and mindset of the dragon demon king worshippers. At an early age, the trainers categorized the children depending on their aptitude. In this process, Uran was put on the path to becoming a magician. When he was young, he never questioned the environment he was in. He completely believed everything the adults told him. 
It was truth. He was steadily becoming a fanatic. His first kill came at nine years old. The dragon demon king worshippers wanted to take root in a particular city. He had to kill an old couple, who refused to give up control over a neighborhood. When he thought back on it, the couple was blameless, and they had been kind to children. He had used their kindness against them. On a cold day, Euron had disguised himself as an orphan. The couple allowed him into their home, and they had provided him warm soup. He had used this opportunity to put a strong magical poison in the couple's meal. He had killed them. Afterwards, he didn't feel any emotions. Euron had received the teachings of the great dragon demon king, and anyone that didn't follow it wasn't considered to be human. They were dirty trashes that propped up this false world. However, a change occurred when he was 14 years old. One day an unknown voice started to whisper to him in his dreams. I will tell you the name of your bloodline. Euron Rizester. Him. Euron opened his eyes. The green eyes that shone beneath the disheveled brown hair surveyed his surrounding. His field of vision was shaking. It was disorienting. It seemed he was being moved and he was slung over someone's shoulder. I'm being carried on a woman's shoulder. How refreshing. If you have the energy to spout such bullshit, it seems you are fine. A sharp voice answered him. Someone had slung urine over her shoulder. It was a woman that was smaller than urine. Her black hair was cut into an even bob, and she was wearing a leather armor painted black. She was a cold beauty with yellowish-red eyes. She was a dragon magian. There was a sculpture-like horn above her right ear, and it was give out a red light. A dragon stone of the same color was embedded on the back of her hand. Euron spoke with a tired voice. Leticia, I'm glad you are happy, but this might be the last bullshit statement I'll be able to utter in this life. I don't know if I'm starting to think that might be preferable to this. You should stop speaking. You did something idiotic, yet you aren't dead. You know you are lucky to be alive even after losing so much blood. Just shut up. The child. He's dead. Yuren's face crumpled at Leticia's words. He was seriously injured. He had been running away with the children. His feet were shackled since he had to protect the children. He had thrown his body in the way of a sword thrust as he had tried to save a child. He fainted after receiving a deep sword wound. I should have. If we left him alone, then. Don't say those words again. Shut up. Even a smart person couldn't have predicted the outcome. We did this, despite knowing we might regret it later. However, those children were heading down the road to fanaticism, and their dignity as human were being stripped away. We can't just do nothing about it. The current situation had occurred, because Euron had aimed to go after the most evil training facility run by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Basically, it wasn't a simple training facility that nurtured regular fighters. It was a place where children with special constitution were gathered, and evil experimentation was conducted on them. This was a place where they, reared, the test subjects, so Euron couldn't just pass it by. While he was doing his advance work, he became acquainted with Leticia. They decided to do a joint operation. After they conducted their advance work for a month, they had destroyed the institution and the children were able to escape. However, something unexpected had happened. Pursuers showed up behind Euron as if they had been waiting for him. It took Euron much effort to speak. Let me down. You aren't in a condition to walk. I know. However, you are. Euron had picked up on the fact that Leticia was also injured. Euron and Leticia had fought and killed over 100 dragon demon king worshippers to be able to get here. It would be more strange if they weren't tired and wounded. I'm not in such a bad shape that I won't be able to carry a human cub. No, I don't think you can face this enemy with me on your shoulder. Nope. Enemy. Leticia was startled by his words. She had enough key to make the dragon demon king worshippers shake in their boots. However, she hadn't sensed any enemies approaching them. What did Euron sense? At the same time, Leticia felt someone looking down at her. She had learned the gaze detection technique. Was the person's gaze hidden? No. No one had been watching me until a moment ago. The enemies had just appeared, so it meant that they had been lying in ambush at this location. The enemies hadn't been looking at the two of them. However, 
When the two entered their sensory field, they had turned their gazes towards the two. When Leticia realized this fact, lightning struck. It wasn't just one or two thunderbolts. The forest was bright from the fire, yet the light from the thunderbolts was able to burn their retinas. Dozens of lightning fell. It had the destructive power to take out a unit with scores of men. After a moment, two people walked out from the dispersing thunder. Kook, this is. Did a high-ranking officer come after us? That's right, sinners. I commend you for getting out of our trap. A person stepped out from between the trees. A woman of the dragon demon race was encircled in darkness as she emitted enormous power. The heat was causing the air to flow, and it fluttered the black hair of the woman. Niberus, a direct descendant of the dragon demon king. Him, the dragon demon woman was Niberus. It seemed the beings in the plains of darkness had accepted urine as a serious problem. They had sent a high-ranking member. Niberus' expression hardened. How were you able to recognize me? You should only be a minor apprentice. Even amongst the dragon demon king worshippers, Niberus wasn't known to many people. One didn't know about her unless one lived in the plains of darkness. When she traveled outside, she had put considerable amount of energy in covering up her identity. On her last mission, she had traveled to the Rulan Kingdom to kidnap the dragon demon Princess Arietta with Regina. Even then she took the precaution of paralyzing the minds of the rank and file members, so they wouldn't be able to see her appearance. However, Euron had gotten her identity right as soon as he saw her. A minor member of an organization shouldn't know about her. Euron laughed. Ha ha ha. Who knows? What do you think? You are almost dead, yet you have the talent to get on my nerves. The darkness surrounding Niberus moved in a furious manner. It was a darkness that caused anyone that got close to it to be cursed. It was hard for anyone to breathe in this darkness. Once one was in the darkness, one died from all kinds of poisons and diseases. What nonsense! It was a cursed darkness that would make a human magician freeze from the sight of it. However, Leticia spoke in a cold voice. She swung her long spear with urine still on her shoulder. When she did, a gale with deep blue chill rose up to push the darkness away. As the temperature dropped rapidly, ice started to form in the surrounding. Niberus glared at Leticia, as expected of the cold-blooded queen, you have a trick or two that justifies your pretentious nickname. You guys are the ones that came up with that lousy nickname. Amongst the dragon demon king worshippers, Leticia was known as the cold-blooded queen. She had started her activities eight years ago, and she had killed countless dragon demon king worshippers including a good number of dragon demon officers. Niberus spoke. I see. Then you should consider it an honor and die. Numerous magical spells were initiated from within the darkness surrounding her. When it looked as if thunderbolts would end, a sharp wind flew in. When the winds fell away, fire came down like rain. Didn't I tell you this is nonsensical? Did you already forget my words? Leticia overcame all the magical spells. She still had urine slung over one shoulder, yet she was moving in a surprising manner. Leticia counterattacked as she moved to regions that weren't influenced by the magical spells. As the explosion rang out, Niberus' barrier shook. Niberus was taken aback. She was able to do that at this distance. Niberus had put a good amount of distance between her enemies. However, her barrier had cracked as if someone had struck at point-blank range at full force. Moreover, another blow accurately struck the crack before Niberus could do anything about it. Ooh orc. Niberus had barely avoided the blow. It was terrifying. She had put a lot of effort into making her multi-layered barrier, yet a dozen consecutive attack was intricately focused on a single point. Her barrier had been pierced by the attacks. At the same time, Niberus realized she had made a mistake. It is a magical spell. The attack from before wasn't from Leticia. It was a magical spell from Euron, who looked as if he was close to death. When she realized this fact, Niberus was taken aback. This makes no sense. A human did that. The attack that was sent a moment ago astounded Niberus. Was it really a magical spell used by a human? This can't be. Niberus was still in doubt as she sent her magical spell. At the same time, an explosion rang out, and the barrier, 
which she had remade, shook again. As if her opponent had been waiting for her to send her magic, Yuren had sent a perfect counter-attack. The construct of her magical spell was nullified before it could take shape. Moreover, a magic arrow came at her from an absolute blind spot. It threaded the needle before it impacted on Nibirus. A human cub has this level of skill. At that point, Nibirus shivered instead of getting angry. This human's applied magic was at a level that was akin to the archmages that taught magic in the plane of darkness. Nibirus asked a question. Oh traitor Euron, is it as I had suspected? Is the guardian shadows behind your activities? Maybe, if I really had something like that backing me up, it would have been much easier for me. Euron's laugh didn't have much strength behind it. Until he developed a working relationship with Leticia, he had strictly moved on his own. However, from the perspective of the Dragon Demon King worshippers, they didn't believe he worked alone. First, he was too talented of a magician. Even Nibirus was surprised by his skills. Even if one was a genius in magic, one's development was dependent on the knowledge one could learn. If Yuren's foundation was solid, he could rapidly develop by learning high-rank magic, but who taught it to him? If he was self-taught, he would have to fill in the gap in his knowledge through research and hard work. Of course, the progress was incredibly less efficient than learning the already well-established knowledge. Euron suddenly spoke. Leticia, someone else, is coming here. Understood. Leticia understood the meaning behind Euron's words. Their surrounding was already crawling with dragon demon king worshippers that had chased after them. However, the, someone, mentioned by Euron had enough battle capability to be a threat to the two of them. I'm going over tax myself a little bit. I'm guessing you are well enough to assist me. Who, after speaking those words, Leticia planted her spear into the ground. Thin ice coated the surface of the spear, and it let out a maelstrom of cold energy. An incredible amount of magic was being gathered. The more surprising part was the source of the magical energy. Leticia was emitting dragon demon magic, and another source of magical butted in to cause a multiplicative effect. It was Yuren's magic. A magical pattern that perfectly complemented Leticia's dragon demon magic was formed, and it was amplifying her power to the extreme. There were cases where a magician used support magic to amplify a warrior's magical energy, but the effect of this amplification transcended common sense. Leticia grinned as she pulled out her spear, and she brought it down once again. Awesome. Even if my body was in a normal state, I would have hard time generating this much power. Afterwards, a wave of cold air erupted as it was shot forward. A white energy was shot forward, and a several dozen meters of the surrounding region was frozen in the shape of a fan. Oh my, Nibirus had been barely able to react to it, and she was astonished. Surprisingly, her sight line was obstructed. Her barrier reacted to antagonist forces, and a thick layer of ice had formed around her barrier. It blocked her field of vision. Moreover, a more stronger cold energy impacted on top of the first attack. However, this attack had a frightening force behind the attack. Nibiris' barrier shook violently as the temperature fell rapidly. After the last wave of cold energy impacted Nibiris, an ice pillar had formed where she stood. No wonder she is called the Cold-Blooded Queen. It took her a good amount of time for her to get out the ice pillar encasing her. When she exited it, she mumbled as she looked at her surrounding. Everything was frozen. It was as if she was in a field of ice. A portion of the burning forest was frozen white, and one could see large ice pillars had formed intermittently. Miss. A person jumped over an ice pillar. He was an enormous man wearing black armor. It was Duran. He queried her. Are you hurt anywhere? I'm not hurt. However, it seems I got punched. They aren't to be underestimated. We can't hold anything back when we meet them again. Nibirus hadn't underestimated Leticia in the first place. Nibirus had spoke disparagingly towards her. But Leticia was acknowledged to be a strong foe by the plane of darkness. She had accepted this fact as she started the fight. However, she hadn't expected the unpredictable variable called Euron. He was at death's door, yet he was able to display such magic. Nibirus asked a question. What about the others? They aren't here yet. Duran was quick on the uptake. 
so he realized the intent behind her question. She wasn't the only one dispatched to catch the traitor Euron. It meant she didn't hold autonomy over this mission. Her competitors from various factions were all aiming for Euron. They were fighting for the meritorious deed of killing Euron. This happened, because those in the Plane of Darkness couldn't track down Euron's trail. Euron was elusive. He had lead pursuers on a wild goose chase numerous times before he disappeared. This was why the Plane of Darkness had dispatched high-ranking members to each region. Moreover, if one was able to kill Euron, it would be seen as a large meritorious deed. Niberus was at this place, because Joran had been dogged at tracking down Euron. She had received information about Euron first. However, she was only slightly ahead of the others. The fact that she was tracking down Euron would be notified to the people above her. Soon her competitors would gather here. Niberus spoke. I won't allow Laura and Kieran a chance to butt into this affair. Yes, Joran lowered his head. Chapter 94. Those who seek their own destiny. Part 3. Azel and Chiron was almost at their destination. It had only been two weeks since they left the dukedom of Tarantos. It took them four days to move past the border of the Rulan Kingdom into the Daylan Kingdom. It took them the next four days to traverse through the Daylan Kingdom, and they had entered into the Bears Kingdom. In the past, it used to be called the County of Kazakh. If someone said they crossed two kingdoms in a week, one would think it was a bad joke. However, the two of them cut straight across the map. They traveled a distance of 300 kilometers in a straight line. When they entered the The Bears Kingdom, their speed slowed a little bit. They knew where the county of Kazakh was located at, but they needed to do some investigation before they went there. This was why they listened to stories from old men, and they searched out nobles, who collected books. They searched for historical records. Since they had crossed the borders without permission, they weren't truthful with their own identities. However, they had the seals proclaiming him of being knights, so they just needed to come up with a decent lie. The lie and seals was enough to be treated like guests for a night at a noble's house. Chiron took charge in telling Azel what to do. In the past, Chiron had traveled around the continent with his identity hidden. He was used to traveling as a noble with a hidden identity. Chiron spoke. We'll be there by afternoon. After gathering information, the two of them visited a town nearby the county of Kazakh. Since the town was near the cursed lands, it wasn't prosperous. However, it was a place where they could eat and rest. Yes, as they got closer to the county of Kazakh, Azel spoke less and less. Chiron wasn't used to this version of Azel, but he left Azel alone. Chiron didn't want to be a nuisance. The county of Kazakh had been the place that had allowed Azel to settle in peace. After the Dragon Demon Wars, he needed to rest his weary body and he had started a new life. Of course, it had been a short and fragile dream. In only two years after the war, the dragon demon king's curse had taken hold, and he had to leave his land. He was put to sleep. Azel still wanted to see his land. He understood that he had been asleep for 220 years, but he had wanted to see if anything remained from his memories. He had wanted to see how his descendants fared in the land they inherited. However, this simple hope had already been broken into pieces. There was nothing he could gain by going there, yet. He had to see it with his own eyes. Azel wordlessly stared at the location that was considered to be the county of Kazakh. The stories he had heard up until now ran through his head. The Great Darkness. If one talked about the current era, this event never failed to come up. The county of Kazakh had fallen to ruins at the end of the Great Darkness. Many lives were taken from the spread of an infectious disease, but the situation had been stabilizing thanks to Sage Bayon. This was when the crazed dragons attacked the county of Kazakh. According to the records, 13 crazed dragons went on a rampage, and they attacked everything within the county of Kazakh. Afterwards, a massive horde of monsters gathered in the land. It was as if they had been hypnotized. After the fame of hero Azel Kazakh, the county of Kazakh was famous for their strong troops. Their knights were of high quality, and they possessed a lot of talented magicians. Of course, the soldiers were also trained well. However, they couldn't do anything in front of this situation. In a flash, 
the county of Kazakh was laid to waste, and the monsters started to spread outwards. Fortunately, the dragons didn't join in when the monsters advanced. After a desperate fight put up by the county of Kazakh, the number of berserker dragons had been cut down in half, and the rest of the dragons refused to come out of the county of Kazakh. The bear's kingdom had been weakened by the great darkness, and they suffered further damages from the monsters. From the stories told by the old timers, Azel learned that the kingdom had been at the brink of destruction. However, in the end, they were able to endure the threat, and the county of Kazakh was designated as a cursed land. The Bayer's kingdom built a fortress at the border. It was akin to the Rulin kingdom's southern border fortress. This was obvious, but the county of Kazakh was a forbidden region, and people were barred from entering the place. The border guards kept up a regular patrol along the border. However, Azel and Chiron didn't have a hard time avoiding detection. They were able to sneak past the borders between kingdoms, so this was child's play. Chiron mumbled to himself. It hasn't changed much since my last visit. The fortress is still the same. Have you been here before? I think it was around 30 years ago. It was after we destroyed the Grand Alliance of Darkness led by Dakin. Him. It is an answer that really drives home the fact that there is a great disparity in age between us. Now that he thought about it, Chiron was an eyewitness to what had happened in the Great Darkness. At the time, Chiron still would have been the Duke of Taranto's, so he probably knew how the Great Darkness shook the foundation of society. Azel asked the question as they walked within the county of Kazakh. He wasn't really interested in the answer. He asked the question, because he wanted to be distracted from his turbulent heart. What was the Great Darkness like? At the time, everything was a mess. A contagious disease had swept through the continent, and it had been too ghastly. Until Sage Bayon came up with a solution, no one knew how to deal with the disease. If one caught the disease, one was quarantined, and the only thing left was to wait and die. That was the only choice available to the sick. No one was immune from it. The dragon demons, dragon magians, famous knights and magicians were all powerless in front of the virulent disease. If one caught the disease, one could only look forward to death. Of course, the dragon demons, dragon magians and the strong knights had great resistance against the disease, but even that had its limit. In the end, their stamina was chipped away slowly, and they fell sick. It was the end for them too. In fact, their presence actually accelerated the spread of this infectious disease. Since they had more resistance against this sickness, it took them longer to realize that they were sick compared to normal people. These beings met with other unsuspecting people, and it acted as a catalyst to spur the rate of infection. Chiron continued to speak. From what I remember, the temples used to be quite prideful. If I told my old self about how humble the priests are right now, there is no way my old self would believe it. Before the great darkness, the temples held absolute power. They used the holy knowledge and techniques passed down by the gods to treat diseases and wounds. This made the priests act high and mighty. However, during the great darkness, they had been powerless. They had been prideful as they claimed that they'll be able to cure the disease in a short period of time. The priests, who had stepped forward, died from the disease instead. It was unknown how many priests died during that time, but it was numerous. Then there were the priests that said the great darkness was a divine punishment sent to strike down the people wallowing in their arrogance. A good number of priests spouted such nonsense. Somehow I get an impression that the people who spoke such nonsense in front of you didn't go away unscathed. I'll leave what happened up to your imagination. Chiron grinned as he had a far away look. It really was a terrible time. When I look back on it, it is hard to believe that it came to an end. The people laughing and talking the day before was struck down by the disease. The neighbors, who one had been good friends, were treated like monsters. People shunned the infected people. Chiron had believed in the humanity that was within people, yet any illusion of humanity was destroyed under the untreatable disease. It brought out the ugliness in people. Azel spoke. It sounds like what happens in a war. During the Dragon Demon War, the true character of humans had been tested. Everyone had acted as if all humans possessed humanity and benevolence. 
When in trouble, how many people really upheld these ideas? Chiron let out a bitter laugh. In my opinion, the great darkness was much worse than the wars. Unlike a war, there was no opponents one could fight. The values everyone had believed in crumbled away, and the world was sunk into darkness. Everyone fought desperately to live. However, people didn't know what to fight. They didn't know how to fight this disease. No, it hadn't been a fight to live. It was a struggle one fought to delay one's inevitable demise. In that era, there had been only one man, who had identified and fought against the, enemy. Bayon knew what to do. He knew that he had to fight against the disease itself. Have you met him before? I've met him. I actually worked with him frequently when he was setting up the medical association. He had tried to gain support and help from the influential nobles. He needed a lot of political and monetary support to do what he wanted. I see. Is he still alive? No. He is probably dead. Him. You aren't sure. After the medical association was established and running well, he started appearing less and less in public. Maybe, he hated being bothered with political matters. Bayon had been middle-aged during the Great Darkness. If he was still alive, he would be well over 100 years old. I see. The two of them were maintaining speed of a normal person running at full tilt, while they held their conversation. The scene around them quickly changed, and they finally came to a place that held evidence of human occupation. At a certain point in time, the ruin used to be a town. Everything was completely destroyed, and one couldn't find anything intact. The buildings had been burned a long time ago. Trees and grass now grew where the buildings had stood before. Azel suddenly mumbled to himself. I think this place was called. Diggle. Him. What are you talking about? It is the name of this town. Azel was swept up in an unspeakable emotion. As a lord, he had taken care of his county for only a brief amount of time. However, he had gone all over his lands as he settled in as the lord of this land. He knew every inch of this land. The sight he remembered superimposed itself on top of the ruins. Azel traveled far into his memory. There were the people, who had cheered when they saw him. Then there were the innocent children, who had run around. Diggle was located at the edge of his domain, and the town had acted as a gateway to his lands. It had been fairly large, and after the Dragon Demon Wars, the population had grown drastically. It had been a thriving town. You, Chiron was about to say something to Azel, who was standing there vacantly. However, he gave up on it. Azel's expression had crumpled in such a frightening manner that Chiron couldn't say anything. Azel was the one, who broke the silence first. I needed targets to take out my anger on, and they're here just in time. Before one knew it, monsters started appearing from the surrounding. These were orcs, who commanded ox-sized blood wolves. This was to be expected. This land was designated as a cursed land. It was so full of monsters that the Bear's Kingdom gave up on recovering this stretch of land. While Azel and Chiron was coming here, they had avoided the detection of the monsters. These humans are fearless. A rough and awkward speech was heard. One of the orcs separated from the group, and it spoke as it walked towards the two humans. How fortunate. When Azel's gaze landed on him, the orc, who had been talking, flinched. I'll ask this just in case. Did you come here with the wholesome intention of speaking with us? An indescribable anger was burning beneath his blue eyes. The orcs were known for their grit and ferocity, yet the orc froze for a brief moment when it saw the man's eyes. The orc raised its sword as it yelled out, Attack! An unimaginable massacre, which had never been seen before, since the orcs had settled here, was carried out. Chapter 95 Those Who Seek Their Own Destiny Part 4 the encounter repeated itself several times. The county of Kazark was a pretty big stretch of land. Of course, there had been several towns and cities within the county of Kazark. Azel walked through the towns that had been turned into ruins. He walked past the ruins of cities where everything was destroyed. Even the castle walls were demolished. He looked for sceneries that was left within his memories. He had always wished the beauty of these locations to last forever yet they were all destroyed. They were in a state he had never wanted to seem them in. As he passed by each location, 
rage started to disappear from Azel's face. There was no expression on his face now. He had prepared himself for such possibilities. While he was coming here, he imagined the worst-case scenario, and he prepared his heart for what he'll see. However, the shock he felt when seeing it with his own two eyes was beyond what he had imagined. In the past, I'm sure, Azel smelled something familiar right now. He smelled the blood that had poured out from monsters he had cut open. I've experienced something similar to this. I've experienced it numerous time. Still, it is quite hard to stomach. There were countless corpses of monsters littered around him. Azel hadn't bothered to hide his presence, while he was coming here. If he was able to make rational decisions, he would have avoided going to the towns or cities. The ruins were ideal nesting ground for monsters. It was almost certain that the monsters had taken possession of all the locations where humans had resided in the past. However, Azel didn't avoid them. He walked through ruins as if he wanted them to see him. He attracted the monsters to him, and he had fought them. It was a very foolish thing to do. However, Azel was wrapped up in his desire for revenge, and Chiron was swept up in the mess. However, Chiron wasn't angry. Cold sweat was running down his body. It is unbelievable. He is so overwhelming. Chiron had thought he was well aware of how much key was stored within Azel. However, he realized he had been fooling himself. It didn't matter if it was a violent one, careful one, small one, or a big one. In fact, it didn't matter if they came in a group. It didn't matter if the monsters attacked or ran away. If the monsters were close enough to be seen, they were all considered to be hostiles. Azel started his slaughter. As he continued to fight, the commotion got larger. The monsters that had been spread out gathered to the center of the commotion. It had been about a day and a half since they had entered the county of Kazakh. Azel and Chiron had already faced several hundred monsters in the ruins of the small cities. The heavy sound rang out as the ground shook. From beyond the half-broken building, a house-sized ogre appeared. Ah, it had a habit of trying to intimidate its enemies, so it started letting out a roar. However, it was killed in the blink of an eye. Azel was already in front of it, and Azel's foot had impacted on the ogre's chest. The impact was delivered inwards. The ogre's heart exploded, and Azel's sword cut through its thick neck. It was as if he was cutting through pudding. A spray of blood erupted into the air. In the midst of the blood, Azel disappeared as if he was an illusion, and he attacked the group of monsters that had followed behind the ogre. The monsters didn't even have the time to assess what had happened. Something flashed in front of their eyes, and they fell over with a critical wound. The group of twenty monsters took only a brief moment to slaughter. It all occurred before the ogre's corpse could fall to the floor. There wasn't a single speck of blood on Azel's body. Azel had moved much faster than the spray of blood. While the blood were falling down, Azel leisurely moved towards a different location. Chiron's blood curdled as he watched Azel with interest. Did his rational mind erode away from the rage? It seemed likely, since Azel was fighting the monsters by attracting them to him. However, when he observed Azel's fights, it made Chiron doubt his initial assumption. When one was crazy from rage, the logical and technical skills were thrown to the wind. Shouldn't he be flailing like a madman? Azel's fight made Chiron suspicious as to whether Azel had the ability of premonition. He integrated insight and technique flawlessly that it almost seemed mystical. He used noise and visible signs to draw in the enemies to where he wanted, and he used his mental waves to confuse them. Azel was using the minimal amount of power to kill his enemies. He even let several of them go. He was allowing fear to spread, since it would be easier to plant illusions using spirit order. He wanted to spread misinformation, so the chaos would spread. He also purposefully lured his enemies into traps. If there were flying monsters, it would have been a bit tiring. I guess no monsters control the skies here. Azel had climbed the half-broken castle wall, and he spoke. Kor, Kor. The sun was slowing descending. Within the red glow of the sunset shining down on the land, corpses of several hundred monsters were strewn in front of him. The factions of monsters that had fought for dominion over this small city was all killed. Azel had killed every one of them. 
Azel suddenly spoke. I'm sorry. At least, you were aware of what you were doing. Chiron let out a bitter laugh. Azel knew what he had done was really stupid. However, he couldn't help himself. Chiron watched the despondent Azel through the light of the sunset. Why is he like this? He once again wondered about Azel's identity. If Azel really was the descendant of the hero Azel Kazark, it was understandable for him to become enraged at the terrible sight of the county of Kazark. However, how could he be enraged to this degree? Maybe, he really is. Chiron thought back to the time when Azel discussed his own identity. He remembered the first version of the story. Azel had said he had been put into a deep sleep through Carlos' great magic. He had woken up after a long sleep, and he was the real Azel Kazark. It was a ridiculous story. On the other hand, it had been a detailed story, and something always nagged at him in the back of his mind. There was no way it was possible, right? Amongst the magicians, Archmage Carlos was worshipped like a god, but Rulan Kingdom's best magician Biorin determined it couldn't be done. However, as he saw more of Azel, he couldn't help feel as if Azel's story seemed more likely. Maybe not. Still, it wouldn't be too strange if it really turned out to be true. Chiron was feeling something similar to what Arietta and Giles was feeling. This feeling got stronger as he spent more time in Azel's presence. Azel turned to look at Chiron as he spoke. I've killed all of them in this region, but more will flock here in time. Let's move to a place where we can rest. Him. Let's do that. At Azel's words, he suddenly woke up from his thoughts. They were moving once again, and Chiron couldn't hold back his question. Why did you do this? I'm not sure. Azel let out a bitter laugh. His most precious memories had been smashed into pieces. He had skipped 220 years into the future, and Azel had thought his land would be the rope that'll connect him to the past. However, the only thing waiting for him was the traces of destruction. The monsters had destroyed and dirtied this land. He couldn't stand these monsters acting like master of this land as they step on the corpses of the people who used to live here. This fight was a requiem for those who died. This won't be enough to appease the souls. Yes, I'll make a promise. At one time, Azel had ruled over this land as the Lord. The deceased souls had been his vassals when they were alive. He made an oath to those people, who had been his sons and daughters. I won't forgive those who carried out this deed. Moreover, I'll return this land to the hands of the people. He would send those, who destroyed this land, straight into hell. Whether they were dragon demon king worshippers or not, he didn't care. Azel promised to make this happen. However, he couldn't tell this to Chiron. Azel made up a likely excuse. I just. It felt as if a holy ground had been defiled. I see. It wasn't an excuse that was particularly believable. Chiron spoke. You let your anger take over your body, yet your mind was working very well. This was why I thought you had some other underlying reason you haven't told me about. I would have preferred if I could just let my anger take over me. So you are saying there aren't any rational reasons behind your actions? Yes. Still, I guess there are cases when one actually becomes calm in an intense rage. Moreover, you are a high-rank spirit order practitioner, so you are proficient at controlling your own mind. Your words aren't wrong, but it doesn't tell the whole story. What is it? I've seen too many innocents killed by people berserking on rage. I needed to learn to harness it. No matter how large my rage gets I had to become cold. Azel thought about his past. He had berserked from rage, and he had been pushed to the brink of death several times as a result. He hadn't care what was around him, and he had experienced killing his comrades in these fits of rage. He made sure he didn't get overwhelmed by such emotions anymore. Him, Azel suddenly raised his head. Chiron, who had been running besides Azel, mumbled as he hardened his face. Someone is, watching, us. There was someone watching them. This being was very far away, and this person was hidden in a very clever way. However, this person couldn't hide his gaze. Azel spoke with whispering instead of his voice. I don't think it is the border guards. If a normal border guard was this skilled, we would have to worry about the Bayer's kingdom taking over the continent with their surprisingly strong military force. 
It couldn't be those perverted keepers of prophecy that used to stalk me. It was a possibility, but the keepers of prophecy kept away from Azel after the rescue of Saiga. Still, Chiron was a member of the Guardian Shadows, so his location could be discerned easily by them. Anyways, they had found out that someone was observing him, so they couldn't just ignore it. Azel and Chiron continued a conversation about some random topic as they walked towards the place where they felt the gaze. This was how Azel was able to confirm it. It is magic. How do you know? I can tell by the angle. There is a magical eye in the air. Magic, spirit order and dragon arts all had far-seeing techniques. It wasn't merely the enhancement of one's eyesight. The technique allowed one to send one's gaze into the distance to survey a location. When comparing the limits of these techniques, he had found that magic was much superior than spirit order and the dragon arts when using such techniques. When spirit order and dragon arts used the far-seeing technique, one just expanded the sphere of one's vision. Azel could use his clones to circumvent this limitation, but the limitation of the ability was clear. On the other hand, a magician could create a magic eye, and it could be sent far away into the distance. It was at the command of the magician. A high-ranking magician could even look over a wall from a very far distance. Chiron accepted Azel's assessment. I see. So that is how you can discern such information. I don't feel any hostility or murderous intent. But. It is hard to feel emotion through a magic eye. It is hard unless it attacks. Azel and Chiron had been moving for a while, and they became a bit surprised. Chapter 96 those who seek their own destiny. Part 5. Him. What is it? Is it really possible to see this far into the distance? They were moving fairly quickly, and they had already traversed 5 kilometers. However, they hadn't reached their opponent yet. The range of the surveillance was beyond Chiron's common sense. Azel spoke. This person is using a relay system of magic eyes. Relay. Only the very high-ranked magicians can use this method. It requires a high amount of skill and magical energy. A magician could only send the magical eye to a distance of several hundred meters. This was why there was a limit on how high the magical eye could move up into the sky to look down on its surrounding. The relay magic was a magic designed to overcome the magic eye's limits. The magician had to put down a marker nearby to maintain the magic, and the farthest magic eye links to the nearest eye, the next eye links to the next closest eye, and so on. It was possible to observe far distance using such a method. This is the first time I've seen it since I've woken up. It was a magic used occasionally in the Dragon Demon War. But this was the time he had seen it used in this era. Azel was swept up by a queer feeling. We won't be able to escape from the enemy's surveillance using this tactic. Let's change it up. How? That is. After a moment, Azel and Chiron started running at frightening speed. At the same time, other Azels started appearing from various parts of the forest. The clones formed by Azel possessed a presence, and the real body disappeared from sight in an instant using a cloaking skill. He disappeared once he passed beneath a tree. Then he increased his speed again as he ran forward faster than his clones. His clones were running at high speeds, but they couldn't hold a candle to the real Azel, who was moving silently through the forest. He wanted his opponent to be caught off guard by making his opponent think Hazel was still far away. He planned on capturing his opponent in one fell swoop. However, his plan became obsolete the next moment. The gaze disappeared. The magic eyes set up in various location vanished. It was as if the other side had given up the surveillance on them. Then he heard an explosion from the other side of the forest, and the flames brightened the darkening sky. Niberus was walking through a ruined ancient castle. The sun had set, and her surrounding was becoming dark. A much deeper darkness rippled around Niberus' body as her ebony hair billowed around her. I've read your file. I have a question I want to ask you. Her whole body was filled with power. As a magician, the source of her power was darkness. When night arrived after the sun set, her powers became much stronger. Actually, I have an additional question I want to ask before I ask you the other question. If I give you an answer, will you let us live? Euron replied with a labored voice. Niberus queried, do you really expect me to follow through on such a request? 
No. However, aren't you supposed to tell me you will? You aren't worth lying to. I have no thoughts on debasing myself by doing so. Wow. You really. The arrogance suits the direct descendant of the dragon demon king. I'll ask my question. Why did you run away towards the land seeped in sin? The way you keep referring to this place. I'm fed up with it. This land. Why is it seeped in sin? Euron giggled. Nibiru's brow furrowed. It isn't as if you don't know the reason behind the name. So why are you asking? What is your purpose in coming to the land of the great sinner Azel Kazark? They were within the county of Kazark. Moreover, they were at the heart where the castle of Kazark was located at. Nibirus spoke. Did you perhaps think I wouldn't follow after you into the territory of the dragons? You don't look that dumb. The county of Kazark wasn't designated as being a cursed land, just because there were a lot of monsters here. Amongst the thirteen dragons, who had destroyed this land, seven of them had taken residence here in this land. This was why Bea's kingdom had no choice but to give up on this bountiful land. Euron spoke. The knowledge. A price always follows. If you are a magician, shouldn't you, have more sense? I guess you will refuse to answer me. All right, if you want to speed up your death, I'll. The darkness around Nibiru's body rose up like flame. At the same time, a powerful magical wave started to emanate from Euron's body. He suddenly spoke. I haven't reached my end yet. No. Let me rephrase that. Not here. What did you just say? Nibirus was surprised. Euron had been half dead, yet his condition was rapidly changing. Power was being infused into his voice, and his body looked to be overflowing with energy. Is it a regeneration ability? No. If he had that, he would have used it sooner. Then what is he? Him. Soon, she realized what Euron was doing. She was further taken aback by his actions. He called for a demon, and he let it in. Is he nuts? A black smoke was gathering behind Euron, and a figure was taking shape. It looked like a horribly deformed silhouette of a human. At the same time, an evil energy started to spread, and it was hard to breathe from just approaching the figure. Nibirus was someone, who played with the lives and souls of beings through black magic, yet her body was shaking. This was how deep this evil was. Its hatred for all living creatures was so immense that it wanted to destroy the world. It was a demon. Even the black magicians avoided approaching one, yet it was a being one must meet if one wanted to earn the knowledge of black magic. If not for a very specific situation, the demons couldn't deliver their voices into this world. They didn't have any substance. There weren't much information known regarding the demons, Yet it was known that they possessed the source knowledge that was filled with evil and hatred. How funny. His brown hair was whipping about as his grey eyes started to turn red. You are from the dragon demon race, yet you are showing aversion to this being. What nonsense. The dragon demon race is the amalgamation of dragons and demons. The demons are your father and mother. It was as he had said. The dragons thirsted for knowledge, and the demons pined for a physical body. The two sides fused to form the dragon demon race. The first of the dragon demon race was Atain, and after his birth, a numerous number of the first generation dragon demons was born. Even now, such births may be occurring someplace in this world. Nibirus glared at Euron. You were right. However, great dragon demon king had spoken about this. The demon race may be our father, but not all fathers deserve our admiration and love. Yet you guys still exploit this relationship. Even now, you are throwing test subjects to the demon race to earn more knowledge. Moreover, you are trying to create monster through this union, yet you dare to say such words. If one kept contact with the demon race, it was like crawling into a swamp of destruction. When a normal human came in contact with a demon, the human lost his mind, since he couldn't overcome the terrifying energy filled with malice and hatred. Still, there were a lot of cases where magicians sought knowledge and wisdom from the demon race. They went in with plenty of preparation, yet their mind became unknowingly polluted. This made the magicians repeat unbelievably stupid acts as they were driven towards their destruction. The demon race loved powerful souls. When they were called into this world, these strong souls were able to resist their natural malice and hatred. However, 
The demons worked towards corrupting and ruining these souls. It was the ultimate pleasure to eat these souls in the end. However, it was also true that one could earn something really valuable in the process. This was why the dragon demon king worshippers gave humans and dragon magen to the demons as commodity. The dragon demon king worshippers, farmed, these knowledges from the demons. Euron spoke. I'm the monster of your own creation. Actually, I wasn't really raised as a test subject. Well, whatever. Just the thought of killing a direct descendant of the dragon demon king makes me elated. Euron had called forth a demon. And he was receiving power from it. It wouldn't have been strange if he went mad. But surprisingly, Euron had been successful in keeping control over his power. He converted the demon's power into his own magic. Nibiru's expression turned cold. You don't know your place. After the sound of an explosion rang out, both Euron and Nibiru's took a step backwards. The ruined ancient castle shook as stone dusts fell from the ceiling. The two of them moved as if they were sliding across the floor, and they started exchanging flashy magical spells. Each immense magical spells was powerful enough to kill each combatant a thousand times over. However, there was no outward phenomena occurring between them. The air shook, and a weak spark formed between them. However, this was how a high-level magical battle was fought. Before each other's magic could take form, they cut off the magic. Finally, an explosion occurred, and a hole was formed in the wall. Euron and Nibirus exited the ruins of the old castle. Nibirus made a cold assessment of Euron's battle capability. In terms of magical energy, he exceeds me. Surprisingly, Euron's magical energy exceeded a direct descendant of the dragon demon king. This was still true even if one took into account the fact that the dragon demon magic was much more effective than magic. Moreover, we are almost equal in terms of technique. How could such a young human, to be precise, Euron was better at fine control of magic, which needed only a small investment of power. On the other hand, Nibirus was better at manipulating magic, which affected a large area. These kinds of magic required the investment of a lot of power. Normally, Nibirus would be at a disadvantage in such a situation, yet the battle was tight right now. This was true, because Euron was in a tenuous situation. Euron let out a groan. It was obvious that he was more skilled in focused magic. If he was steady in his progress, he would be able to dominate Nibirus in all facets. However, his control over his magic was becoming spotty. The cause was the demon. In the first place, it was considered impossible to receive power from a demon, and control it. The fact that he was able to do it without being influenced by the demon was commendable. However, at the same time, he couldn't prevent the demon from eating away at him. Nibirus let out a cold smile. You were boasting about a power you cannot fully control. You are a failure as a magician. I'm sad that I cannot refute those words. However, the dragon demon king's direct descendant will die here today. The shape wavering behind Euron grew to twice its size. The evil demonic energy amplified by several orders, and it pushed forward as if to swallow Nibirus darkness. You plan on going for the winning move by hastening your own destruction. Euron voluntarily took on a larger burden of hate and malice. It allowed him to bring out a much larger amount of power. The power was immense. Yet if Nibirus could maintain her defense, she'll be able to see Euron basically kill himself. I guess I'll have to show you that I'm on a different level. What a foolish traitor. Nibirus' eyes shone. At the same time, the darkness around her swirled around as it surged forward. She spoke with a dignified voice. Come, come into the hands of your proper owner. Dragon Arts. Book of the Dark Soul. A black thunderbolt struck in front of her, and the evil energy that had been encroaching towards her was shredded to pieces. Chapter 97. Those who seek their own destiny. Part 6. At that moment, Leticia was outside the castle with Duran. She was battling the forces being led by him. She was leery about being separated from Euron, but she had no choice. Euron was in such poor shape, so she had hidden him before she stepped forward to fight. However, she had observed the magic eyes being retracted, and an explosion came from within the castle. She knew there was a battle going on inside the castle. 
His use of the forbidden technique of summoning a demon was probably a necessity. Even though the situation had become chaotic and desperate, Leticia's cool-headedness never eroded. Duran was trying to confuse her senses by using clones, but she blocked every one of Duran's sword strike with her spear. When the explosion rang out, Leticia had already bounced off Duran's sword, and at the same time, she showed off her intricate control over her power by getting in a counter. Duran's shoulder protector was ripped away, and the cold energy gathered around this region. Him, while the battle was ongoing, the surrounding had turned into a scene straight out of winter. She was called the Cold-Blooded Queen, and she possessed dragon demon magic, which was on par with the high-ranking dragon demon officers residing within the Plane of Darkness. As expected of the dragon demon king's dog, your sense of smell is quite keen. Urin is great at covering his tracks, yet, both of you will soon be dragged away like dogs. Really, you master is opposing someone that may have the means to kill her. Both combatants could feel the clash of enormous powers nearby. In such a situation, Leticia was not the one, who was restless. Unexpectedly, it was Duran, who felt restless. He trusted Nibiru's power. However, at the same time, she was the daughter of Sibane, who had been Duran's savior. Nibiris was the direct descendant of the exalted dragon demon king, and he was worried she would get hurt. On contrast, Leticia was calm. Urin, if you die here, the guide in your dream was a trick used by the demons to push you towards your own destruction. She didn't fuss over something she had no control over. All she could do was to do her best in solving the problem in front of her eyes. The two of them had been in an intense pursuit battle with the Dragon Demon King worshippers. It hadn't been a wise decision for them to enter the county of Kazakh. The Dragon Demon King worshippers always kept an eye on this land. Euron and Leticia was well aware of this fact. Still, Euron insisted that he had to go to this place. The guide within my dream said that I'll meet my destiny here. When she heard his words, Leticia thought really hard as to whether Euron really had lost his mind. She had allied herself with him, because he had been too talented. Moreover, they had the same goal. She had assessed that he was of sane mind. Had she been wrong, Euron insisted that the guide in his dream was instrumental in him betraying the dragon demon king worshippers. He had been subjected to constant indoctrination, and the guide had been instrumental in him breaking the bonds of fanaticism. If Leticia didn't go with him, Euron planned on going to the county of Kazakh by himself. Leticia decided to gamble. She gave this mad plan a chance. No matter how I look at this, this is crazy. But, if I was of sane mind, I wouldn't be fighting these bastards. If she thought about it carefully, Euron was someone she should avoid getting close to even if he had betrayed the dragon demon king worshippers. Even if one needed a lot of power to go up against the dragon demon race, one shouldn't cross the line by calling a demon into one's body. The black magicians, who went this far, were considered to be a bad egg. However, Yuren's intentions and actions were surprisingly just even if he had broken an evil taboo. This was why Leticia had accepted him as a comrade. Him, suddenly, Leticia trembled. In the midst of her fierce battle, she felt the inflating magical energy of urine being ripped into pieces, and an oppressive dragon demon magic had exploded forth. Leticia let out a moan when she realized the identity of this energy. Nibiris possesses dragon demon key. It was an unexpected situation. Even at a glance, she had been able to tell Nibiris was a scary opponent. However, she never expected her to possess dragon demon key. Urin didn't stand a chance. Leticia charged Duran as she brought down her spear. The sword and the spear was interlocked with each other. Duran laughed. We'll see if each of us put our trust in the right place. The result will show us. Him. Certainly. However, Leticia's surprise was pushed down in an instant. After pushing back Duran, she spoke in an apathetic voice. Well, if he dies here, it is his fate. Duran was taken aback. Were these two really comrades? Her comrade was in obvious danger, so how could she be so calm about it? Leticia smiled. She had a savage smile of a predator. Once one enters into a battle as a combatant, one has to be responsible for one's own life. 
I won't fret over him as if he was a baby left by the river. I would be putting the cart before the horse, and it might result in my death. When one acknowledged each other as comrades, one also accepted the fact that one's comrade might die. If a comrade died, the living member only had the obligation to take revenge for the dead. Leticia had always fought with this mental attitude. We'll see if his fate leads him to destruction or hope. We'll soon find out. After a brief moment, the dragon demon magic, which had been agitating her senses from afar, disappeared as if it had been alive. Niberus couldn't comprehend what had happened in front of her, so she was filled with confusion. In front of her, there was a book floating in front of her, and it possessed pages covered in pitch black darkness. This was Dragon Art's book of the Dark Soul, which had been passed down from the Dragon Demon Wars. When she obtained this great relic, she was able to wield a different level of magical power. She had been in a tight battle with Euron, but in an instant, she was able to overpower him. He had been wrecked by her. When she was about to capture him, a sword appeared in front of her. The sword had fallen in front of her like thunderbolt, and it ripped away the darkness formed by her. It wasn't as if an overwhelming strength had exploded onto the scene. The sword had flown in, and it cut off the swirling magical wave as if it had never existed. It was akin to a sword cutting a piece of paper. She felt a chill. Was such a thing really possible? This sword. The sword possessed a white blade. At a glance, one could tell it wasn't made out of metal. It was made out of some other ingredient. It has been a while. Then she heard a familiar voice. It was a voice of a man she would never forget. Niberus spoke with an angry voice towards the man, who was walking slowly towards her. Azel Zestringer. Confusion washed over her alongside her rage. Why was this man here? How come she hadn't received any information regarding his presence here? The Dragon Demon King worshippers were on high alert regarding Azel's whereabouts. However, Azel and Chiron's movement speed transcended imagination. After they left the Dukedom of Tarantos, she had received no information from her observers. Silence descended between the two. The dragon sword embedded in the ground rose up into the air by itself, and it returned to Azel. Even the dragon sword duke. Niberus located Chiron, who was standing behind Azel. She wasn't in a good situation. Azel suddenly spoke. It seems you gained a new dragon arts I've never seen you use. Since such a young dragon demon like you possesses dragon demon key, I'm guessing you inherited something that already existed. Actually, I remember the dragon demon key. Azel calmly looked over Niberus. Her dragon demon magic hadn't changed much. However, it was hard to assess how much energy a magician possessed unless one fought against one. However, the mere fact that she had gained the dragon arts meant that she would be able to wield a different level of power. Azel spoke. Before I ask you why you are here, I'm curious about one thing. Are we really in a situation where we can calmly answer each other's questions? Were you guys responsible for destroying this land? Azel had ignored Niberus' sarcastic remarks, and he had asked the question. Niberus looked straight into Azel's eyes, which was burning with anger, and she gave her answer. That's right. As expected, it was true that he had suspected the identity of culprits. Thirteen dragons had suddenly rampaged in madness, and a large force of monsters had been ready to move into his land. It had been an unnatural event. However, this wasn't the only reasons why Azel had suspected the dragon demon king worshippers. He knew it to be true when he learned that all the descendants of Count Karzark had been eradicated. Even if the county of Karzark was destroyed, his descendants couldn't have all died. Of course, the women and the old would have been evacuated. Then there would have been some who were out of the lands, at the time of the attack. So how could all of them be massacred so thoroughly? Someone had taken advantage of the chaos created by the Great Darkness, and the downfall of the county of Karzark. If not, there was no way everyone would have died. The only likely suspect, who would do such a thing, was the dragon demon king worshippers. Azel briefly closed his eyes as he spoke. Thank you. What? Niberus was taken aback at his unexpected words. Azel spoke as he opened his eyes. I'll be able to hate all of you with all my heart. 
Ooh. A powerful magical wave was emitted from Azel. It was as if her senses was hit by a heavy sensation. When the magical wave reached her, Nibiris trembled. What the hell has he been doing? Azel's magical energy couldn't be compared to the last time she had seen him. His growth rate was unrivaled. Unlike the dragon demons or the dragon magians, humans weren't born with massive amounts of power. Instead, they were able to rapidly grow their power in a short amount of time. This held true for spirit order practitioners and magicians. Still, there was a limit on how fast one could grow. It had only been one year, since she had seen him last. So how could his magical energy grow so much? At the very least, he is a septuple master. Cold sweat ran down her body. Even when Azel had incomprehensibly low magical energy, he had been a threat. How was he able to gain this much magic in only a year? Nibiris used her communication magic to gather her underlings, and she got ready for battle. It happened at that moment. Ah, it really. Urin was lying next to Azel's feet, and he spoke with a feeble voice. The guide's words. He was right. The fact that he was so accurate. Even if I'm the beneficiary of such information, I don't feel too good about it. It would be best if you spare your words. Azel didn't even look at him as he spoke. Nibiris was stoking her fighting spirit in front of him, so Azel couldn't reveal any openings in his defense. Ha ha ha. Thank you for worrying about me. I don't know who you are. In truth, I don't like the fact that you stink of an evil energy, but you seem to be the enemy of my enemies, so I'll spare you. I'll give you a chance to explain yourself. Azel took a step forward. Chiron, who had silently stood behind Azel, took Euron, and they retreated towards the back. After confirming their retreat, he spoke to Nibiris. It is time for you to pay off your debts. You took the words out of my mouth, the man whose name is seeped in sin. I'm tired of being called by that long and unnecessary nickname. I'll make it so that you'll never utter those words again. A tumultuous killing intent exploded forth from Azel, and he charged toward Nibiris. Chapter 98 The Sword That Split the Heavens Part 1 During the Dragon Demon War, Azel had seen a lot of Dragon Demon weapons used. Both his allies and enemies wielded it. Each of them had a unique form and ability. All of them were named, and they boasted incredible amounts of power. This was why Azel remembered every dragon demon weapon he had encountered before. That's the Book of Darkness. The simpleton Prince Sybane's dragon demon weapon is still being passed around amongst you all. Sybane had been one of the sons of the dragon demon king. The dragon demon weapon called Book of Darkness was something that had been used by Sybane. It allowed one to have control over darkness, and there were all kinds of high rank magical spells engraved in it. It was a wonderful tool, which allowed one to carpet bomb one's enemies. Nibiris became angry at his words. You bastard. A young human like you dares to insult my father. Him. You are the daughter of the simpleton prince. In the end, that guy lived long enough to leave behind a progeny. It is true that he was a simpleton, but he was always hard to kill. During the dragon demon wars, the humans gave Sybane the nickname of the simpleton prince to ridicule him. It wasn't as if Sybane was weak. As befitting the son of the dragon demon king, he had incredible amount of dragon demon magic, and he was a naturally skilled magician. However, Sybane's problem was the fact that he hadn't had any defining wartime accomplishments. It was true even when he had become the bait to lure out Azel's third master Liglan. He had always been defeated, and in turn, his pride had been trampled. Until the dragon demon war ended, this remained true even after Sybane participated in multiple engagements. He was also grievously injured in the penultimate battle, so he hadn't even been present at the final battle. It seemed he had lived on in the plane of darkness. Nibiris exploded. You have yet to live a hundred years, yet you dare talk about my father as if you know him. I'll make you suffer. You will wish for your death. I do know him. Is he perhaps still alive? If so, I want to meet him. I almost took off his head twice, but he threw away the lives of his subordinates like it was nothing to be able to run away. This tactic was highly inconvenient, and in the end, 
I wasn't able to kill him. How much nonsense do you have to spout before you are satisfied? From within the darkness that had pervaded the surrounding, all kinds of magic exploded forth. Nibiru's personal reservoir of ki had increased compared to a year ago. On top of her development, she now had the dragon demon weapon called the Book of Darkness. She could use an incredible amount of power compared to her previous self. The darkness rose up like a tsunami, and the sounds of thunder rang out. The Book of Darkness allowed one to control the darkness, and it was almost akin to a dragon's control over an element it was born with. Its performance was almost unrivaled. Moreover, each of the magical spells engraved into the book was superb. One could become a one-man army with this power. This trove of power was released all at once. The surging darkness swallowed up Azel, and all kinds of curses and destruction magic detonated within. No matter how talented he was, he wouldn't be able to come out intact under this level of firepower. It really is an annoying item. I'll admit that the Book of Darkness is quite high-powered. Its overwhelming firepower could simply crush an opponent. However, Azul's voice could be heard over the thundering noises. Nibirus unconsciously inhaled. At the same time, blue thunder and lightning split the darkness. It wasn't natural phenomena. The thunderbolts were terrifyingly concentrated in a single location, and it looked like a sword. Thunderbolts split the darkness in half, and one could see Azel with his red hair whipping about. The shocked Nibirus heard an inconceivable string of words. Dragon make and rise. Accompanying Azul's shout, the sky let out a roar. Kwa ru rung, ji ji wo guang. There had been no clouds in the sky, yet a thunderbolt erupted as it ripped away the darkness of the night. The thunderbolt struck the sword in Azul's hand, and it connected the heaven and earth as one. In the midst of the exploding thunder, which didn't allow other sounds to be heard, one could hear a psychic shout. The sword that split the heavens. The name was Apartment. The thunderbolt split open the skies, and it resolved into a single sword. Thunderbolts condensed into forming this blue sword, and it was exactly the shape of the the dragon Macon he had used to defeat the earth dragon at the Balan forest. However, the one from before had been an illusion. It hadn't possessed a real body. An unbelievable amount of power had been focused for the sword to take form, but it had been destined to fall apart. It didn't have its prior physical form to anchor into. However, Azel had changed the sword's destiny. He had superimposed the dragon Macon's image to the dragon sword, which was made out of the white bones of a dragon. When she saw it, she became scared out of her wits. No way. It can't be that sword. Her surprise wasn't rooted only in the fact that Azel had a dragon demon weapon. If it was just the appearance of such a weapon, she wouldn't have been surprised to a degree where her thoughts briefly shorted out. The problem was the name. Azel had called forth the dragon demon weapon with his will, and he had used its true name. It was a nightmare of a name for the dragon demon king worshippers. It haunted them in their dreams. The dragon demon weapon wasn't named by its user. All dragon demon weapons possessed a true name as soon as it was born. Nibirus was frozen in shock, but the Book of Darkness in front of her reacted. Nibirus didn't do anything. Yet the book trembled before the pages started to flip over. From Nibiru's perspective, she felt as if the Book of Darkness was trying to express some unknown feeling. Azel laughed as he gripped the dragon Macon in front of him. Well, from now on, it is up to you to determine if I'm talking bullshit or not. This dragon Macon has ripped apart the Book of Darkness twice before in a fight with the Simpleton Prince. Shall we see what'll happen when I rip it apart for the third time? The Dragon Demon Castle was located far in the north within the Plain of Darkness. The first wife of the Dragon Demon King was submerged within the great magic of darkness. Ainsera opened her eyes in surprise. The great darkness was spread around her at all times. It was a magic taught to her by the Dragon Demon King Atain. She didn't even need to take a single step yet she was able to communicate with all dragon demon king worshippers. She could survey all parts of the continent, and its power was instrumental in maintaining and hiding relics like the Road of Emptiness. It was a transcendental magic. Within this magic, Ainsera was like a goddess, who was able to hear the prayers of her numerous followers. No, 
To be precise, this magic was a proxy that allowed the prayers of the humans to reach the goddess. Moreover, this magic's utility wasn't limited to communication. In the beginning, Ain Sarah had set up a bank of knowledge when she incubated this magic. It was able to find information as if it was prescience. The dragon demon king worshippers were connected by darkness, and everything they saw, heard and thought was sent to her. Then she was able to bring up relevant information from memory bank. This all resulted in her being able to coordinate the eradication of knowledge amongst the humans. Everything regarding the technique of dragon arts, spirit order and the dragon demon weapons were all. Ain Sarah mumbled as if she was groaning. The sword that split the heavens. How could that cursed dragon demon weapon show up again? There was a price exacted from her for harboring this great darkness within her. It was as if she had stolen a part of a power of a god, yet it also put her in a half-dead state. Ain Sarah's self was buried within this sea-like consciousness, and her sense of self had become faint. She was only able to operate, because she had been obsessed with her principles, and she had the overwhelming will to live. Of course, her emotions had faded away as if it had been cut away. No matter what business came up, she dealt with it in an indifferent manner. However, she remembered the memories stamped into her memories 200 years ago, and the terror she felt couldn't be erased. The sword that split the heavens. The dragon demon weapon of the great sinner has appeared. That cannot be. Shocked voices was flying towards her from everywhere on the continent. The magic allowed him to ignore the vast distance, and it was as if they were all gathered in the same room. They were all feeling the same emotion. Fear. The moment the dragon demon weapon was born Ain Sarah knew about it. The being connected to the great darkness encountered the dragon demon weapon, and she was now aware of this fact. This was why Ain Sarah was able to look up the identity of the dragon demon weapon encountered by Niberus. The sword that split the heavens. This was the weapon swung by the hero Azel Kazark in the Dragon Demon War. In the end, this weapon was used to end the life of the Dragon Demon King Atain. It was name of the Dragon Macon. Azel had received several Dragon Demon weapons from his third master Liglan. However, he only had one Dragon Demon weapon he had created for himself. It was the sword that split the heavens. Azel hadn't created the Dragon Macon in his hands anew. He just recovered the one from before. Carlos had used a surprising magic to preserve his sword, while Azel slept. However, when he went through with the Dragon Slayer's ritual with the Earth Dragon inside the Balan Forest, he had consumed all the power needed to maintain the existence of the sword. It disappeared. However, when he went through his second Dragon Slayer's ritual, he found the fragments of the sword still existing within his energy pulse. The reason why he hadn't been able to discover this fact was simple. Azel had been short on dragon demon magic. If one didn't have dragon demon magic, it was impossible to form or maintain the dragon demon key. This was why he had the fragments within his energy pulse, but these fragments was destined to slowly dissolve since nothing was maintaining it. However, when Azel completed the second dragon slayer's ritual, he changed the fate of the sword. When he realized this fact, he attempted a third Dragon Slayer's ritual, while he resided at the Dukedom of Tarantos. He won, and he had gained a powerful source of Dragon Demon magic. This resulted in him being able to gather the fragments existing within his energy pulse, and he had revived the Dragon Macon. However, the problem was its incomplete revival. The sword that split the heavens was considered to be one of the top Dragon Demon weapons. Azel was able to gain a considerable amount of dragon demon magic through his third dragon slayer's ritual, but he couldn't fully revive his sword. It would only be possible if he conducted more dragon slayer's ritual. However, the dragon slayer's rituals wasn't something that should be done in a short amount of time. If he was able to do so, Azel would have traveled the entire country looking for dragons. He would have done dragon slayer's rituals with a fearsome fervor. During the Dragon Demon War, there were two reasons why the beings with the Dragon Demon weapons didn't blindly conduct the Dragon Slayer's ritual. First, if one hadn't digested the dragon's power before doing another Dragon Slayer's ritual, the dragon could steal the power residing in the human. Second, 
When the human attempting the dragon slayer's ritual increased in the amount of dragon demon magic one possessed, the dragon seemed to respond by getting stronger. Basically, even if one obtained a dragon demon weapon through multiple dragon slayer's ritual, the difficulty level of the fights with the dragons never decreased. Carlos had a theory regarding why it was so. It may be, because the dragon demon magics originates from the dragons. Dragon demon magic allows the dragons to to control reality through their will. Moreover, they are able to freely control the element they have affinity with. There is a connection between these two abilities. The dragon slayer's ritual was a life and death fight between a dragon and a human. However, it was also a conversation between their souls. The winner took the loser's wisdom or power. The fact that this was possible in the first place meant that they were dealing with a magic that transcend common sense. Chapter 99. The Sword That Split the Heavens. Part 2. When one initiates the Dragon Slayer's ritual, the transcendent magic joins the soul of the human and the dragon into one. In the process, the will of the human that controls the dragon demon magic gets pulled towards the dragon's will. This occurs since the dragon is closer to the source of the magic. Of course, this was an unproven theory. Still, it did a semi-decent job in explaining the phenomena of the Dragon Slayer's Ritual. After Azel finished his third Dragon Slayer's Ritual, he put all his effort into digesting the power he had gained. As he was doing this, he kept thinking of a way to completely materialize the Dragon Macon. However, it was Chiron, who had come up with the answer. You are running into the limitation of materializing power into an ethereal form. What if you prepare a separate vessel you can pour the power into? When he heard those words, a lightning went off inside Azel's head. Chiron was someone, who had made a dragon sword, from reading an incomplete account of the dragon demon weapons. He had a unique perspective, and he had come up with the idea. Azel used Chiron's idea as a guideline and he researched for a way to materialize the dragon Macon through the dragon sword. In the end, he was successful. The sword he was holding at that moment was the result. In the past, it had been the source of terror for the dragon demon king's army. Azel once again wielded the proud power of his dragon Macon. Niberus asked a question, the one with the name soaked in sin. What is your real identity? I'll ask again. Is Sybane still alive? Instead of answering Azel's question, she asked a question of her own. She furrowed her brows. What is your purpose in asking this question? I'm just curious. No, this really isn't a question specifically about Sybane. I wonder how many of your members are survivors from the Dragon Demon War. The Dragon Demons had long lifespans, so there was a possibility that some were still alive. This was the reasoning behind Azel's question. Of course, Niberus didn't answer his question. He looked at her for a brief moment before he spoke. I guess it isn't information that can be easily given away. Then I'll phrase it this way. I want you to deliver this message to those who are still alive. If they are curious about my identity, they can move their fat asses and come meet me. Then you'll be able to clear up this confusion. You can get the answer from them. The gust infused with blue sparks swirled around him. Azel spoke in a cold voice. Ah, sorry, I just realized I said something unnecessary. You are the daughter of the simpleton prince. You will die here today. You are the one, who will die. You'll be killed as you clutch at your own riddles. Oh, human with the name soaked in sin. The dragon demon weapon clashed with the other dragon demon weapon. Chiron was a dragon demon, but even he was having a hard time breathing. The waves of powerful dragon demon magic swirled around the surrounding. The darkness swallowed everything nearby, and the thunderbolts let out a ferocious roar as if it was going to rip the world into pieces. The darkness and lightning collided violently with each other. The two power intermingled as the explosions rocked the ground. A single clash laid waste a radius 100 meters. Chiron, who was running away with urine on his shoulders, was shocked. Kook. What preposterous amount of power. Chiron had always thought he could beat anyone in terms of burst damage. However, the aftermath created by the dragon demon weapons clashing against each other was beyond his imagination. Niberus' shout rang out within the large dust storm. I invoke the bountiful spirit, 
which possesses the endless darkness of the nether world. I call upon the soul that runs across the firmament of darkness that covers the sun. When she shouted the spell, her surroundings started to change. If one didn't actively protect oneself against the magical energy, the broken soul curse would overpower the opponent's mind. The curse had the power to shatter the mind. The darkness started to spread out like a fog, and everything it touched died. Moreover, numerous tormented phantoms rose out of the fog as they wailed. Chiron stopped breathing. My god, he had fought a lot of black magicians up until now. He was also very experienced in fighting very strong dragon demon king worshippers. Moreover, his best friend was Biorin Michael, who was the kingdom's best magician. He was familiar with how much power was generated by the high-rank magical spells. However, the phenomena unfolding in front of him far outstripped any magic he had experienced for the past 100 years of his life. What about Azel? His opponent was using an incredible magic spell. So why was Azel not doing anything? Chiron looked into the darkness with this question on his mind. However, he soon understood why Azel hadn't stopped Nibiris from activating her magic. An intense lightning pierced through the pervading darkness. It looked like thunder, but it also looked like a pure white flame. It split open the darkness in a domineering fashion, and Azel appeared from within it. He spoke with a certain perverse humor in his voice. That move is fantastic. It was a good enough distraction to buy some time for you. You are much proficient in summoning the corrupted body now. You've grown more adept. Purple flames rose in the darkness, and the shapes of all kinds of monsters were disintegrating through this flame. The corrupted energy was formed using the pain and hatred of the dead. It melted the bodies of the monsters, and the black magic created a familiar called the corrupted body. Nibiris created numerous corrupted bodies, and they clutched at Azel's ankles. It didn't take Azel long to defeat the corrupted bodies, but it was enough time for Nibiris to finish her magical spell. Queen of Darkness. Accompanying her low chant, the darkness focused around her. It was as if several hundred evil spirits were celebrating the birth of a powerful ruler. She floated in the sky amongst the whales. Before the queen could put on her crown, the blue blade passed by her after slicing her open. How? How can this be? Nibiris was shocked. She had no idea that the attack was coming. Azel and the dragon Macon rose out of the darkness to cut her. This shouldn't have been possible. She was a magician, who used the darkness as her source. Moreover, she was the owner of the Book of Darkness, which dominated the darkness. The darkness had spread out to the surrounding, and she should have been able to sense everything within the darkness. Even if it was a small bug, it couldn't escape her awareness. However, she hadn't realized the attack was coming until Azel had been right in front of her. Moreover, Azel had been fighting against the corrupted bodies, so how was he able to jump a distance of over 100 meters? He had used the secret technique called, the Dance of Shadows. It allowed one to give substance to clones. The Dragon Arts users called it incarnation, and this technique completely fooled Nibiris Ides. As expected, you are still very clumsy at using Sybane's Book of Darkness. I'm guessing you received the Dragon Demon weapon not too long ago. As Azel spoke, the Dragon Macon struck out against her. The sword descended like lightning. The blue lightning ripped apart the darkness as it descended. However, something obstructed the path of the sword. The sword had descended as if it could split apart anything in this world, yet the sword bounced off after colliding with something. You haven't changed at all. You are a mere book, yet it is admirable that you continue to protect your master. It was the Book of Darkness. Nibiris had been taken by surprise, and she had received a critical wound. The Book of Darkness had blocked Azul's sword to protect Nibiris. How many strikes will you be able to take this time? He had experienced this before, so Azel wasn't surprised. He didn't even hesitate. He attacked again. Every sword strike was tearing the Book of Darkness into shreds. Azel didn't even bother trying to bypass the Book of Darkness to strike out at Nibiris. The darkness spread out by the Book of Darkness could be used freely by it. It could dissolve and materialize at will in this darkness. It could basically achieve the effect of crossing over space to teleport. 
This was why he had to destroy it with strength. Niberus executed a sudden attack on the occupied Azel. She hadn't been able to finish the great magic, Queen of Darkness, but the magic allowed her to overcome the exquisite pain caused by her wound. The powerful darkness stopped her bleeding, and it maintained her vitals for now. When Niberus was able to focus her feigned mind, she immediately went on the offensive. The surrounding darkness was condensed into a dense curse as it was sent towards Azel. At the same time, she witnessed something unbelievable. A human turned into darkness. Azel seemed to change into the same element as the curse of darkness. The attack that should have easily destroyed his body and soul passed through him. The only thing that ceased to exist was the dragon Macon. Azel returned to his original form, and he gripped the Book of Darkness with his hands. His action was pure madness. Even for a man like Azel, it was suicide to grab an enemy's dragon demon weapon. As expected, a strong reaction occurred as Azel's body shook. His body broke apart into particles of light. Niberus' eyes were open so wide that it felt as if her eyes would rip open. Ah, did you really think that was my real body? You were more naive than I thought. What, did you just? Niberus was so surprised that words refused to come out of her mouth. Then another powerful light split apart the darkness. The fruits of her curse, which was scattered all over the place, was shredded to pieces as if they were pieces of paper. Another Azel appeared using the instantaneous movement, and Niberus was finally able to piece everything together. From the beginning to the end. I moved to the beck and call of that man. Azel had been able to change himself into a particular element using a technique akin to insulation. However, there was limit to such techniques. It was impossible to do what Azel had just done. He had let the cursed darkness flow through him by turning himself fully into the same element. However, such a deed was possible if it was a clone made only out of magical energy. After Azel changed his clone into the same element as the cursed darkness, he hid within the darkness being gathered by Niberus to complete her magic. He had approached her in secret. His skills were so intricate that she hadn't noticed his actions. After the dragon Macon sliced through Niberus, it was sent to the hands of his clone. Like the Book of Darkness, the dragon Macon could also dissolve and materialize at will. The sword that splits the heaven could freely be sent to any one of his clones. Your lifespan would be considered to be short for a dragon demon, yet haven't you lived long enough? It is time for you to go meet Atain, who you worship so much, in hell. Azul's clone used the destruction of itself to seal the power of the Book of Darkness. Niberus, who had vainly spent her power, saw Azul's final strike come down towards her head. She couldn't do anything. The despairing Niberus watched as the death strike fell towards her. Chapter 100. The Sword That Split the Heavens. Part 3. Niberus. It seemed she had lost her consciousness for a brief moment. Niberus' consciousness kept blinking in and out as she heard a familiar voice. It was a voice infused with genuine concern. It was a voice she tolerated with discomfort since her childhood. Niberus. Wake up. Please. Kier. N. Niberus looked at him with blurry eyes. The young dragon demon was Kieran Baldazark. He was her rival, and he was the descendant of one of the four exalted dragon demon generals. He looked as if he was about to cry as he called out her name. Why is he here? At the same time, she realized the space around her was distorted. There was only one person she knew that could create such a phenomena. When she realized this fact, she suddenly felt annoyed even if she was close to her death. Laura. Yes. Laura, Sir Almeric and I are here. Hold on. If you die, I. Duke Baldazark. Kieran spoke as if he was about to cry, but Laura cut through his words. Laura's voice was monotone as always, but Kieran could felt nervousness behind her words. This space was made using Laura's dragon demon weapon called Vitten's Chalice. The Vitten's Maze was an isolated pocket dimension. Since she created a spatial distortion, this place couldn't be reached from outside. Basically, the Vitten's Maze offered complete safety when it was put in place. It was a bit problematic when one had to get out, but once you were in there, Laura, who had her Vitten's Maze engaged, spoke as her expression stiffened. Hurry up. Bring out your dragon demon weapon. 
What? I can't hold out much longer. The Vitten's maze, which was isolated from the world, started to shake. Kieran was shocked. What? Is he perhaps intruding into the Vitten's maze? We were tracked down. How is this possible? It is possible. I don't have time to explain it. Hurry. Kook. I am the true descendant of the beings, who was born into the world without parents. I call for you to obey my call. The dragon demon weapon bleeds. Kieran didn't know what was going on, but he followed Laura's instruction. Before he could fully bring out his dragon demon weapon, thunder exploded around him. The pocket dimension, which had safely sealed him away, was ripped apart. A calamity of light akin to a thunderbolt connected the heaven and earth. The darkness of the night sky was violently ripped away as a blue-colored sword impacted on the ground. Kieran yelled out, the sword that split the heavens. It matched the description passed down in the plane of darkness. It was the weapon that took the dragon demon king a time's life. Then there was the four dragon demon generals. They were beings, who came into this world without being born to parents, and they tried to change the fate of the world. However, they had been afraid of this particular weapon. The Vitten's maze crumbled away as the surrounding returned to normal. Azel appeared from the rear with his red hair swirling around him. He spoke as he looked at the dragon demons, who had been within the Vitten's maze. In truth, I'm impressed. You timed it perfectly. When Azel unleashed his final blow against Niberus, the Vitten's maze was activated, and Niberus was sequestered into the pocket dimension. Laura and Kieran was still one kilometer away from Niberus, yet she was able to take into account the distance in using her magic. She was skilled and it was quite admirable. You isolated space to make a pocket dimension. However, that space has to exist somewhere. The method in creating spatial distortion and the pocket dimension was different. The concept behind Vitten's maze was to distort the configuration of space. If one entered from the outside, the maze would trap all visitors in an endless maze. Azel had fought Ornsaurus in the Dragon Demon Wars. Moreover, the so-called impregnable Vitten's maze had been broken several times by Azel. Laura mumbled to herself as if she was groaning. Speed of light. It seems the knowledge about the sword that split the heavens was passed down amongst you. It is a sword of calamity, and it can control all of the world's light. It can control the light from the sun, the flame from the volcanoes, and the roaring thunder within the storm. You are quite ostentatious in your descriptions. Well, it is understandable. This sword killed your god, so I can understand why you would add such descriptions to it. The sword that split the heavens was a dragon demon weapon he had completed as he matured. When he first made the dragon demon weapon, it only had the power to control thunderbolts, which he had used for long-ranged attacks. However, as he went through the gauntlet of battles in the dragon demon war, his sword was refined. It grew into becoming the ultimate weapon capable of defeating the dragon demon king. This had been possible through Azel's efforts, and the sacrifices of his comrades. The sword that split the heavens controlled light. It could control thunder. Moreover, it could gather all existing light within his domain to convert it into an offensive energy. Moreover, when the sword itself turned into light, it could break all shackles of limitation for a brief moment. Kieran asked a question. What is he saying? The Vitten's maze cannot transcend the limitation of my perception. Laura spoke as cold sweat ran down her body. Even if she isolated a large amount of space using the Vitten's maze, she was creating the space within the limited region within her perception. Even if she created a castle wall where one needed several days of running to reach the end, her opponent could just use the light from the sky to cut through her space. Laura was able to assess this problem, so she had tried to use the property of light against Azel. She knew light traveled in straight lines, so he kept changing the location of her space to block the sword that split the heavens. However, her efforts had been futile. The sword that split the heavens could scatter numerous light particles, and it allowed Azel to trace any beings if light was able to reach them. Kieran had been a step slow in realizing this fact. He spoke with a shaking voice. So the sword can really split the heavens. Him, are you perhaps the descendant of Baldazark? Azel tilted his head as he looked at Kieran. 
Niverus was of a different sex as Cybane, and Laura also looked different Ornsaurus. However, Kieran's outer appearance and voice was almost a carbon copy of Baldazar. Kieran asked in surprise, How did you know? I knew it by your appearance. Cybane's daughter, Ornsaurus's grandchild and Baldazark's scion. Did all the dragon demons of note and the small fries gather here today? When the Vitten's maze was broken, three young dragon demons was returned to normal space. They returned to a location where a large number of dragon demon king worshippers were gathered. There was the group being led by Duran, and they had been fighting Leticia. Then there was the group brought here by Laura and Kieran. There was a total of 120 dragon demon king worshippers present, and all of them were quite proficient at fighting. They had an absolute numerical advantage. However, Azel didn't even show an ounce of nervousness as he asked a question. How long will it take for our allies to get here? I'm not sure. This land is rarely seen by the gazes of man, so the response may be sluggish. They are usually really good at showing up when they aren't needed. I agree. They are like perverts, who like to stalk. If so, why the hell are they so late? They are useless. Azel and Chiron was talking about the Guardian Shadows. There wasn't much of a population within the county of Karzark, so the surveillance net was thin here. However, Chiron was a member of the Guardian Shadows. Since he witnessed the Dragon Demon King worshippers, the Guardian Shadows would know about it. It was a matter of time before they got here. Chiron didn't show any outward signs, but he asked Azel a question through whispering. How much reserve do you have left? Azel showed off a fearsome god-like power, yet this power wasn't endless. Azel spoke. The dragon make an eye called Forth is starting to reach its limit. Moreover, the dragon's sword is groaning under the stress. The cheat-like dragon make an he called Forth had a time limit. The dragon's sword had become the vessel for his power, yet it couldn't channel that power indefinitely. On top of that fact, the use of the dragon may can put quite a lot of burden on Azel too. Azel hadn't been able to complete his recovery yet. However, I have plenty enough to kill all these bastards. Him. Then I'll focus my power on protecting this guy. Chiron spoke as he unsheathed his dual swords. Euron was at Chiron's feet. Then they naturally came to a realization that a female dragon magen was showing her back to them. She was a dragon magen with short, black and wavy hair. It was Leticia. She asked Chiron a question. Is he dead? If you mean the magician, he is still alive. It seems he wasn't destined to die. Then let me ask you another question. I don't know who you are, but are you an ally? I want to pose the same question to you as an answer, but since we have common enemies, you can join our side until the end of this fight. We can talk about our interests afterwards. Such a generous answer. It almost makes me tear up. All right, let's do that. Leticia let out a snort. Then she let out a tumultuous killing intent towards the other side. However, I never expected to see Duke Almeric here. I would have never imagined it. Is this the destiny Euron was talking about? Her gaze was focused on a being with long, blue-black hair. It had horns that made him look like a black bull. This particular dragon demon youth possessed yellowish-brown eyes and dragon demon stone. He was like Kieran and Laura. He was the descendant of, the sword that parts a storm, Almeric, and his name was Jeffers Almeric. Azel tilted his head in confusion at her words. Him, this guy is Almeric's descendant. You are only a lowly human, yet you dare speak his name. Jeffers' words revealed his disdain of Azel. He hadn't been inside the Vitten's maze, so he hadn't witnessed Azel's godlike powers. If he had seen it, he wouldn't have been able to maintain such an attitude. Azel smiled as he revealed his teeth. You are quite the prototypical dragon demon. However, why don't you look anything like Almeric? What? The scion of Baldazark looks like that git. He looks exactly like the foppish Baldazark. However, you don't share any common features with your predecessor. What nonsense are you spouting? Now that I think about it, the only thing different about Aunshurus's descendant is her gender. As the daughter of the simpleton prince, they look very alike. However, this isn't true for you. You are the only one that doesn't look like your predecessor. Don't you think that's strange? 
Bastard. You are a being from the gutters. Yet you dare to insult me using such baseless conjectures. Jeffers raged. However, Azel didn't back off from his taunts. From what he remembered, Almeric had long, dirty white hair. His eyes had been bright red, and his thick horns had the consistency of volcanic rocks. He had been a middle-aged dragon demon, who looked like a savage lion. No matter how he looked at it, Jeffers didn't look anything like Almeric. If the other dragon demons hadn't looked like their predecessors, he wouldn't have remarked on it. However, Niberus, Laura and Kieran looked similar to the dragon demons of old. Why is he different? He was having a hard time letting go of this incongruity. When Azel furrowed his brows, Kieran spoke. Duke Almeric, that man is strong. You have to use your dragon demon weapon. What are you talking about? I have to use my dragon demon weapon facing a lowly human. Listen to my words carefully. Niberus lost to him even after using her dragon demon weapon. What nonsense are you? He's coming. In a flash, Laura stretched out her hand to activate her barrier. By a hair's breadth, she was able to divert the sharp light emitted by the sword towards an entirely different direction. 